Um, anything to take up before we bring the jurors in? And I guess the, before we do that, um, what about lunch for today? Uh, do you think we'll have to be done with all the witnesses before, or should we send the menu back? Your Honor, we, we were thinking of sending the menu back just to have it ordered. Okay. Okay. So we'll do that right now, I guess. And then um, as soon as they're done with that, then we'll just go ahead and bring them in. We have a couple of evidentiary things. Yeah. To that's, I, I knew there were a few things to take care of. So uh, we, we, we can okay. Okay. We can put them on the record. That's all. Why they're ordering lunch. We can. Yes. Okay, what if um, they request to not stay in the jury room? It to has to be up, I apologize, I didn't mean it, but it has to be up to them. Okay, so if they would prefer not to, to go out, that's fine. So if they option. want to, yeah. If okay. They want to, Okay. okay. And we're actually hoping maybe we'll even be done before lunch, or maybe even send them home. We'll do the garden conference this afternoon, but in the bonus of caution, no one. I don't know how long it's going to take on the witnesses. So. Um, one quick matter to take up, Your Honor, because I, I don't want there to be a break between Jerry David and, and the next witness. Okay. Um, there's a demonstrative exhibit that I would like to show, publish to the jury during um, the expert witnesses' testimony. Uh, plaintiff's counsel has seen a copy in there. I have an expert copy of what it looks like. Um, a sign that follows the no $10 worries. in that middle slide instead of the, the $1. But uh, the, Mr. Bachner is going to testify as to what the average wholesale uh, price was for the 40 pound dogs, the 40 pound boxes, and what it would be for an individual stick. And the information he's getting to come up with that average wholesale price is from Defendant's Exhibit 122, which is in evidence, it un was unobjected to, we moved into evidence yesterday. It's the sales price view XML report from November of 2017 that both experts uh, looked at. And uh, plaintiff's counsel, but this is just a, it's not that you moved into evidence, Your Honor, it's just to this is help conceptualize the issue. Right, what would be the objection? So, uh, Your Honor, I just need a minute to give you some background. The, the raw data that this brief is based on is literally millions and millions and millions of numbers, okay? So what both experts did was do some work to, uh, you know, come to conclusions about what certain things they added up to. Our expert was listed timely, did some of that work uh, at the deposition, after the deposition, a long time ago, but after the deposition, did some additional work, which we did a chart like that, they objected to, so we didn't use it. This expert is actually a rebuttal expert. It was not listed timely. He, Mr. Buckner was not oh, listed let me be, I'm sorry. We listed him timely as a rebuttal expert, and there was no objection. He uh, was listed rebuttal. as a rebuttal expert. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I don't finish. I think he said that you were, um, he was not listed as an expert originally, but he was listed then as a rebuttal expert. Correct. Okay. Exactly. So now we have something that's not rebuttal to anything this board testified to. That's too late. It's not even last week. We can't check this math. It, it would take hours and hours of work. I have no idea how much time it costs for them to do that, but there is literally, we, our experts are already off the stand. So, this is not an expert report. It was not at his deposition. It's additional work, and he's a rebuttal expert, and this is not rebuttal. Could I just have a quick reply? Okay. Uh, all he did was take a look at the data that their expert, Ms. Ms. Board, did have at her disposal under the spreadsheet and say, okay, all the sales of 40 count tubs, what did that amount to? Which, by the way, she had to calculate for purposes of that one million dollar revenue benchmark. The fact that you did not ask your right, expert. Let me back up for a second. For what purpose are you introducing this? Uh, it's a good visual to explain for the six hundred and ninety thousand unit benchmark, um, the difference in revenue for um, if you are looking at that six hundred ninety thousand units as the sales of forty count tubs versus forty count boxes versus individual sticks. Okay. So all this is. I mean, it doesn't say that at the top. I mean, it says wholesale sales and dollars required to earn. So this is just the revenue. This is um, right. This is so that remember that this that six hundred ninety thousand unit benchmark is the one that's tied to the half a million shares. No, I understand that. So that's um, that's the top. So you're just taking six hundred ninety thousand units. If it was six hundred ninety thousand of the forty count tub, it would have generated thirteen million dollars in sales. If it was 690,000 units of the 14 count box, it would have generated 6.9 million. 
And if it was 690,000 units of sticks, it would have generated 492,000. Correct. All right. Um, so but what's just uh, one more thing, Your Honor. See where it says in each column wholesale price 2025 20, under the first column, second okay. wholesale price $1 or $10, I think it's meant to be. Uh, and then the third wholesale price 0 0.7142. Those numbers are nowhere in the data. This is some type of calculation. He's made an average wholesale price. And there, while I can uh, multiply 2025 times 690 and check that myself. That's all he's doing, right? But, how, how, but you can who knows if that 2025 is correct? All right, then that, isn't that, that, doesn't that go to the weight of the evidence? Um, but, but I guess but I don't they're going to have to lay a foundation for that, I guess. Um, and so where where are those numbers that are being multiplied by the 690,000 coming from? Those numbers, he's going to testify to that as to the the numbers that he saw in the sales by SKU defense exhibit 122. Right. I mean, there's nothing preventing him from just getting up on a sheet of paper and writing 690,000 times 20.25, 690,000 times, I guess, 10, or 690,000 times 71 cents, right? And just I would object to that if the 2025 was just, in evidence. But and I think that's what you're trying to accomplish, right? Yeah, correct. I'm not sure if you look at this and you see that right away. It takes a long time to get there. But, but um, if this is what you want to do, I think it's uh, almost confusing. And, okay. and I do have a CPA background, too. So I'm trying not to, I know most lawyers say, you know, the reason I went to law school is I don't understand numbers. But uh, I actually do understand numbers. And that. When you look at that first off, it takes a little while to figure it out. But okay. th that's what you're trying to do, right? Right. Anyway, so I don't see where the objection is. That as long as they lay a foundation for what the number that they're multiplying by 690,000 is. Wait, you on one one more? Yes. It's, it's no different, again, it's no different than a witness getting up there and doing a, a simple multiplication on, on a the, piece of paper. The reason it's different is the 2025 is not in evidence. It's no, he okay. apparently did hours and hours of work so, to, to that with millions of numbers and came up with an average. All right, we'll have to wait and see where he got the 2025 from. It sounds like that's what the motion eliminates to exclude a price to multiply yeah. it. But, but again, it seems like that goes to the weight of the evidence at this point, but they're going to have to lay a foundation for that number. They can't just pick a number out of thin air. Okay, so right. you prefer, so I'll, I'll, if I feel they haven't laid, the, the objection that the work was done after the deposition is overruled, I don't have to make that in front of the jury? You mean that, that this was prepared after? Yeah. Yeah, you have a standing objection. Okay. That, but, um, and so just a foundation, I'll make that if appropriate. All right. Thank you. Oh, can I do one other thing just for the witness? Oh, still... Yeah, there's still nothing in there. Okay. Yeah, they're going to ring the bell when they're done. Okay, so yeah. they do. Oh, yeah. Okay. Just make sure. I'll go over there and check it. Yeah, all right, it's clear, so that it should work. So, um, just to, okay, so they want to stay in for lunch. Okay. Just to notify the witness, I don't know if he was notified. Is the jury right behind that door? I think. I don't know. No, no, they're back in the jury. Oh, okay. they're, they're all the way back in the corner. Um, you had ruled that the word bankruptcy is not going to the issue of the bankruptcy is not coming into evidence. Council did it exactly as you suggested, but the witness doesn't know that, so I would just, I think before the jury comes in, we should let him know that. He's and you're talking about Mr. David? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, Mr. David, can you hear us? I know you're on mute right now. Can you give me a thumbs up? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. All right. Um, I had already ruled that um, there's not been any mention that there was a bankruptcy proceeding. And so, that being said, there was a schedule that was prepared. I allowed the schedule to be introduced and discussed. I, actually, I don't think you introduced it. Just to, it was just to presented. To Mr. Presented. Uh, that being said, you're not to mention anything about a bankruptcy. Understand? Yes, sir. Okay. And then the last thing is, uh, Your Honor, we wanted to uh, offer several uh, exhibits and evidence on the record. Okay. Uh, we offer Exhibit 47, Plaintiff's 47. And what is that? Oh, these are stock certificates, stock certificate right. that was gone over with uh, a strong arm representative. Okay, any objection? No objection, Your Honor. Uh, then we have Defendants 292, which is an investor message from the CEO with the investor information for Celsius. All right, any objection? No objection. All right, that's That's evidence. the full one, yes. And then uh, exhibit uh, Plaintiff 66, which is an email March 4th, 2016. And. Any objection? No objection. All right, that's in evidence as well. And then we have the physical samples, which is a composite exhibit 275. Um, I believe that, uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to just get a little closer so I can see them better. 
what we're going to do is we're going to put composite 75, all of these, then we're going to take pictures of them, and then exhibit 276 is going to be the pictures of that. Okay. And so Can we just mark up both of those right? will be in evidence? Is that, I'm or sorry, is just a evidence. photo? The physical and the, the photos. Okay. The Let me has. ask, um, how does that work when I get up? It's in evidence, and you have to take those into evidence, right? So, oh, yes, um, she can take them, and then okay. if she doesn't want to keep them, we can take them after the trial. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, stuff like that, for, you, you know, outside the court file, but uh, for the court, you know, because I'm sure you're not going to want to take those cans, right? Uh, well, if, that's if, the thing. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, they're actually in evidence, but if you all want to agree to send those back, but, like, not make them part of So, in other words, the photo can go into evidence. It's much easier for the clerk's office okay. to... Keep a photo for the record. <laughs> okay, so we will stipulate that, of the, if you will, that the that physical that physical stuff will go back with the jury, but it's not in evidence. There'll be a photo of it that goes in evidence. Yes. All right. So the record's clear. That's all. Except great. for the Celsius yeah, so heat. So we're offering also the Celsius heat, which where did we get to it? Oh wait, I'm sorry, I think I'm already oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, so that'll be marked as a separate exhibit, correct? Right? Yes, you can do it as a separate exhibit that they object. <coughs> what would be the objection? And the, and the cans of Celsius heat. If they want the case of of the Celsius ready to drink orange, that's one thing, but you're you're trying to you have there a case of Celsius heat. You have the wrong case there. So we'll we can clear that up. Okay, so we'll mark that a separate exhibit. But what would be the objection for putting any any of that in? Well, first, the Celsius heat powder product didn't even exist until like 2021, I believe. Okay. And there's been and uh, with respect to the cans of Celsius heat, besides the fact that this is a new product, not what first came out and was it in in production during our time period, but. Um, in addition to that, they, remember their expert witnesses' populations didn't include any Celsius heat um, uh, calculations, either sticks or powder. Right. No, I understand. So I, it's not part of the calculation for damages or sales, revenues, or units, or anything of that nature, correct? It's not for the calculations. It's for interpretation of how they sell the units, the way they... This is part of a heat, by the way, it's all part of the co-branding that we've been talking about that all happened in 2017 during the contract. So these are examples of co-branding product that Mr. Uh, Dillard was involved with, as well as the fact that they're still doing powder, which they claim is a failure. They're still doing it individually. So all of that is relevant to the issues that the jury should be able to consider about what they're representing. Right. They're the Obviously process. not for purposes of the calculations, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, any additional objection? Um, just that it, I think this is a mischaracteriz mischaracterization of the testimony. It's not that we were claiming that powders were a fading product. It was the Flow Fusion co-branded. No, I understand. So, that goes to the weight of the evidence. Yeah. Y'all can argue that. that I'm going to allow it in evidence. So, well, allow it to go back to the jury, and then the photographs will be um, in evidence. And I, I'm so sorry, Christina. We forgot the pre-existing orange color. You can add that to You, you can add it as your own. But do you want that to be part yeah. of the yeah. yeah, Let's do it separate. That's okay. We won't object. Oh, okay. We'll do a separate. So there'll be separate... I guess photos that are going to evidence for the products, a different one for the heat, and a different one for the pre-contract yes. products. All right? Okay. So we'll break that down. Here's all. They're all here. That's all done. done. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, one last thing, just to preserve the record, because I know that there's been a lot of evidence coming in and exhibits, and I don't know when it did come in, but I just wanted to preserve our objection with regard to the stock prices. Uh, any any introduction of evidence of the stock prices of Celsius after whenever the the, the so-called breach date is no, took place. Um, and it's just objections it. are all preserved. Um, Father motions so they're all preserved. Let me ask. I know at one point you were talking about the actual prices. I think there was a, a spreadsheet or some kind of document that had all the prices on it that you wanted to take judicial notice of, and you wanted to verify those numbers. Are those in? That's yes. it. We okay. verified the numbers, so they're in. All right. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Okay.
Seated, uh, good, morning. good morning. All right, should everybody have a uh, good night's sleep, good breakfast, ready to go? Okay. I have your coffee, it looks like you're all set. Uh, did everyone follow my instructions? Not to discuss the case, have the case discussed in your presence, and not to do any investigation of your own. So, yes? Yes. Okay, and nobody looked at any news media? And no, uh, okay. So, we're all set. We're ready to continue. We still have uh, continued uh, cross examination of Mr. David. Mr. David, we remind you, you're still under oath. You may inquire. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good morning, Mr. David. Good morning. So I should have asked you this yesterday, but um, who's in the room with you? Uh, an attorney, David, um, with Celsius. He's managing the equipment here for me, which I have no knowledge of how to do. Okay, so I, I should have also said this. When we're at sidebar, you shouldn't be having any conversations with anyone in the room, okay? Even though it's kind of a break and the lawyers and judge are talking, okay? Yes, sir. All right. Um, now, um, in the opening statement, the lawyers, or the lawyer for Celsius uh, uh, called Mr. Dillard greed, that this lawsuit was all about greed. I want to show you plan of 63 and ask if this is something that you wrote. It's an article called Five Things That Will Turn Your Celebrity Endorser Into a Brand Ambassador. I, I can't see it on my screen. They're going to hand me a hard copy. Thank you. It, it, we, we don't have it up for anyone yet, so just give us a minute. There we go. Oh, okay. Sorry. All right, so you wrote that article, right? Yes, I did. Where did it appear? I actually don't remember. All right, let me blow up a paragraph, and I'd like you uh, to read that to the jury. Um, the one that starts, but if they live... Can you please read that? Oh, I'm sorry, can you read it out loud? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. But if they live a good life, that will also reflect on your brand. Therefore, it is important to know the lifestyle choices of a potential endorser before hiring them. A good celebrity endorser is generous and kind. A good celebrity endorser helps others and give back to the community. The best celebrity endorser is a model citizen, honorable, and role model for others. When you choose an endorser who is adored by the public, that affection will be transferred to your friend. All right, and then uh, let me, the paragraph above, do they lead? 
I would like you to read uh, another paragraph that it mentions flow rider specifically. Can we make that bigger, Andre? You want me to read that again? Yes, please read that out loud. Huh? You also need to ask yourself if you would trust them. Flo Rida, Emerson Fittipaldi, Blake Cook are celebrities who currently endorse our brand. I chose them for a reason. They all have big hearts, and I know I wanted my brand to be affiliated with them before I made the decision to hire them. Okay. All right, thank you. Now, you know um, that the Celsius drink is known in the hip-hop world as Flo's drink, right? I've never heard that. You've never heard Celsius called Flo's drink? Never heard that. Do you know who Doja Cat is? I'm just picking something, an interview from a month ago on te the national television. Do you know who Doja Cat is? No. Um, okay. So I guess you didn't see her say on national television. Objection, Your Honor. This is. I'm the sustained. Let's look at the contract. Uh, plaintiffs one, paragraph one. Uh, so the word um, product is a defined term, correct? The third, please repeat the question. Sure, in the third paragraph under recitals, the contract defines the word product, right? You know, let me back up a step. You've signed many contracts before, right? Thousands. So you know that sometimes contracts take a word, and just to make sure no one misunderstands, that word is defined. Is that a question? Yes. It, yes, they, okay. they can define it, yes. And right here, in this paragraph, it says that certain things are referred to as involved products. Right? Yes. And so wherever we see the word products in the contract, we know that we should go back to this paragraph and read it because we know exactly what products means in this contract, right? Well, you, you gave me the answer, but I'm not sure that I agree with it. If you go back to that, you can see a definition of what a product is, yes. Well, no. What a product is is a general thing in the English language. But when we say products in this contract, anywhere it says products, it's not talking about any product or general products or the word products. It is defined as, the, I'll read the sentence, company intends to develop, manufacture, and market a modified, what does modified mean, by the way? That's plain English, but it's not defined in the contract. What does modified mean? That the formula or something related to the packaging, or as it relates to the product, is the packaging, it's, it's the label, it's the container, it's the ingredients in the product, and any one of those could be modified. Okay, a modified version of its core products, and that's also a defined term, we're going to look at that in a minute, but core products has already been defined, right? I, I, you're saying that that's already been defined? I, I don't. You're showing me some related to powder products. Okay. So, to make this a little easier, we'll go to the paragraph before and blow that up, please. Take, read that to yourself. Blow that up as big as you can, please, Andre, and tell me if core products is defined in this contract. It is, right? Yes. So we know that uh, what core products mean, wherever it says core products in the contract, it's talking about the current products that Celsius is selling, right? Current as of the date of the contract. When I was at Celsius and running Celsius, the core products, when I referred to core products, it was the RTD beverages were our core products. 
the power products at the time were not considered, in my mind, as a core products. Yeah, and the contract doesn't say it exactly the same way, but that is what the contract essentially says. The core products, the products, the ready-to-drink cans that you were already selling in 2014, right? That's what you meant by core products, and that's consistent with the contract. Yes. All right, so now let's go back to the, the paragraph we were at before. We know what core products are anywhere in the contract. When we see that, we know what it means. In addition, whenever we see product, that is also defined in the contract, and that's defined as the new products. It says specifically, such new products are referred to as the products, right? That's correct. And those new products that are being referred to there are the co-branded products, correct? Yes. All right. So I got that right. The products are the co-branded products. Could you please say that again? Yeah. The products, anywhere in the contract, products are the co-branded products, the new products. Okay. Sorry, Mr. David, I'm just getting an easel out here uh, so I can write some things. If you want to. For uh, clarity, first of all, why don't you turn it just a tiny bit, Mr. David? Can you see what's on the uh, easel? No, I cannot. I right. just want to read that for him, just so. So, Mr. David, I wrote product equals new, and then underneath I wrote co-branded, and I'm going to put quotes around product, the defined term. Plaintiff is showing plain, uh, plaintiff's 207 for identification. We talked about the NACS conference that um, Flo Rida performed at, right? You, you talked about that on direct? Yes. And uh, would you agree with uh, somebody at Celsius? Uh, well, first of all, who is Linda Loring Julia? Linda Gollop? Yeah, is that how you pronounce it? Yes. Who is she? Linda worked in our marketing department. So he performed at the NACS conference, the largest convenience store event, which led to new distribution at 7 Eleven, Sunoco, and more. That's accurate, right? Yep. I would say that's not, not accurate. Okay, so just like the uh, report about 27 million Facebook reach from your marketing department was inaccurate, um, someone in your marketing department saying that the NAX conference led to distribution at 7-Eleven, Sunoco, and more is inaccurate. Objection, Your Honor, mischaracterizing prior testimony. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, sustained. Uh, rephrase. Sure, objection sustained. So if I, uh, if there's an objection, you have to wait till I rule. I've sustained the objection. You do not need to answer that question. Um, ask your next question.
What's inaccurate about that? One event such as the next conference is just one small piece of all of the things that had to happen to win those accounts. It, it probably, in my mind, represented maybe a few percent of it. Um, when we attend any type of event like that, it's a, it, it's a, a piece of so many other pieces. We, our sales organization has to do what they have to do right. There's many, many meetings that happen behind the scenes related to it. There's uh, our supply chain people have to do uh, accumulate data. There's just a, a tremendous amount of work that could take months. It could take a, a year or more of work by numerous people, but the NACS conference singularly did not cause us to get those accounts. You had a private meetings with 7-Eleven executives at that NACS conference, right? That was arranged by D3M. Well, to my knowledge, D3M had nothing to do with arranging those meetings. You didn't even want to do the next conference. They had to pay for half of it, didn't they? For, for Celsius to get distribution, Flowrider and T3M are paying for half of the cost for you guys to get distribution. What piece of the conference did they pay half of? I'm not familiar with that. You don't what remember anything about that? Pay for? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Say that again. I, I, I don't. I don't understand how they paid for half of the whole conference. Are you saying that they paid for half of the booth? Are they paying that they paid for half of all our airfare, of all our people? That, that's what I'm trying to understand. There were uh, the cost of distribution at the Max conference, having the exhibit space, being a prime exhibitor. That all cost money. In addition, uh, uh, having Flowrider perform. No, what I'm, I, I, I'm not, your question is not really clear to me because you, you have to give me more information. What did, if you're asking me if I agree with something, please give me the exact information of what they paid for. In other words, are you talking about flow attending the conference or are you talking about the booth, the space in the booth, all of the people that we flew in there from our company there? Are you saying that he paid for half of that? Who paid for the booth? The booth, the, the, the space, the, the, the prime space at this conference that you guys had. Who paid for it? Uh, I, no, I, I, I'm not the right person and six years later to ask that or how long it's been. I would say that I would have thought that we would have paid for it, but I'm not sure. I would have thought too. Um, so uh, you do remember at the concert that Flo Rida performed there, um, he brought the child of the key 7-Eleven executive up on stage. You remember that, right? I actually did not remember that. Okay, you, you, but the 7-Eleven deal came right after the next conference. How about that? You remember that? The 7-Eleven deal also incorporated when Russell Simmons did a, a video conference with all their executives and he committed to the executives that he would fully support um, the effort of Celsius in there. And remember that that 7-Eleven, 90 percent of their distrib of their stores are owned by franchisees. So our company had to spend months and months, and more than a year or more, to call on each of the of the, of the franchise groups to try to get our product in. Singularly, we did not get into all of 7-Eleven. They only own 10% of the stores. And you were glad to have those calls to franchise and get the product into the 7-Eleven stores. You were glad for that opportunity, right? Well, first of all, I attended the meeting at 7-Eleven. I, I don't believe that Flo singularly got us into 7-Eleven. Trust me. there's. So much more that goes behind getting a large account like 7-Eleven. All right, look, let, let me go back because at the end of your answers I get uh, excited and I want to address that. But let's go back because you still didn't answer my first question about the timing. The timing of the 7-Eleven deal was right after the next conference. Is that right? I'm asking you a question about timing. 
I don't remember it happening immediately after the conference. No. Well, by immediately, do you mean an hour or a day? I'm talking about within a month and a half. I don't remember if it happened in a month and a half. Okay. And, um, but you do agree whether you want to give them full credit or half credit or tiny credit, you do agree that they were helping you with the 7-Eleven distribution, D3M, Flo Rida, and his team, correct? I agree that Flo doing his job within the parameters of the contract, right? All the things that he was supposed to do, he was, he, his participation was well within the bounds of the contract and attending or going to something, an event, and, and uh, being there, that's what we paid him for, yes. But similarly, he did not give us 7-Eleven. Thank you for that, and those are all interesting facts, but what I'm asking is, you agree that Florida and D3M and Florida's team helped with the, getting the 7-Eleven deal? They were a, a small, very small piece of us getting that account, which took us years of work to get that account. Okay, a very small piece. They helped. Now, um, you know that 7-Eleven doesn't sell any powder, right? Please ask that again. 7-Eleven doesn't sell powder. They only sell ready-to-drink cans. You know that, right? They did not sell our powder in, well, in the... That, that's a fair answer. I don't know what other powders they may be selling, but they didn't sell your powder. 7-Eleven? Yes. To my knowledge, when I was at Celsius, they were not selling our powder. All right, so now let me, let me read you a couple of things that you wrote. I think... Um, So I'm going to read from a document that is already in evidence, uh, that uh, uh, email that you wrote. Um, but actually, actually, what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask you if you agree with certain things. Okay, that's what I'm going to ask you right now. You agree? You know um, that the 2014 contract, what Florida agreed <coughs> to his compensation for compensation, was in lieu of seven figures which he typically gets for a deal like that. Seven figure upfront money, that's what he typically gets, but this deal was different than what, what, he, what he normally gets. You know that, right? No, I, I, I actually did not know that, but I do know that, his, that the shares that he did receive from us are now worth over $50 million. I'm going to show you an email. Who is uh, Bill Milma? This email is to Bill Milma. Bill Milma, uh, at that time, was the chairman of the board of Celsius, and he was also president of CDS Holdings, which was Carl DeSantis' holding company. And Jerry David, that's you who wrote this. Right? Yes. You wrote this email? Yes. This is all, you're talking about the flow rate deal, this is all in lieu of seven-figure upfront money as he typically gets. I am asking the board to approve the deal points. 
You wrote that. This is all in lieu of seven-figure upfront money, which you typically get. Okay, I've, um, I see that now. Okay, so you just don't remember now, but you knew it then. Yeah, but that's been quite a few years. So yes, I see that. That's that's perfectly true. Uh, the flow over uh, from the deal, the flow over from the powder sales to the ready to drink product line, you knew was going to be significant due to the increase in brand awareness, or you intended it to be significant due to the increase in brand awareness, right? At, at the time, we had all the hope in the world that the product would succeed, right? I mean, we, we went into this thinking very positively that it would succeed, and, and the product failed miserably. That's a different answer. Okay, I'm not talking about the power sales. I'm talking about success, the definition of success, because success to you was the increase in brand awareness that would lead to more ready to drink sales. Your Honor, can we have a question, please? Correct. Could you restate that, please? Yeah, sure. You just said the product was a failure. You're defining failure in whatever way you are, but I'm going back to your words at the time to try to see what you thought success was. And to you, success was flow over, increase in brand awareness, and flow over to increase sale of cans. That was success, right? The only reason we engaged with any celebrity for being a spokesperson or a brand ambassador is to increase, hopefully increase our sales. Whether it was Flo or anybody else. Right, but sales, not just of the powder product, but flow over sales to the ready to drink. We, we hired Flo to represent the company, right, as a brand ambassador and yes, I mean, we were hoping that through our engagement with Flo, that he would uh, help generate additional sales for all of our products. Okay, right. So that's part of the success of this deal, the flow over sales to ready to drink. Am I right about that? Your Honor, question's been asked and answered. All right, um, overall. You can answer. Please, please ask the question again. Would you try to give this to me? Not remind me what the question is. So that's part of the success of this deal, the flow over sales to ready to drink. Am I right about that? Did you hear that or should I say it again? Please say it again. So that's part of the success of this deal, the flow over sales to ready to drink. Am I right about that? We can clearly measure the co-branded product sales uh, directly under, you know, under our co-branded with Flow. Uh, we had many other things that the company, with initiatives the company had other than Flow that was generating additional sales for the company on the ready to drink product and our core products. But the answer to your question is, what the reason we hired Flow was yes, to help increase sales of the overall company. I just wrote yes. Is that fair? You just said yes, right? Yes, he, we, we hired Flo in the, in the parameters of the contract and the goal was to help increase sales of the company. That's why we hired him. Do you go by Jerry? I know that's not your uh, official name. I don't want to write Jerry if that's not what you mean. Yes, I go by Jerry. Okay. That's great. Now, I know we have a disagreement about whether the de benchmarks were met during the term, the initial term of the 2014 contract in order to get the 500,000 shares of stock and the 250,000 shares of stock. I know we disagree about that, but let me see if I think we agree on something. If, if, understanding that you don't think those benchmarks were met, 
But if the benchmarks were met, it would not be good faith and fair dealing to hide that fact. Correct? Objection, Your Honor. That calls for legal conclusion. All right. Um, sure. I'm going to sustain the objection as phrased. Uh, That would not be appropriate. That would be a violation of the contract to hide the data if the benchmarks were met. Correct? Objection, Your Honor. It's a violation of contract. That's that's called um, legal. Overruled. That's uh, not a legal term. All right. Now you can answer. Uh, if I, I heard many voices. Could you please ask that question right. again? I'm just asking. I know we disagree whether the benchmarks were met, but if they were met, if they were met. It would not be appropriate, it would be a violation of this contract to hide that data. Right? Well, I think hiding any information like that uh, would be unethical, which I would never agree to. Right? And violate. I would never do. Sorry, finish, please. Go ahead and finish your answer. <laughs> Yeah, I think if, if hiding, hiding data, um, I, I would agree that uh, what is not ethical and, would, would, and I would never, ever, ever do something like that or I would expect anybody to work for me to do anything like that. And it's not uh, a defense to Florida and D3M and Strongarm to say, oh, we hid the data. Of course not, right? Objection, Your Honor. We're, we're right on the edge of... Asking a witness a legal conclusion, what is the defense? Right. Um, uh, su objection sustained, rephrase. On behalf of Celsius, when you were CEO, you would agree that Celsius would not want this jury to say Celsius successfully hid the data so they win the lawsuit. Success Celsius successfully, successfully misled the plaintiffs so they should win the lawsuit. You agree. On behalf of Celsius, as the CEO for many years, that you would not want Celsius to do that. So, are, are you asking me, uh, just to be clear, are you asking me a question related to when I was CEO and president, or are you asking me a question related to today? Well, you're not CEO anymore, so I'm asking you, as the person who was CEO when these contracts were signed, who was involved in the negotiations of the contracts, that in your view of the contract, and you've been asked many times by both me and Counsel for Celsius, your view of the contract and what it means, it is not acceptable under the contract for Celsius to hide data or mislead the plaintiffs. Answering your question, I believe, is that I don't believe hiding information or providing misinformation is ethical. And yes, I, 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 I don't agree that that would be good. All right. All right. Um, last area. Um, you, you, you. A um, couple of times in your deposition, you did use the word renewal. But your, uh, your position is that the 2016 contract was not a renewal of the 2014 contract, correct? Anyone can misspeak, so I'm not suggesting anything. I'm just saying your position, Martin. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I know the, con well, the contract was uh, not, a, not a renewal. The contract was renegotiated the second time because I'm the one that negotiated the contract. And it was, and the contract was not an extension. And and, I, and I'll tell you this: if it was an extension of the first contract, I would not have had to go back to the board of directors uh, to get their approval. Uh, I could have extended that on my own with an addendum. But because the contract was a brand new contract the second time, we had financial money that was going to go to be uh, a part of it to compensate flow. There was going to be stock to be a part of that and none of that was in the budget at the time so I had to go back to the board for approval because it was a brand new contract. So it was not a renew it was not a renewal. Sorry, just give us a minute. We're having a little uh, tech delay. 
Who's uh, John Fieldley? While we're waiting for that to come up. Is that a question? Yes, who is John Fieldley? Who is John Fieldley? Yes. The, John Fieldley is currently the chairman, CEO, and president of Celsius. And who was he in 2016 when this contract was being... Um, renewed? He, he, he was the CFO. Okay, so uh, there's an email from him to you um, for your review, and he says the attached file contains the economic proposal for the flow rider. <laughs> I'm sorry, flow rider renewal. Right, that's the word he used. Right. All right. Uh, Point of sixty-eight. Uh, there were board of directors meetings around that time too. Correct. We had board of directors meetings every quarter, so I assume there was. And there was one in March on March 29, 2016. One of the items discussed as a as reflected in the the official meeting notes of the board of directors of the Celsius Corporation was items discussed renewal of the Florida endorsement agreement. Correct. That's correct. Renewal to me. When we use that word in this in the context it was used, it's it, the word it, within the word renewal is the word new, and in our minds, in my mind, whenever I use that, it meant that it was a new contract. If I was going to extend this contract, I would have said a contract extension, and that would have been very clear. A renewal in my mind meant we were going to we were going to redo a new contract with with Law. All right, and you guys issued a press release. About this, point of 64. You guys issued a press release, correct? Uh, I'm, I'm sure we released it. I don't have it in front of me, but there it is. All right, so uh, just the title of the press release Celsius Renews Partnership. Is that a question? Yes, is that what you, Celsius, told the world that it renewed the partnership? Well, I mean, in the context, in my mind, that context means that we had a, con we had a contract with, with Flow and we moved on and we're going to continue with Flow in a new contract. We have a new contract. We renew and have a new contract. The, the, the fact is, we had a completely separate new contract. It was not an extension of the first contract at all. In a brand new contract that we had to negotiate, I had to make the decision if, in fact, I wanted to even continue with law in a new contract. And then we re re renegotiated a brand new contract for the, in, in uh, 2016. So you'll just let's just cut this short. You'll agree with me that there's press releases, there's board of meeting minutes, there's emails from you, there's emails to you, there's emails inside your marketing department, and none of them talk about a new contract. Every single time, it's a, a uh, renewal. Correct? You're. Your definition, I believe, of renew is different than mine. Um, but I have to tell you, I would never have been in front of the board of directors if, again if I was continuing the original contract. It was a brand new contract, and renew to me means we're, we're creating a new contract. The word new is within the word renew. That's what it means to me. Yeah, I was about to sit down, but you just thought of something. That's not what you said in your deposition. You said it was a mistake. It was loose language. Not that it's new. Renewal means new. It, renew could mean You're many right. things. Check, it could right. mean something different. Hang on, hang on. It means something Hang on, hang on. Uh, all right. All right. Let's this, is in, this is improper impeachment. All right. Uh, overall, you can. Go Did ahead. you get his answer? Yes. Okay. So it's, I think she got his answer. What, what's it? Are you finished with your answer, Mr. David? Yeah, it's just renew means something different to you. It could mean something different. I know what it meant to me and everybody else. 
we were, we were creating a new contract and continuing with uh, another uh, um, relationship with Flow. That's all that meant. And you, you just you said in your answer before the court reporter has this down, but um, because it was hard to hear, renewal could mean many things to different people. That's what you said. It, 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 yeah, it means something obviously different to you than it does to me. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, any redirect? Yes, sir. <coughs> Good morning, Jared. Just a couple of questions. Um, while you were CEO of Celsius, did Celsius hide any data from B3M? Never. I would never hide any data from them or anybody else. Never. Did there come did there come times when you had you would have conversations with Mr. Gold regarding the status of the sales of your co branded products? I had several conversations with uh, David Gold regarding that. And um, what did you tell David Gold about how the sale of the co branded products would do? I, I know specifically, I, I had meetings with them, I had phone calls with them, I shared with them that the, the co-branded product was not selling well, was not meeting any of our expectations. Did Mr. David challenge your statement in any way? David Gold, did he challenge, is that what you asked? Yes. He never, he never challenged my, I, you know, I think he understood that I was giving him the facts and that, uh, um, but he never challenged him, no. I mean, did he ever tell you that I don't believe you, Jerry, or I doubt you? No, never. Um, and did he ever ask you specifically, I'd like to see the sales data? David Gold never asked me once, ever, never asked me uh, for the sales data. If, if David Gold would have asked me for the sales data, I would have given him the sales data. I would have been happy to give it to him. And, he never asked me. And if you had given him the sales data, what would that data have shown, Mr. Gold? It, it would have clearly shown him that the sales at GNC at the time were... were uh, not doing well at all. And would it have shown that basically the benchmarks that had been negotiated in the contracts were not going to be met within the two-year term, right? It, it, I believe it would have clearly showed them that there, there was very a very small chance that the product was going to meet the expected objective in the contracts, yes. And by the way, while you were CEO of the company, was were the books and records of Celsius audited by outside certified public accountants? Well, we, I believe it had to be audited uh, uh, during that time when our engagement with Flow uh, and D3M, they had to be audited as a public company. And we also, the information was public information. And did the auditors of Celsius sign off on annual sales, sales figures of Celsius during the time period that you were CEO? Uh, I, you know, I believe they had. To, uh, I believe they had to. Yeah. Um, one last area of question, Mr. David. We, Plans Council asked some questions yesterday about uh, Emerson Fittipaldi. Um, are you a racing fan? Yes, I am. Um, I go into the Indy 500 40 years in a row. All right. So, Emerson Fittipaldi, is Emerson Fittipaldi a, a person, you know, a celebrity figure that's important to you? Yes. And back in 2014, was Emerson Fittipaldi an important sports icon, at least from your perspective? From my perspective, definitely. And, and, and just so that the jurors are clear, in 2014, what were some of the accomplishments that, at least that you recall, you don't have to say too many, but what kind of accomplishments had Mr. Fittipaldi enjoyed when you entered, when Celsius entered into the endorsement agreement with Mr. Fittipaldi? 
Motorsports is the number one sporting event in the world. Um, the epitome of that is being a Formula One driver in the Formula One racing. And Emerson was the two-time Formula One world champion at the time. He was also the Indy car champion. He won the Indianapolis 500 a couple times, as well as the entire Indy Racing League. And to me, I mean, and to many people, including the racing world, he's a legend and was a legend at that time uh, in that in that sport. Did you, at that point in time, feel that you knew him just because of his accomplishments? Well, I had a good feel for him. I, I mean, I followed him a, a lot over the years. I remember seeing him in the night in the '90s racing, um, you know, and, and back earlier than that. So I, I had, you know, I felt an affinity towards him, yes. Now, in comparison, and, and not to denigrate Mr. Diller, Flo Ryder, what was your understanding of Mr. Of Flo Ryder, Mr. Diller, at the time you started negotiations uh, with his team on the 2014 endorsement agreement? Well, I mean, look, I, I love Flo. Okay, and I really I very, feel very strongly for him. But the honesty is that when that was brought to me by John Organo, where his last name is, I didn't even know who Flo Ryan was. Okay, I had no idea who he was and what he did. And it was after only time that I got to, through my own research and so forth, uh, got to know, you know a little bit more about who he was and so forth. And all my dealings in the my relationship with Flo and D3M was really D3M. For all the negotiations was with them, um, and a lot, you know, very little with Flo himself. Whereas on the other side, with Emerson Fittipaldi, uh, he immediately told his management don't, don't, to get don't, out of don't, the... Don't mention what, oh, Mr. Don't then mention what Mr. Fittipaldi told, told him. That's, that's not necessary, okay? Okay, well, anyway, all my dealings with Emerson were directly with him. Thank you very much. Mr. Thank, you, Mr. Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. David. No, no further questions. Any recross on those areas? Yes, yes sir. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about all that talk about Emerson Fittipaldi. You're a race fan, right? Yes. Not a hip-hop fan. You don't like hip-hop. No, I'm not saying I don't like hip-hop, but I'm not a hip-hop big fan, no. Yeah. Um, so, just because you didn't know who Flo Rida was doesn't mean he's not seventh biggest song of all time, right? Just because you didn't know it doesn't make it not true. So could you ask that question again, please? Just because... You know more about Emerson Fittipaldi doesn't make him a bigger star than Flo Rida. It's not what you know, it's what the truth is, right? Uh, I, I, your question is a little confusing to me. Are you asking me, do I think Flo Rida is not a star? Or, or, or do I think he's not a, as big a star as... Emerson, because I knew about Emerson. Is that what is your question? Please be more specific. We just had a bunch of questions on how great Emerson Fittipaldi is, and everyone knows him, biggest star in the world. No offense to Flo, but I don't even know who he is. Judge, you're on right. characterizing his testimony. Uh, overall. So my question is: just because you don't know doesn't take anything away from. Diamond, diamond songs, hundred, you know how many artists have hundred million dollar sales of a song? How few that is? If, if, if you're trying to say that I'm diminishing Flo Rida at all, I'm not. Okay, okay. Then, then we're on the same page. Thank you. Yep. Right. Um, any questions from the jury? Yes? Okay. <laughs>
Anybody else? Okay. Um, these are questions from the jury. All right. First of all, um, do you own any Celsius stock? Uh, yes, I do at this time. And what is the size of your position to the outstanding shares? What percentage? How many shares do I have, Your Honor? I think it's more as a percentage as to all shares. I guess what percent of the company would you own? Oh, that I'm holding right now? Yes. Uh, um, I only have 25,000 shares that I'm holding at this time and that I own. And uh, there's over, I think, 70 million shares that are in the company. All right. Um, any follow-up on that, uh, Mr. Kassel? Mr. Kassel, any follow-up? No, Your Honor. Any follow-up, um, Mr. Kassel? No, sir. All right. Um, next uh, set of questions. Um, why did Celsius or why Celsius didn't provide any flow fusion related reports to D3M? Uh, I'm well, the way I would answer that is if, if they asked me for those reports, uh, they would have received them. Um, I'm not aware of, and John Fieldy will be better served to answer that um, because he would have been the one to provide the actual information, but I, on my account, nobody ever asked me in all my meetings with David Gold not once did he ask me for information related uh, to the sales of the product. Now, um, and I'm not even, uh, to be honest with you, I don't, I don't even know if he may have, we may have shared numbers with him um, at that time, it was you were talking about many years ago. So um, I, I, all I can tell you is there's absolutely no reason in the world we would not provide them the numbers if, if they need if they wanted them. Okay, or and, I, and again I'm going to say it, we may have provided them numbers verbally. We may have provided numbers to him, uh, but I don't remember personally. I know I, I never was asked to give him any. I mean that he asked for any numbers from me. There's no reason for us to withhold those numbers. Okay. <laughs> right. no um, these, again, these are questions from the jury. Next question is, why Celsius hasn't communicated timely to D3M about bad sales performance for the Flow Fusion product to improve the sales? So was this during my time at Celsius or, or the years following since then? So I, that's what I need to understand. Right. Um, it doesn't say, so that, that's the question. Uh, you want to answer that? Again, I'm not, uh, there, if it's back when I was uh, CEO of Celsius, there was would be absolutely no reason that we would not provide that information to them. In fact, we may have provided that information to David Gold at that time. I mean, I, I, I find it, for me personally, I find it hard to believe that we that they were that they would not know what the sales numbers were. I mean, and, and go for four years and never once come to me and say we're not getting the sales. I don't remember that at all. All right. Next question: Did Celsius use a different sales strategy for the Flow Fusion products versus existing ones? If yes, explain why. If no, explain why the sales were unsatisfactory, considering that only packaging is different, but formula is the same. Flow Fusion product was a, a powdered product, um, and our core line, as you know, is a ready-to-drink liquid product. Uh, the uh, distribution strategy on uh, the RTDs is that we could go into the, the traditional, at the price point they were at, we could go into the grocery chains, we could go into the convenience stores, we would go into all, most mass retail we could go into that with. Being a powdered product, it, it, it limits the number of locations that we could go into. And again, it was a product that, uh, called Flow Fusion that, uh, that had no brand awareness at all when it went in. So it, the, the difficulty that we went into GNC because it was a specialty chain where the people were, were trained on all their products. People would walk into the store if you go into a GNC or vitamin shop and they could answer questions about your product. So if they saw Flow Fusion on the shelf or they saw Flow's picture on the cardboard display of him in the store, they could ask, what is that? 
that would not happen in Publix or Kroger. Those people, you wouldn't be able to talk to anybody about the product. So we, we, the best chance for success of the Flow Fusion powder was going to be in a specialty chain. And, and, and in the specialty chain, we ended up having to take back a tremendous amount of product off the shelves. And it, didn't, it just it didn't resonate with the people. All right, you may have answered this already. Um, next question from the jury is, was the Celsius, or was Celsius selective to the products they promote, or um, all products were promoted equally? Elaborate. The, um, so, you know, Celsius uh, was, pr is, was promoting Celsius, obviously, and Celsius was part of the co-brand on the product. We, um, in, on, our, on our websites, on our, uh, on our, we had all the same marketing materials for the, the co-branded products. Um, we spent a tremendous amount of money, as an example, with GNC. I mean, it cost us a lot of money to, pro to, to do the promotions we, uh, and, and the displays that we put into the stores. Uh, we, we, you know, uh, the answer is no. We gave as much as we wanted the Flow Fusion products to succeed, right? I mean, there's no product that we launched that we're not going to try to do, give our best effort for them to succeed. And we did that with Flow Fusion. And, uh, and our relationship with, with Flow, um, it was about all our products, and we gave attention to all of them, including Flow Fusion, tremendous attention to that product. It just did not resonate, it did not succeed with the populace, the consumers. All right, any follow-up, Mr. Cassell? No, Your Honor. Any follow-up, Mr. Cecil? Uh, yes, sir. Um, the powder product is a great success, correct? I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't know, what, you're asking me today is it a great success? Yeah, the powder product, there was a modified product developed, powder form, and you're still selling powder today, correct? Or Celsius is? I, I, but I don't work at the company, so I can't tell you exactly how they're doing with that product today. I don't know. That's a question for John Fielder. Fair enough. Now, when did you leave the company? March of 2017 is when I retired. Okay. And just two other quick questions. Your son, uh, who the jury heard from in um, deposition, also works at the company and he's in the courtroom? He, he's been with the company, I believe, almost 10 years. Okay, and so uh, both you and him had a lot more stock at one time than $25,000. Your Honor, objection. This is, we're getting into a highly irrelevant area with respect to ownership of stock. Of, of um, just, a, just one, uh, overall, I'll allow that question. More than 25,000 shares, yes, I had more than 25,000 shares. Thank you. Any follow-up on those limited areas? No, Your Honor. Any additional questions from the jury? Anyone else? All right, thank you very much, Mr. David. Um, you are excused. I'm going to go ahead and end the uh, Zoom. I mean, there's no other witnesses by Zoom, correct? No, Your Honor. Okay, so, uh, all right. Thank you. All right, we're going to take a 10-minute uh, break, and then we'll come back and move on to the next witness.
All right, everyone can be seated. All right, defense call your next witness. Um, the defense call is Scott Bachner. Thank you. 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 Uh, Mr. Bachner, where are you employed? Berkowitz Pollock Brandt. And what is your position at Berkowitz Pollock Brandt? I am the director in charge of our firm's forensic accounting practice. And what type of work do you do as a forensic accountant? I do a wide range of things. Uh, that would include uh, providing testimony in cases such as this one. I do business valuation work. I do uh, work on bankruptcies and receiverships, things of that nature. And how long have you been doing forensic accounting? Just over 30 years now. Do you have any professional registrations or certifications? Yes. I'm a certified management accountant. I'm a certified valuation analyst. I'm a certified fraud examiner. And I'm a certified insolvency and restructuring advisor, which deals with bankruptcy. And do you have any other professional affiliations? I. Uh, I'm members of all of those organizations that uh, uh, give out those credentials. Have you published articles in involving forensic accounting? Yes, yes. I've worked extensively with the uh, AICPA. That's the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. I've written practice aids for other accountants to use, uh, dealing on issues such as lost profits and economic damages, um, reasonable certainty in, uh, in commercial disputes, uh, discount rate issues, things like that. Have you ever taught or lectured in the area of forensic accounting? Yes, many times. I'm teaching on Thursday next week. Have you ever testified in court as an expert? Yes, I've testified in state court, in federal court, in bankruptcy court. Um, okay, so Mr. Rockman, I think we've established that you, you know what you're doing, you've been around for a while. Are there certain standards for forensic accounting services? Yes, uh, the AICPA released something called the Statement of Standards for, for uh, Forensic uh, Services. Do those standards allow a forensic accountant to look at multiple types of data or information and make inferences? Yes, it's encouraged. Uh, there is a sufficient relevant data standard which would encourage somebody to be looking at sufficient relevant information in order to be able to reach a conclusion or an opinion. Forensic part of forensic accounting? Yes, it is. Because otherwise, we just need a computer. Is that right? That's right. Uh, Mr. Bogner, when Ms. Spohr testified yesterday, she mentioned that forensic accountants cannot render a legal opinion. Do you agree with her? I do. Have you rendered any legal opinions in this case? I have not. So, how is what you describe in terms of reviewing the sufficient relevant data standards different from rendering a legal opinion? Well, I think it's important to be able to understand all of the sufficient relevant information in the case. So it doesn't matter whether you're, you're you can't just look at only the, uh, the spreadsheets. Um, I looked at uh, correspondence. Um, I spoke with uh, uh, people from Celsius. I reviewed the legal documents in order to understand the business terms that were outlined in the agreement. I think all of that is relevant in reaching an opinion. Um, when you said you reviewed correspondence, are you referring to internal Celsius emails? Yes, uh, there was information that talked about things such as uh, when products came online, when packaging was available in order for the products to be sold. That would be information that would be relevant, information that wasn't explicitly identified in the spreadsheets. And was all the information that you reviewed and relied upon disclosed to the plaintiffs? and their expert witness in your report? Uh, either in my report, I recall in my deposition, there may have been a few additional things that I had identified. Uh, Mr. Bachner, what did my client, what did Celsius ask you and your firm to do in this case? I was asked to review Ms. Bohr's uh, declaration and her schedules and her analysis. I was asked to review some of the pleadings in the case, the complaint, the counterclaim, trying to understand what the issues were. Uh, I was asked to review all of the information that was uh, produced by Ms. Bohr or by uh, Celsius that would be relevant to the calculations um, and to uh, provide an opinion if I disagreed with 
on Ms. Board's conclusions. Are you being compensated for your time? I am. How much have you billed Celsius to date? Uh, approximately $75,000. In your performing your analysis, um, I think you spoke a little bit about what documents you reviewed. Um, so I want to go into that. You reviewed certain spreadsheets, correct? That's correct. Okay. And were these the same spreadsheets that plaintiffs, uh, forensic accountant reviewed? Yes, they are. Um, with respect to the $1 million gross co-branded revenue benchmark that is an issue in this case. What did you conclude with respect to the work done by the plaintiff's forensic accountant as to that $1 million revenue benchmark? Uh, it was my conclusion that when you included the appropriate units uh, that were at issue, the revenues for that trailing 12-month period that has been discussed in the case was not achieved during the stated contract term. Your Honor, I object. He's interpreting the contract. We may have to have a sidebar on this because it's going to be throughout the testimony. Well, um, can you clarify? I'm going to sustain the objection. Can I clar um, clarify? Uh, can you clarify what, what did you assume the term of the 2014 agreement for purposes of your review to be? Uh, when I said the stated contract term, I was looking at specifically the term, the March 2014 to March 2016 term that was identified in the body of the document. I'm not making any opinions beyond that date. Um, and did you refer to any data in your calculations beyond March 2016 uh, with respect to this $1 million revenue benchmark? I would have also considered what was known as the use-up period. That was a 60-day a period of time beyond the date of the term that was identified in the agreement uh, where uh, additional sales can be done. Okay. When you say use-up period, what exactly are you referring to? So there was some language in Exhibit A of the 2014 agreement. Okay. And that, yeah. Can we put that up for the jury? So plaintiff's exhibit one, and it would be page 16 of that agreement. That's right. All right, Mr. Bachner, can you take a look and tell us if this is what you were referring to when you mentioned the user period? Yes, uh, exactly. Okay, so you're saying that you included sales of products after March 6, 2016 to accommodate the fact that the parties had contemplated um, a winding down period of two months in sales that was contemplated in the agreement and included? Yes, that was my understanding. Thank you. Um, and what products did you consider in reviewing whether Celsius achieved that $1 million in gross co-branded revenue goal during a 12-month period? Well, the two primary products would have been the uh, 40 serving tubs and the 14-pack boxes. Um, I want to break that up a little bit and talk about the tubs first and then the 14-pack boxes. Mr. Bachner, in reviewing the sales data provided by Celsius, do you recall approximately when the sales of the 40-count flow fusion tubs began? Yes, I believe it was in July of 2014. And was that clear from the sales data that you reviewed? Yes, the sales data had all the individual transactions, so you can see exactly when the tubs were first uh, sold. Was it evident from the sales transactions that the flow fusion tubs were a different product reported in the sales data? Yes, they were identified as 40 in the product category column of the spreadsheet. Now, let's talk about the, the boxes. Did you include sales of seven count boxes in your calculations? No, I did not. Why not? Because they were not branded as flow fusion on, on, the, on the box. And on what date did you start including sales data relating to the sales of 14 count boxes? I began on September 1st of 2014. Why September 1st? 
Well, there was information that I received that came from the packaging company that manufactured the boxes that held each of the sticks. And the berry was first made available in September of 2014 and the orange in October of 2014. So you couldn't have sold the boxes until the packages were created. They were packaged in those boxes and then available for sale. And you know, Ms. Ms. Ford testified um, that it wasn't evidence in the sales data where you went from the pre-existing 14 count boxes to the new co-branded Low Fusion 14 count boxes. So is this how you accommodated that issue, the fact that it wasn't um, differentiated in the sales data? Your Honor, I object just, I think it's unclear by you, it suggests that Ms. Ford was testifying about this witness, um, but I don't think that's what counsel needs Oh no, Mr. Okay. Bachner, how did you, um, how did you address this issue about the sales of the 14 count boxes um, not showing a difference in pre-existing versus low fusion? So I agree with Ms. Bohr. The spreadsheets didn't specifically identify it, which is why I was looking outside of the body of the spreadsheets for other information. And I couldn't think of anything better than to be able to establish when the boxes were created as the starting point. In fact, I believe that the September 1st date that I used was actually conservative. We know that the orange boxes weren't done until October. It also took a little time from the time the boxes are produced to the time the sales could be made. So it's likely that it would have been several months after September 1st. But um, I use that just in an abundance of caution and to be conservative. So in being conservative, you're sort of giving the plaintiffs the benefit of the doubt and including sales of 14 count boxes, even if it's possible that they weren't actually slow fusion. Yes, to the extent that the first sales would have been made sometime after September 1st would have resulted in a greater number of uh, revenues and boxes being given credit to the plaintiffs. So you testified that you removed the sales of seven count boxes from the calculation and you did a circling sales of 14 count boxes until September 1st. So you're removing sales of 14 count boxes from March 10th, 2014 to August 30th, 2014. Do I have that right? That's correct, yes. Um, and what was your conclusion after removing those seven count boxes and the pre-September 1st, 2014 sales of 14 count boxes with respect to that $1 million gross co-branded revenue benchmark? My conclusion was that over the course of that period that we discussed before, from March of 2014 through March of 2016, plus the 60 days, there was no period of time within that roughly 26-month range where revenues exceeded $1 million. And did Plaintiff's forensic accountant, Ms. Gore, include the seven count boxes and the sales of two existing 14 count boxes in her calculations? This yes, for the revenue calculation, she did. And even including sales of these additional products under Ms. Ford's calculation, was that $1 million revenue goal net before April 10, 2016? No, not in that period of time. I, I want to move on now to the 690,000 unit benchmark. With respect to the 2014 agreement, what did you conclude as to the work done by plaintiff's expert as to the 690,000 unit benchmark? Um, based on my review of all of the data and the information, some of which we've already discussed, uh, at no point in time over the course of the, well, either the first <coughs> agreement or the second agreement, was that 690,000 unit benchmark uh, reached. Did you look at the language of the 2014 agreement in analyzing the data with respect to this benchmark? I did. I thought, as I said before, it's important to understand the business terms that are outlined in the agreement. So it's appropriate, is it appropriate for a forensic accountant to review a contract that is in dispute in rendering a conclusion? I think you need to understand what it says in the contract, at least from a business point of view, in order to be able to uh, uh, do any work on it. 
And was this 690,000 unit benchmark in the 2014 agreement tied to any particular product? Yes. I'm going to object to him testifying to what the, the um, contract says, and uh, if there's going to be more questioning on this, I'd like to avoid you the witness on his qualifications to testify about the meaning of the contract. Um, hang on. Objections overruled. Clarify that this is not an opinion as to the contract. He's doing the calculation, correct? Um, Mr. Bachner, I'm not asking you to render an opinion as to what the contract um, says or doesn't say. Is this just part of your analysis in determining sufficient data to render a, a, to analyze what data was important for your calculation? Yes, I'm not looking at the legality of the agreement or the legal interpretation. I'm just looking at the business terms to be able to apply them. So, um, could you please put up plaintiff's exhibit one? And that second whereas, the second whereas clause. I'm sorry, the third whereas clause. Mr. Bachner, is this what you're referring to um, when you mentioned that you looked at some language in the 2014 Um as to what product should be looked at for the 690,000 unit benchmark? Yes, it was. And can we pull up page 20 of this agreement, please? And the additional, the bullet point three, is this the 690,000 unit benchmark that you were asked to, to look at and to render a, a calculation on? Yes, it specifically refers to co-branded product. So looking at that in the first paragraph that you had put up, um, I thought that those two were important business terms. Your Honor, I object to move to strike. Is it, uh, is... All right, um, sustained. All right, disregard any opinion as to importance or non-importance. Um, these are assumptions made for a calculation, correct? Are these assumptions made for a calculation? Yes, they are. So, Mr. Bachner, what price did you consider in reviewing whether Celsius, Celsius reached the 690,000 unit benchmark? I would have looked at the 40 count tubs and I would have looked at the 14 count uh, boxes as well. And would these be the 14 count boxes of sticks also after September 1st, 2014? Yes, for the same reasons. Um, did plaintiff's expert consider 14 count boxes before September 1st, 2014 in her calculations regarding this unit benchmark? Yes, she did. Um, do you know what flavors, what flow fusion products came in? Uh, the flow fusion products were uh, the orange and the berry. <coughs> Did Celsius sell other flavors? Did, it, did there come a time when Celsius sold the 14 count boxes? Flavors? Yes, uh, later on in 2018, they also came in coconut, they came in dragon, flu, fr dragon fruit lime, kiwi guava lime, uh, I think there's a, a fourth one as well. And did plaintiff's expert include those non flow fusion flavors in her calculation of the 690,000 units? Yes, they were part of that calculation. Your Honor, we didn't go into this with Ms. Borg because they moved in limited to exclude, exclude this, and now they're asking questions about it. Uh, come on. <laughs>
the world, uh, you can go ahead and answer that if you remember what the question is. So. Uh, could you repeat that, please? Uh, did plaintiff's expert include those other non-flow fusion Celsius flavors in her calculation of the 690,000 units? Yes, for that calculation she did. In considering the sales of 14 count boxes of powdered sticks as of September 1st, 2014, what specifically did you treat in your calculations as a unit? It would have been one tub was one unit and one box of the 14 sticks was one unit. In your review of the Celsius' sales data that was provided to you, did you ever find an instance where Celsius reported a sale of an individual stick to one of its wholesale customers or distributors or retailers? No, I did not. Um, all right, so we're trying to help the jury understand what was contemplated by this 690,000 unit benchmark. Um, in terms of the spreadsheets that you reviewed, uh, did you look at spreadsheets that contained sales through um, through 2018? Yes, I did. And did those spreadsheets contain the prices at which the Celsius, different Celsius products were sold? Yes, you would see uh, the number of uh, cases that were sold, as well as the pricing for each of those. And did that include the prices at which the 40 count, these 40 count tubs were sold? Yes, for each, each transaction. And would they include pricing at what a, a case of 12 of these low fusion 40 count boxes were sold? Uh, yes. Did they ever, those spreadsheets ever show uh, sales of individual sticks? No, they did not. So from these spreadsheets, and let me just uh, remind you, were these same spreadsheets relied upon by Ms. Gore in her calculations? I believe we both relied on the same information, yes. Uh, were you able to determine um, the most common wholesale price for example, for the 40 count tubs from the data that was included. Yes, was yes I was. The overwhelming uh, majority of those tubs were sold at a price of $20.25 for each tub. And how did you come up with that price of $20.25? Well, in the case of GNC, one of their larger companies that they were distributing through, it was specifically $20.25 for each individual tub that was sold. In the case of the others that were purchased in um, boxes of six, uh, if you divide the case amount by six, you would get to the same $20.25. Um, and how did you come up with that first part of this chart? And I'll represent to the point that I have shown plaintiff's counsel this chart. Here's the first part, please. So if Celsius sold 690,000 units of these flow fusion 40 pound tubs at this price you provided, it was $20.25 per tub, what would be the amount that Celsius would have generated in gross revenue? Uh, simply multiplying the $20.25 by the 690,000 units, you get just under $14 million, 13972500 million. And from the data that you were provided, were you able to um, come up with a, the price range, either the average price or the most common, the common price in the sales data for what the boxes, the 14 count boxes, were being sold to wholesalers, distributors, and retailers at? Yes, all that information is uh, uh, included in those spreadsheets, and the, the large majority were at uh, $20.25. The overall average may have been slightly higher. Okay, so that $20.25 you specified went for the tubs. Correct. You, and my question is, with respect to the 14 count boxes, were you able from the sales data to um, 
to conclude what the most common price or the average price of the boxes were. I'm sorry, um, I misunderstood. Um, yes, um, I looked specifically at the 2014 to 2016 period, and once again, uh, the most common price was actually $129. Um, for a 12 count case. So if you divide one into the other, it's a little over $10, and I round it down for purposes of this chart to $10. Okay, so when you say 12 count case, are you referring to 12 boxes in a case, um, in a single case, but 12, 12 of these 14 count boxes in one case? That's correct. And so the, the most common price you said, or the average price was around $10 a box? Yeah, in that period of time, um, it was actually uh, a little over $10, but for purposes of this chart, I just rounded it to $10. Okay. And can we put up a second graph? Um, Mr. Dockner, if Celsius sold 690,000 units of the Flow Fusion 14 count boxes, approximately what would Celsius have generated in revenue? At that $10 per box price, it would be $6.9 million. And now, you already testified that Celsius doesn't have in its system a you know, recorded sales of individuals. <coughs> but were you able to approximate, approximate what an individual stick, you know, would cost from extrapolating the data from the 14 count boxes? Sure. If you simply divide Ten dollars by fourteen sticks, you get seventy-one point four two cents so per stick. The third part. So, if the wholesale revenue per each individual stick is under seventy-two cents, point seven one forty-two uh, per individual stick, <coughs> um, can you tell us what the sale of six hundred and ninety thousand units would have generated in revenue for Celsius? Sure, as reflected in that little yellow bar, it would be $492,857. So under half a million dollars. Correct. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Bachner, by your calculations, approximately when did Celsius sell or reach the 690,000 units of Your Honor, that calls for a legal conclusion. I think she can restate it. Um, if she's asking how many boxes yeah. were sold. I understand that. Um, objection sustained, I reverse. Right. Mr. Bachner, if you're including the sales of the 40 count low fusion tubs and 14 count boxes, which I believe you said you started calculating from September 1st, 2014, um, at what point in time would that six did you find that 690,000 units, with those assumptions of the tub and the 14 count box being the unit, did you find that would have been met? Not until March of 2020, which was approximately six years after the contract, the 2014 agreement was signed, and approximately four years after the stated termination date in the agreement. Ms. Bauer testified yesterday that if she is including tubs and 14 count boxes, that benchmark would have included, would have been reached in September of 2019. So can you explain how you got to March 2020 when she got to September 2019? Sure. Uh, primarily because of two reasons. Uh, I had excluded the pre-September 1st, 2014 sales, and I also excluded those additional flavors that uh, we had spoke of previously, That other, the ones other than the orange and the berry that had the Flow Fusion branding. They would have been in uh, Ms. Bohr's numbers. And did you also exclude sales of seven count boxes? Yes, I did. Um, moving on now to the 2016 agreement royalty calculations. What products did you consider in reviewing the amount of royalties earned under the 2016 agreement? I looked at the orange ready to drink sparkling cans and I looked at the orange and the berry powdered products. And by cans, do you mean the cases of those ready to drink cans? That's correct, yes. Um, and until what date did you include the sales of the ready to drink sparkling orange in your calculations? 
I would have looked at it over the period um, from October, um, excuse me, April 11th of 2016 through October 11th of 2018. And what is your conclusion with respect to whether royalties, well, let me move this. In, in adding, in adding the royalties from the cases of Ready to Drink Sparkling Orange and the boxes of 14 pound powder sticks, do you recall what your total was in terms of royalties earned under the 2016 agreement? It was approximately 385000 And this is a silly question, but is this below $500,000? Yes, it was below the advance that uh, was paid out initially. I have no further questions. Cross-examination? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. You don't have any uh, issue with Ms. Boer's math, correct? The, the expert that testified that for the numbers, uh, you've seen her reports and you don't have any problems with that math, correct? Not with the math, just what was included and not included. Right, but that's, you have to interpret the contract if you have a problem with that, right? That's true. And that's not your job, you're an accountant, you're not even allowed to do that in the courtroom. Um, I'm not sure I agree with that. I think that there are business terms and there are legal interpretations. I believe that some of the uh, interpretation would be relevant to what I've done. But you don't speak English better than, than, than the jurors, right? They can read English just as well as you, right? Yes. And you've never been in the beverage industry, right? I've not been in the beverage industry. Never done any endorsement deals? No, I haven't. Your Honor, you don't have any knowledge. Objection, just based on relevance, considering that okay, the um, services were for right, sales. Up, up, objection, yeah. objection, relevance, sustained. Okay, so you don't have any problems with her math? I didn't see any math errors, no. Right. Well, she got paid $70,000, so that's, um, that's good to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, you got paid uh, a little more than that as of October of last year, right? That's correct. And you've been uh, busy this week. Uh, yes, I, I've been here this week. Because you were asked a very precise question, which was that you were billed, you billed about $75,000, but you got more bills coming. Uh, just for the last couple of days, yes. Right, but you've spent a lot of time in the last couple of days. Sitting outside. No, it's not that. You've done additional work. Uh, there was some additional work listening to Ms. Bohr yesterday and, uh, yeah. Right, so you did additional work and testified about it today. Yes, sir. I can't check that math. I just, I just saw. Right? Objection, Your Honor. Sustained. You know that that the, the work you did was just yesterday. I'm, I'm sure. What, what are you, what are you referring to specifically? Your Honor, can we go sidebar? Um, no, you have an objection. Sustained. All right, rephrase. You, you've done additional work. Very. Is that fair? Yes. And you think you probably billed more than five thousand dollars? I would expect it would be somewhere in that vicinity. You wrote a chapter in a book, right? House Profit Damages. I did. And this book is reliable and authoritative, right? Uh, I don't know if it's authoritative, but it's certainly something that's been put together by a number of practitioners. Including you. Your Honor, objection, relevance, lost profits are not issue. All right. Um, let me see the parties on this. Yeah.
All right, you may uh, proceed. <coughs> How much did these tubs, flow fusion tubs, sell for at retail? Uh, MSRP. I don't have the retail price off the top of my head. Does forty nine ninety nine ring a bell? Uh, I'm not sure, sir. Okay, is it something you can check? Uh, I don't know if I have that information because it wasn't specifically identified in the information that I reviewed. What are the boxes? I don't. I don't know. The, the, the additional work you did, wasn't it calculating the cost of uh, the revenue to Celsius per price on each of these? To the wholesalers, not to the, not at retail. Okay. Um, $14.99 doesn't ring a bell? I'm not sure. You don't know of any product, Flow Fusion or otherwise, that was sold between $19.99 and $39.99 per unit, correct? I don't have the retail prices. Right, but seventy-five thousand dollars. I'm just asking if you recall seeing any product that was sold between nineteen ninety-nine to thirty-nine ninety-nine at retail. That was not part of the analysis that I had done. The um, you, you said you excluded seven count boxes um, from your calculations, right? That's correct. And they they don't look like this. They're smaller. But in addition, there's a different product in there, isn't there? There is a different product in there? Right, different than Flow Fusion. Uh, that's my understanding. Right, it was all natural, I think it was called. Uh, I'm not sure. All right, but you know it from the data, it's the seven count. That's correct. Seven count states. And uh, you do know from your review of all these documents that the formula inside those was different than the modified new formula that was in Flow Fusion. Um, I don't know that one way or the other. Okay, and so you excluded those different products, right? Correct. But you also excluded sticks that had the exact same formula inside, the same modified product that was produced after 2014 when this was sold. Because they were not co-branded as Flow Fusion. So you determined what's co-branded? I don't think I determined it. It's an assumption. It's an assumption uh, that is represented by the difference in the labeling on the box as being sold as Flow Fusion. There's two possibilities. It's an assumption or it's a conclusion. If it's a conclusion, you went to the contract, you looked at it, and you made an interpretation about whether the same exact formula, the same product in two different boxes, is co-branded or not. That's a conclusion. Or you assumed it because you Your were asked. Your objection is this closing argument or a question? The question is, is it an assumption or a conclusion? Uh, if given those two choices, I would go with an assumption than a conclusion. The seventy-five thousand you charge is not because you charge like ten thousand an hour. You had to do a lot of work on this case, right? There was a lot of data to be able to analyze and um, go through. Yes. Right. There was no report that said here's the sales for Flow Fusion, for example. That's correct. In fact, you had to do a lot of work. You said you took out this data, and then you didn't take out this data, and you did dates, and uh, you estimated the date when the old packaging was used up. And you had to do all that because Celsius never had any data specifically related to flow fusion, correct? It was not identified as such, that's correct. Right, on all that data, there's no such product called flow fusion. Is that a question? Yes, sir. Um, I did not see anything specifically identified as flow fusion in the spreadsheets. That's why I needed to look beyond the spreadsheets in order to be able to uh, draw any conclusions. Right, and so because of that, you do know there, in real life, there is such a product as flow fusion, right? Well, there's certainly boxes that are labeled as such. Um, you talked about something called the use up period. In other words, the, the contract started in March 2014, it had an initial term of two years. 
But in that 2014 contract, it already specifically said that Celsius had the right to keep selling low fusion, keep selling powder product, keep selling co-branded product for two additional months. Two months, correct. So you had the new work you did, you had the chart, you talked about the sales of boxes and you gave us a wholesale price for the boxes. Correct. But Celsius never sold a box ever once to a retailer, right? They didn't sell it like this. As I said, it was $129 a case, which I divided by 12 to get to a little over $10. Right. So they didn't sell it like this or this. Doesn't help us determine... Now I'm, now I'm asking a question that calls for a legal conclusion. I apologize. But an issue in the case is what is a unit? They didn't sell it this way or this way, right? Uh, they sold it by the case. A case of boxes? Yes. And you've never seen any product in any form, 1999 to 3999, in the data you have? Um, I only had the wholesale price information, not the retail. All right, now, I think this might have been just a misstatement, um, but you were asked a question that you said yes to, that there was the, the flow fusion sales during the 2014 contract term. Okay, so March 2014, for two years, you said it never, well, you were asked, did it ever reach a million dollars in sales? And you said no. But it, it's asked precisely that way. Did it ever reach Flow Fusion a million dollars in sales in the first two years of the contract? The answer is yes. Um, I was speaking to a trailing 12 month period as identified in Exhibit B of the agreement, not the totality of all revenues. So if I um, gave some misinformation, uh, that wasn't intentional. I'm sure it wasn't, but I just want to make absolutely clear about that. The answer to whether there was a million dollars in sales in the first two years is yes. Uh, there was, but not in the trailing 12 month period. Yes? Yes. Okay, thank you. If there are sales missing from the data you were given, then obviously it's not in your uh, what you testified to, right? Uh, that would be true. You saw data for uh, something that was labeled 14 count packs. I believe so. And, and so we can assume, because these come in 14 count, that that's a 14 count pack, right? Yes. Was there ever any data that you reviewed for a 15, sorry, 50 count box? I don't recall sitting here right now that there were, but I, without going back and looking at those uh, voluminous spreadsheets. The jury's going to have some of that, but uh, it's tough for me when you answer that way. As for, after $75,000, you never saw, or at least you don't recall, ever seen anywhere in that data the 50 count boxes. I don't recall that. You do know there were errors in the data. Um, I saw certain omissions or due dates that would say, you know, with, with an error in it, but I don't know to what extent uh, there were other errors. Well, there was a kind of big error that you saw. Was an error about the tubs that were misrepresented? Well, there was a tab where there was, uh, I'll, I will call it a lookup, information where the tubs were identified with a 12 next to it so everything on the sales data in one specific column was multiplying the number of cases by 12 rather than six as they were sold and 
I corrected for that in in my analysis. Right. In other words, the data showed double the sales that were actually made for in one small area. Yes, there was uh, that by changing that one number on one cell on one sheet, it got multiplied anywhere where there was a case of tubs and multiplied it by 12 rather than by 6. So if anyone went into the data and said, how many tubs did we sell, data's kind of worthless. It's off by, it's 100% off. It's, it's, it's half of what it should have been. It needed to be corrected, yes. Uh, now that correction certainly helped reduce the amount of sales. It was limited to the tubs, so it was relatively small compared to um, the 14 count boxes, but yes, it did overstate it. But I know you're saying it was relatively small, but it was a correction you made that went, made the sales go down. Because there were only six tubs to a case, not 12. Right, I just, but I just, just for absolute clarity, what you did was you took made a correction that reduced the amount of sales. I think it made it more accurate, but yes, it was a reduction. I'm not disagreeing. It did make it more accurate, but it went down. It right? did go down. And there were no corrections you made to the data that made it go up. If I had seen that, I would have done so. Absolutely. I'm not suggesting otherwise. But you never saw the 50 count boxes, correct? Not that I recall. Thank you. All right, in the uh, river. Mr. Bachner, you were asked about um, additional work that you did. Uh, was some of the additional work with respect to revised calculations that you received from Lane's forensic accountant a few days ago? Yes, there were some new charts that were produced. And with respect to uh, you not having a recollection as to the real retail prices, does retail price matter for your calculations? Uh, they don't specifically impact any of the calculations now. And why is that? Because uh, the revenue benchmark is based on wholesale. Uh, the unit benchmark doesn't really matter what the pricing is at all. And the royalties had nothing to do with uh, retail price. And a retail price is not what Celsius sells the product at, correct? Sure. So if they sell to GNC, GNC may sell something for forty-four ninety-five, dollars um, or at, a, at another price, but that really has no impact on, on Celsius directly. You were also asking questions about seven-count boxes being different. Um, but I just want to... But you did see the inclusion of these different seven count boxes in this forest population. Is that right? For the million dollar uh, benchmark, yes. And uh, with respect to extrapolating the data from all these spreadsheets, is that also how Plaintiff's accountant came up with her schedule? Yes, we both relied on the same information. And didn't Ms. Bauer also make that correction in her calculations with respect to? the six tubs of low fusion per case? Yes, um, I believe that it, I was asked about that in my deposition and she made those changes afterwards. Um, and with respect to how the data is identified in, in all those spreadsheets you received, um, how do you think that data is going to be used in future? Were the flow fusion 40 count tubs specifically identified in that data? Were the flow fusion, yes, they were. And with respect to Celsius selling a case of the 12 boxes of 14 count six, um, did the data reflect how many boxes were in a case? There was that lookup that identified that there would be 12 in a case uh, for the boxes. But did the data, and did the data ever reflect how many sticks were in a case? Not in a case, um, other than identifying it as a 14 count box. So there was no specific line item for these are how many sticks we're selling, only how many boxes we're selling. Is that right? That's right. I have no further questions. Thank you. Right, any uh, recross in those loaded areas? Mm -hmm.
didn't. That's not. The data doesn't have a line for how many boxes it was sold. It has a line for uh, the case with many boxes in it. I think twelve. Correct. Right, but there was also a column using that lookup that we talked about before, where it would multiply it out by the lookup that got brought into another column. And that column was entitled 14 count X. Correct? No, that's not the column that I'm referring to. What I'm talking about is if there were 10 cases and there were 12 boxes in a case, it would take the 10 cases, it would look it up because of the 14 count box and 14 count boxes have 12 uh, boxes to a case and it would multiply the 10 by 12 and it would show 120. Okay, but so if anyone got the impression that the data was the amount of boxes directly, that would be incorrect. Uh, well, it was on there. I mean, it identified the cases, and then it updated a separate column by using that lookup amount. In the same way that you can take 14 count and multiply by 14, you can multiply by 12 boxes in a case, right? Um, you can, sure, you can do anything. And the, the unit of sale was 12 boxes. It was 12 boxes at a time. No retailer ever bought one box, right? Um... I I don't know that one way or the other, but not that I'm aware of. Okay. But in the data that you looked at, it's always 12 boxes. That's my understanding, yes. Okay. All right, so I, I thank you, Council. I, there was something that I was unclear about. Uh, I didn't explain why I was asking uh, if there was any product sold at retail between 1999 and 39.95. Uh, I wasn't suggesting that that was the wholesale price. It had nothing, nothing to do with wholesale. I'm just saying that you never saw any product that was sold through channels of distribution at retail for this price, 1995 to 3995. It's just not in the data. It was not in any of the spreadsheets that I looked at because there were no retail prices at all in that data. You just said you had to spend all this time looking at all these things and how you caught mistakes by looking at emails. And you didn't look at the product sheet that had wholesale and MSRP? I didn't see it to be relevant to what I was doing. You just testified about the wholesale price. Uh, objection asked and answered. Um, that's okay, the, hang on. That's the answer overall. You can ask. Um, I think we're, I'm getting confused because I testified to all of the wholesale pricing that I looked at. You're asking me about the retail pricing, and I didn't do any analysis of retail because that information wasn't available to me. But you know that there were some documents which you looked at that had wholesale and MSRP on them. Not that I am aware of. I don't think I had identified any documents that had retail pricing. What? what where, how did you determine what documents to look at? Were they provided by council? It was the information that Ms. Bohr looked at, so I looked at that same information and I supplemented it with things like the emails that I described that talked about production dates. Okay, and so if there was MSRP pricing in the data that Ms. Bohr looked at, you would see um, I, I don't know that I saw every document that she looked at, but um, I didn't, I'm telling you, I didn't see any retail information. Thank you. All right, members of the jury, any questions for the witness? Okay.
Okay. These are questions from the jury. So answer to the jury. First question: Do you know how the spreadsheets were generated? Were they prepared manually or exported from other software? Um, I don't know specifically, but as best I can tell, it looked like there was certain information that was exported into those spreadsheets, and then once that information was there, there was further analysis of the data. So I would see summary information in those spreadsheets. I would see things like what we talked about before, about the lookup table that populated certain information, but most of the raw data would have been started with an export. Do you believe that the spreadsheets are accurate representations of the sales report slash financial data? Um, my understanding is, is that the raw information that was exported was accurate and the mistake that I caught was in a subsequent lookup um, that was misapplied. Um, but I have not done any kind of forensic audit of all of that data, um, but uh, it came from the company systems. All right, any follow-up, um, Cynthia? Oh, yeah. Um, so you still? Yes, sir. So it, it came from the company systems, and you're assuming that it's accurate. That's really an assumption you need. Is to go back to that. Yeah, like I said, I have not done an audit of all of that information, and I am assuming the accuracy of it. Thank you, sir. All right, any follow up on that? No, Your Honor. Any additional questions from the jury? All right, um, we're going to go ahead and uh, take a little bit early lunch then. Uh, um, your lunches are back there, and so we'll see you back here in an hour. All right, uh, have a great lunch, and. Uh,
Be seated. Uh, back on the record, case uh, CAC 21-8997, Strong Arm Productions USA, Atal versus Celsius Holdings, Inc. Can I um, let the record reflect the attorneys are present, parties are present. Anything to take up before we bring the jurors in? One little thing, guys. Um, um, can we do it while we're bringing the jurors? Um, actually, no. I just want to make sure that okay. we have, uh, I've had discussions with Mr. Houston, we have a stipulation with regard to the question of Mr. Feely with respect to pending actions against Celsius. And I just want to confirm that that stipulation is still in place. Uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not going to ask about the, that pending civil action in any way. Or any related action related to that civil action. Oh, I didn't know there were criminal ones. There's no criminal ones. Oh, okay. I'm not asking about any actions. How about that? That's easy. <laughs> that makes it easy. Thank you, Judge. That's all right. I'll grab it. I will get the jury. Um, how close are you on the uh, instructions on verdict form? So we, uh, the reason why Ms. Pearson and Mr. Delavada aren't here is we just got a bunch of new ones and okay. they're reviewing them. We're trying to get it done so that we can okay. talk to you when this witness is Yeah, so when we're done here, um, again, I'm not going to hold you to it, but uh, any rebuttal? And uh, I, I, I almost definitely know. Okay. As of this far, no. Okay. So we're definitely finished up with all the uh, testimony and, uh, and evidence and then we'll you know, fix up all the instructions. We'll come on uh, Monday for closing. I'm sorry, Tuesday for closing arguments. We're uh, closed on Monday. This is this is our last witness, Judge. Okay. So we're in good shape. Uh, depending on how far apart you are on uh, instructions in the verdict form. Mm Yeah, well, um, we don't have our own jury. Room, so there's six courtrooms and only five jury rooms. We all have to share. That's that's why they did that to save. We don't have our own bathrooms either in that chamber, so we all have to share. That, that was the sore spot for a lot of the judges too. <laughs> John Fieldley. Yes. And this is the first and last for the John Fieldley. J O H N F I E L D L Y. You may inquire. Thank you. Good afternoon, John. Good afternoon. Um, John, what do you do for a living? Uh, currently, I'm the CEO, President, and Chairman of Celsius Holdings. How long have you held that position? Um, since Jerry retired back in um, uh, mid July, uh, mid year of 2017. Who's Jerry? He was the prior CEO. No, what's his name? Uh, Jerry David. Um, tell me, uh, tell the jurors a little bit about yourself. Uh, where are you from? Where were you born? Yep. Yeah. Originally from upstate New York, Newburgh. Um, I grew up in the state of Florida, over in by Tampa. Um, I. Uh, I'm a CPA. Uh, worked at Eckerd Drugs for over eight years in retail, and uh, I worked for B2B Publishing um, and business journals. And um, I started. I worked at a short time at a biotech company, where I learned about public filings. Uh, really wanted to work with a public company at that time, and I had an opportunity to come to Celsius, which Jerry brought asked me to become his CFO, to be his right hand. 
to help turn around uh, this kind of failing company at the time, uh, which was Celsius. I'm going to ask you one thing, just for the sake of our great core reporter, just slow, Sorry. so she can take you down. Um, Celsius was a major company in the United States in 2012. Um, they had some, uh, a small amount of retail distribution, mainly at Costco, Vitamin Shop. Um, and uh, after I started, um, actually, unfortunately, within about three months, um, we got delisted out of a few retailers in, in, the, in, in the country, which was Costco represented about 45% about of our revenue at the time. Um, so it's, it's been challenging, and but I knew that going in because Jerry mentioned that this was a turnaround uh, opportunity um, that we were going to be working on together. And you came in in, in what position in 2012? I came in um, in 2012 as the CFO of the company. Okay. Now, we talked a lot about the company, but we haven't really talked about the company. So I want you to go back to 2012 and tell me... Uh, what kind of business was Celsius in at the time, 2012? What was it doing? What was it selling? Um, at the time, the company was in the dietary supplement space. Um, it sold a negative calorie beverage that was backed by science. Um, going mainly sales, as I, when I joined, was coming from Costco and Vitamin Shop was the two largest retailers at the time. Um, and they also had um, not only cans uh, ready to drink, but they also had powder product as well uh, in the form of a stick at, the, at that time. Did, did they also offer a, a tub of powder at that time? That was, a, one, of, that was one of the initiatives when we started. Um, when I started it, the, the, we had a single serve uh, uh, ready to drink products, the liquid cans that you see in the courtroom here. Uh, also had 14 count boxes of sticks um, that, that the company sold. And um, when Jerry joined, we created a, um, I believe it was a 30 uh, serving tub um, at the time. And Jerry's background was in the home shopping network. He spent some time at Home Shopping Channel. Um, so one of the strategies was to create a multi-serving tub that we could take to HSN. Um, so that was an initiative that we worked on and we ran some in addition to trying to sell that in, we also ran some DRTV ads um, that Jerry handled in his background as well, and we worked on in the prior company. So we, we sold some of those, uh, our, the, the tub servings, and did some videos and things like that. Judge Mayor Cook? Yes. Now, I'm going to show you what's already been admitted to evidence as Exhibit 384, I believe, this is Defense Exhibit 384. Could you describe to the jury what that item is? Yeah, so this is a, a very similar formula to the liquid product. It's just basically a liquid product without the liquid um, in the form of powder. And this came in a, I uh, believe it is a 30 serving tub. Uh, so yeah, 30 servings, 30 serving tub um, that we had there. And it's uh, our outrageous orange flavor. We called it outrageous because it didn't have any bubbles in it. So. And this was only branded under the Celsius brand name, right? That's correct. And this was something that existed before 2014 that Celsius offered to to its retailers and its distributors, right? That's correct. 2012, uh, if I recall. Okay. So, um, so, you mentioned something. Was, was, was Celsius a publicly traded company at the time you joined? Yes, it was. Okay. Did, did those circumstances change after you joined Celsius? No, it's that it continue being a publicly traded company? Since I've been at Celsius, it's always been a publicly traded company. Now, has it been, has Celsius been listed in different exchanges or been designated as a publicly traded company in different categories since you started at Celsius in 2012? 
Yes, that is correct. Can you tell the jury, can you just briefly describe to the jury what different categories was Celsius at and when? Yeah. Um, so just when I started the, with the company, please keep in mind this is a turnaround. Okay. Um, keep that in mind. So the company was originally on NASDAQ when I started, well, prior to me starting. It was in 2010, 2011. Um, keep in mind this is the, a world's negative calorie drink. It's going to disrupt the beverage category at the time. That's what the founders wanted to really do with Celsius. Um, had big ambitions for Celsius. They were able to raise capital um, through the public markets. I think it was around $17 million on that thesis that they were going to disrupt the beverage category with a negative calorie beverage. Um, you know, unfortunately, sometimes business relationships and business strategies, partnerships don't work out. Um, and they wound up um, getting delisted. Out of, as I mentioned, you know, when I arrived, they were starting to get delisted. They wound up spending a lot of money. They spent the money. They, they had a lot of distribution out there in the country, and it just the product just did not work. Um, so therefore, it got delisted out of a variety of stores, and it also got delisted off of NASDAQ. And it was on the what they call the OTC pink sheets. Um, which is kind of like the lowest tier within the public uh, public company status. So keep in mind, public companies have really different tiers. Um, you can be on what they call the pink sheets, um, that, and that's where Celsius was when I arrived. Um, and, and, did, and did that change after you arrived? After you got listed, you listed to the pink sheets. It did, and that was one of the reasons. Um, Carl DeSantis was one of the main investors, and he invested in Celsius when it originally uplisted to NASDAQ. And his main thesis and his main strategy was to make all the investors whole that invested in the company. So one initiative or KPI or you know, goal that I was really told to deliver on is to get the company listed back on NASDAQ. And that was really important to Carl. And the reason why, uh, another reason why he brought me on and I, I took the job is uh, I told him I would deliver on that. So wait, you said something you said some initials there, KPI, just so everybody understands. Uh, sorry, KPI? Uh, key performance uh, you know, indicator. It's uh, uh, like kind of like your bonus goal, uh, a goal that you have to achieve to, that, that's required for you to achieve to keep your job. So now, did your KPI change? Did it get better over time after 2012? It did. Um, we, we went from what they call the OTC pink sheets, um, non-disclosed. So uh, not sure how many are familiar with the stock uh, publicly traded companies, but on the OTC markets, there's a classification where you're at the bottom of the OTC, and a lot of, when you type in the ticker symbol, a stop sign will come up, just warning you that the, the company is uh, like a penny stock, per se. There's a lot of risk associated with, with that company. And we graduated through the years to OTC fully disclosed. We moved up to an exchange, which is a mid-tier exchange, from the OTC pink sheets to the OTC QX. And then in, uh, I think it was like July of two, or August, uh, July of 2017, we were able, due to the revenue numbers and the, uh, uh, the, the financials performance of the company on our, on our, uh, our rev I think it was revenues we met and the stock price value being over $4, we qualified for NASDAQ. And at that point in time, um, we filed the proper paperwork to uplist, they call that, to the NASDAQ exchange where we're tra currently traded now under CELH. And I want to go back to, again, I'm focusing on the time between 2012 and 2014. Um, I want you to tell the jurors what, what flavors of, for example, the powdered product did Celsius offer to its retailers and distributors? Uh, the, the powder, I think, I believe when I started, we had wild berry originally as one of the flavors. Um, and then uh, we had the orange powder canister that you showed. And we also had uh, the orange powder sticks um, uh, in the 14 count box that we sold. Okay. Sure. May I approach? Yes. I believe this is part of a composite exhibit. Does anybody know the number? I think it's plaintiff's exhibit 275. Excuse me, Judge. 275. 
Yes, I think it's, no, it's, is it 275 or 75? 275. This is part of it, Composite Exhibit 275, Ron. And I was just wondering if you could um, identify for the jury exactly what those boxes are. Yes. The first box that you see is the 14 count box of outrageous orange. And it looks really very familiar to the 30 serving tub that um, was just presented a few minutes ago. Same packaging, it's just in the, in the tub format. We, we moved from uh, this packaging, because you're constantly evolving the brand as you go, trying to learn what works with consumers. How do you make the brand sell more attractive to consumers? Um, internally, we call this the PowerPoint presentation. Um, to consumers, and we've started to move into a more, more of a cleaner package uh, that we were working on. Um, and this is the Berry Blast flavoring package. And these were boxes that were sold by Celsius prior to 2014. That is correct. And again, these are boxes that you would. These are singularly branded boxes under the Celsius brand. Correct. correct. These are 14 count sticks in here. 14 count sticks. Now, as part of your job as CFO, did you keep track of the, the sale of products? Or, let me take back. As part of CFO, did you keep track of products for purposes of inventory and sales? Yes. And how did you, as CFO, keep track of product for inventory and sales? Uh, we track all of our inventory by SKU. Please tell the jury what an SKU is. It's a stock count unit. That's the way manufacturers and wholesalers track their sellable goods. So if the manufacturer and the retailer want to talk to each other in the same language, at least with regard to identifying a product, they use the SKU, correct? That's standard in the industry, correct. What's a UPC? Uh, it's a universal, um, it, it's, a, it's a, a barcode that's on a, a variety of different items, including, you know, uh, at retail. A lot of times retailers will track items by the UPC. Does Celsius track its products by UPC by the UPC code? No. Why not? We don't sell by UPC code. We sell by SKU. So is that because Celsius doesn't sell directly to the consumer? <coughs> oh, that's correct. Well, who does Celsius sell to? Give examples. Yeah, we sell to uh, wholesalers. Um, a big one's McLean. Maybe you see. KD trucks out there. We also sell direct to, at the time, we also sell direct to Costco, direct to Publix, um, a variety of retailers at the time. Now, an issue in this case is has been the, what does a unit? Mm -hmm. You're familiar with that, right? Oh, yes. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and show you two things here. One is the it's already in evidence in 275, which is the Flow Fusion 14 box count sticks. And I'm also going to show you the individual Flow Fusion Berry stick. Do both of those items contain UPC codes? Yes. Does Celsius have an SKU for the box? Yes. The Flow Fusion box? Yes, we do. Does Celsius have an SKU for the stick? No. And why is that? We do not sell that stick. So Celsius does not sell sticks to its retailers or its distributors, individually? That's correct. So there's no need to have an SKU for a stick because it doesn't sell it to the retailer or to the distributor, right? Right. And what does, and how does Celsius characterize a unit in its records, is a unit this box or is a unit this stick? We keep track of all of our bombs, which is bill of materials, how we create the finished goods, uh, which is a 14 count box. You'll, you can see that it, it's included, you know, use 14 wrappers, 
uh, you use the, the percentage of the powder for 14 items, and then you have the box. So we, we track everything you know, at, the SK, at the SKU level, and that's what we sell in. And the SKU level, the SKU level is at the box level, right? Correct. Right. And you have a separate SKU for the tub of Celsius Flow Fusion, or had it? We had it. Okay. So SKU, you sold, this was treated as a unit by Celsius? Correct. Just like the box? Correct. And this is what was sold to the retailers and to the dis distributors in, in what, in cases? Master cases. Right. And how many of these were in the cases, in the, uh, the tub, the 40 serving tub? Six. And if you had six of them, how did Celsius record the unit? Did it, did it record it as a case, one, or did it record it as six units? Six units. Does Celsius record sales of individual sticks as units? No. And that wouldn't make sense because you don't sell individual sticks to retailers and distributors, right? Correct. And why bother putting UPC codes on the sticks? It's customary in the industry that you put a UPC on all items, including in packages. Was Celsius aware of the fact that its retailers would open these boxes so consumers could buy individual sticks? We had a, we, in the, several like gym locations, I believe they did sell them singly uh, as sticks. All right. And the and, UPC allows for that. Okay. So, so that was the way, and, and, and is that the way how retailers would monitor how many sticks that it sold so it can keep track of its inventory? Yes, I, I really don't believe there's many retailers that sold any single servings of Celsius. It, a few gyms on a few campaigns, that I believe, very limited. And let's go back again. I'm focusing on, and I know that I, saw, I showed you Flow Fusion sticks and boxes and the tub. And these were items that weren't created by Celsius until after 2014, right? Correct. Okay. But at least with respect to the sale of Celsius pre-flow fusion products, where was Celsius selling, let me take it back, was Celsius selling, for example, any of these items in 7-Eleven prior to 2014? No. So that came later. <coughs> I don't believe he's ever sold any powder products in 7-Eleven. What did you sell in 7-Eleven? The ready-to-drink product. Okay. Now, prior to 2014, had Celsius ever co-branded any of its products? No, not that I'm aware of. Um, what is your understanding of a co-branded product? A co-branded product is when two trademarks on two separate entities come together and kind of unite to create one product. So therefore, it's two IPs or two intellectual property rights that are come together to leverage each other's intellectual property and jointly create one product on shelf. And does that require, for example, for the company or the manufacturer to modify its product? It does. And that modification, for example, does it, it could be the outside of the label in the packaging, right? That's correct. And that's what we did in, with the case with Flow Fusion. So, so, so you change the product labeling from this, the Celsius solely branded packaging to the Flow Fusion branded packaging, right? Yeah, that's correct. And just a, I think a comment on that in regards to the boxes, because I know there's a lot of discussion on as a unit of stick. Um, you know, the company, you know, 
really moved from um, the existing product, which was sold at retail, into the Flow Fusion product and the 14 count, the co-branded product, to really to allow more distribution to happen at a quicker pace. So I think you know. I'm not sure how many how many people know, but it's extremely difficult to sell new product into retailers. They have what's called resets, and retailers reset their shelves like once a year. Um, and that selling cycle can take about 18 months. So what the company did strategically is we moved from our existing 14 count box into the Flow Fusion box to allow for greater distribution and opportunities for the Flow Fusion brand a co-branded product that we were really excited about at the time of launching. So that gave it really immediate distribution once we sold through the existing inventory of what we had into uh, Vitamin Shop. I think it went into Ralph's, or like we were in Vitamin Shop and Ralph's. So, and, and Ralph's is in California, so that's a really great presence, uh, really a great uh, market to be uh, launching products in. A lot of new products come from California. So that allowed us to greater distribution than we'd ever have before. So. The, so the only co-branded products that Celsius offered after 2014 were what were the tub, the 40 count tub, and the 14 count box. Yes. There was no other product that was co-branded under the Celsius um, portfolio, right? No. Scott, call up uh, the 2014 agreement. Yeah. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I, I think everybody has seen this document umpteen times and pretty much recite the provisions by memory, but I just want to focus on one thing. Um, in the compensation part of the document, there's a bonus provision that deals with the sale of 690,000 units. It's page 20. And if you, Scott, if you can zero in on paragraph three. Um, that's 690,000 units, that number. Where did that number come from? I calculated that number. You tell the jury how you came up with that number. So there's a few things behind that number that we, that with David Gold and, and Jerry when we were negotiating the, uh, the first contract. And um, they wanted to create a co-branded product which we were able to, we had a, a connection with GNC. And initially the concept was to create a, a multi-serving tub, um, just like that orange tub you saw, but with co-brands, Flo's brand and uh, Flo Riders brand and Celsius brand coming together, creating this tub, and Flo was getting into fitness in a big way as well. So GNC is perfect um, as a partner, a national distribution, it's a, it's a flagship retailer. So we were able to sell that in as an exclusive opportunity, and we were really excited about the partnership there. So I ran the numbers. I think the, 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 the thought process based on these number of shares at the time, plus um, the additional compensation, the value of this is roughly would generate about $10 million in sales to Celsius. That was the target. And how we arrived at the $10 million in sales that this would generate at 690,000 units is the list price going into, I think GNC at the time was right around $20. And you have to spend, when you're in retail, you have to promote the product. So we had to offer, I think roughly, uh, I think it was like three to 350 or a certain number of dollars we had as an allowance for promotion. And that means you get $5 off a tub, $7 off a tub. We had to pay for end cap space. Uh, because what is, GN what is that? What is that? Sorry. So when you look at retail, just when you go into the grocery store, everyone's paying for space on those end caps. So uh, it, it, your product's not there just because there's a reason why the product's there. So with GNC, you basically pay to play, as they call it. So if you want an ad in their flyer, you want a sticker on the window, you want the sales rep at the counter to talk about it for the month. 
you want them to suggest the sale, uh, you have to pay for all these things. So we, we allowed an allowance of a certain number of case, a uh, certain number of dollars per case to run these programs at the budget. So we created a budget. The target was $10 million in sales. That's what Jerry wanted to drive, um, David Gold through the whole program. Like, there's not any reason to do this unless we can generate 10 million in sales. And Flo had all these followers, so, and David Gold was really selling. You know, people are very loyal and, and a variety of things. So it was $14.49 was the net revenue we would receive between the blend of these 14 count box sticks and the 30 or 40 serving counts tub. Uh, so if you take $14.49, multiply it by $690,000, you really get your $10 million. And the $10 million was a big number on net revenue because when you add your cost of goods in, plus the amount of money we were paying on planned marketing programs, which we created in our budget, uh, and the additional costs that we were paying flow, you know, it, it turned out to be somewhat of a, you know, a, I think our target on the investment was a 10% gross profit. So from your perspective, in order to justify the issuance of an additional 500,000 shares, you were looking, at least internally, that the company would generate approximately $10 million in gross revenue from the sales of the co branded product. Objection leading. Um, it's leading. Uh, I'm going to sustain the objection. So again, I'm, look, I'm asking from your perspective, and, and just so that we're clear. So under the terms of this agreement, the deal was if in the bonus compensation, excuse me, the incentive compensation was that 500,000 shares would be issued if 690,000 units of co branded product were sold. Objection leading. Um, I'm going to overrule the objection. You can answer. Okay. Yes, the budget created was $10 million, equates to a blend of. 690,000 units sold of the 40 serving tub and the 14 count sticks. Keep in mind, if we go back to the single serve stick, we sold 2 million of these single serve sticks, if you want to count them that way, in 2013. There is no way I, I would, as a CFO of the company, would ever enter into any agreement to sell single, I mean, you're talking, it would be basically generate $450,000. That doesn't even pay for anything, at least what we pay even D3M and through the contract relationship. It doesn't make any, it doesn't make sense. It's not a business sense. And Jerry and I would never do that. Um, you can take that down. So let's see if we can kind of put some timing and some amounts in place after the agreement was entered in 2014. Um, when did the, when were the tubs ready for sale to the public? The, the flow fusion tubs, when were they ready for sale to the public? Approximately. Well, we moved pretty quickly um, after, you know, when the relationship started. So I know we only did one, we wound up only due to getting discontinued at a GNC, um, we, we did a we had big ambitions, 10 million in sales, right? Um, unfortunately, we did too large of an initial production run um, with the tubs, and uh, I believe that was, I think it launched in GNC in maybe it was June or July, maybe? I, I know it was sometime in, uh, I don't know the exact date, uh, but I know we we did a lot too large of a production run and had to write off a lot of product. So you, you, did you sell that entire, that one and only production run of tubs, did you actually sell it, sell them out? No. You had to destroy them? Yes. What about the boxes, the low fusion boxes? How did they do? Well, uh, you know, the tub was only in GNC, um, you know, at the time. So uh, we were able to get the flow fusion on Amazon and uh, the 14 count box on Amazon. I believe it was in Ralph's and uh, Vitamin Shop. And, um, you know, uh, I think we did about two production runs of that, and it's, it, it wasn't meeting. See, at retail, when you're dealing with retailers, you have to meet a certain velocity level. So keep in mind, every slot at retail is extremely expensive, and if you're not generating revenue for the retailer, you basically have like six or eight months to perform, and you're out. Um, they're going to put another new product from some other company in your slot. So it's, it's highly competitive, um, CPG business. Um, did you... Uh did you did um, 
Celsius sell out the production runs that it did of the Flow Fusion box. And again, I'm focusing on the time period of March 2014 to March 2016. Did we did we sell out of the of okay. at the end? Uh, no, I think they were they were selling through at, at that point. I think we did. If I recall, one of one of the million documents we provided, I think it was in my deposition. I think it was they. Sandy had an email production. She believed she ran two productions of the product, and we had to dispose of a lot of boxes. And 67 is <coughs> <coughs> 67. Oh, I'm sorry, defense. And let me show you what's uh, in evidence as defense at 67. Uh, John, is, is this the email you're referring to? Uh, yes. And let's just go through it just so the jury understands it when it looks at, at this document back in the, in the jury room. Um, so you you asked Sandy to kind of do, uh, and, and who's Sandy? Uh, at the time, she was, when I started, she was our controller, so she's in charge of finance uh, and uh, operations and production. Right. And, and just so that we're clear, the numbers up top where it says the breakdown by flavor and, and you have a, for orange, one million two hundred eighty-two thousand one ninety, and then berry seven hundred thirty thousand three fifty. Is that referencing a box or sticks? It's referencing the actual wrap of the stick, the actual plastic piece, the sleeve, if you want to call it, the production of the sleeve. So these are the number of sleeves that are actually produced. Not the number of actual product produced, the mat, the number of sleeves that were produced. And that so sleeves like, come sleeve, in rolls. The sleeves are the, this outside packaging of the stick, right? Yeah, they come in big rolls that they kind of put on this production machine. And so, in order, so for example, if they did 1,282, I'm sorry, 1 million, 1 1.28 million of these, you had 14 of these, or you would divide that by 14, you'd come up with a box, right? Right, that would be the maximum. Okay. And let's go to the rest. So the 40 serving canister, that's the tub, right? Yes. And so during that two year time period, 151,000 of them were, were produced? Yes. And then on the Flow Fusion sticks, the total amount that was produced during this time period was. 1,985,504, that's sticks, right? Yes, I asked Sandy about these numbers. Um, just keep in mind, on the 14 count sticks, that's the how many we produced, not sold. Um, number two, on the 14 count sticks. You're saying, Your Honor, to know. Uh, he's testifying to what someone told him. Okay. Right. Um, um, hang on, hang on, hang on. It, what we're reading from here is this is an evidence, correct? Correct. All right, objections overall. Uh, I can clarify that. It says date of the, the production date of the date of artwork change. So that, that's the number, the maximum number that could be produced. So kind of to put a, a bow on this, bottom line were did did Celsius manufacture enough boxes and tubs during that two year period to actually get to the six hundred and ninety thousand unit threshold? Unfortunately not, no. And why didn't it, why didn't it manufacture more? You get, you, you, if the product doesn't sell, you can't reproduce it. So, um, didn't work. Does, do these, do these products have a shelf life? They do. So if they don't, if they don't sell within that shelf life, what happens? You, you get them returned and that's exactly what happened. Now, been a lot of talk in this case about promotion of product, whether it was done or not. Did Celsius promote the Flow Fusion products? Very much so. And can you describe or just give examples to the jury of the type of promotions Celsius did to promote these two products? 
Yes, I provided a lot of information that was requested, but we did Pandora ads. Um, we did uh, ads in our retailers, um, you know, uh, GNC. We did a lot of advertising at GNC uh, because that's where the product was mainly sold. We did vitamin shop ads. Um, we did um, you know, a lot of radio, like, like the Pandora digital radio ads. And um, we did some um, digital targeting ads on like Google. Did, did Celsius run promotions with its retailers on either of these products, between these two products? Yes. Can you, you know, give examples yeah. of the type of promotions that were run? Yeah, so uh, one big promotion, kind of as the, like the last hurrah at GNC, is we spent a lot of money to get corrugates, and they call them uh, toppers. Um, so we worked on a big program at all the GNCs where we created uh, Flow Fusion. We used, uh, you know, uh, a bunch of images of uh, Flow and uh, different things, and that was a big program we paid for to try to get additional availability in the stores. And we spiffed the sales reps to try to push Flow Fusion to try to get sales. And it was a it was a topper that sat on uh, all the retail or GNC stores uh, as a big program. That's a, that's an example. And then you get. If you bought a, a, a Flow Fusion, you would get like two dollars off or three dollars off. I don't have the exact program, but each of our retailers, we have promotional calendars and schedules for every single one of our retailers. So it's it, and that was all submitted in evidence as well. Did you did you run any promotion on the actual sticks, individual sticks? At, I know we yes, of course we run promotions on every single item we have. At, uh, at Vitamin Shop, we ran a variety of promotions, offered free. Uh, sticks to uh, the employees as well. Your employee can be the employees of these retailers can be your biggest consumer as well. Why did you run promotions on sticks if you didn't sell sticks individually? No, no, no. I mean the 14 count stick box. Like you, we would run a dollar off. Usually it's a dollar off or a two, dollar or two dollars off a 14 count box. Oh. Let's let's turn. Let's shift gears and let's talk a little bit about. Uh, your communications with Mr. Bolt. Did you have discussions or meetings or calls with Mr. Bolt during the time period after the execution of the 2014 agreement? Uh, yes, we kind of had a joke in the office. Uh, David Gold was uh, highly aggressive uh, in the office and on phone calls, and um, he was uh, uh, very much so. Fair to say that you had frequent communications with Mr. Cole? Highly. And during, in, tell the jurors, like, what typically, what were those communications about? Uh, well, David, uh, I mean, we would talk, well, when Flow Fusion was in GNC and we were getting indications it wasn't selling well, a lot of top topics, you know, pushing. Uh, David Gold to get more activation out of the, the strong arm organization. Um, he would talk about um, a lot of times he would always you know, be pushing for the next royalty payment constantly and that had to be like a fire drill when it was immediately due. And, um, what do you mean by the next royalty payment? What does it mean? Well, there, there was, uh, like it, we did an advance against royalties and then there were some other royalty payments along the relationship. Um, and that was, what, that, was in, that was what was provided in the 2014 agreement? I believe so, yes. Yep. And did you, did you talk to Mr. Gold about how the, how the sales were going for the two Flow Fusion products? Uh, I'm the CFO of the company. I, uh, we're constantly walking around with sales, margins, um, customer profitability. We have a sales by SKU report. We would meet, you know, monthly reviews, um, phone calls. Um, I mean, he even became a sales rep for us to try to help sell the product. Did you show these reports to Mr. Bolt during this time period? Yeah, conference rooms. I, I mean, I, I always had my laptop. We would um, we'd have Jerry in, in meetings. <coughs> and he, he was in the office uh, on phone uh, a lot. He was well aware of what was going on. Mr. Gold knew what the sales were at the time, right? Yes. Did he ever ask for, print me out a copy of the sales report, John? Take it back to Strongman and show them. He, he didn't have to because we were aggressively uh, trying to drive sales, and he knew the, where the numbers were. But he never asked. But did he ever ask you for a sales report, and you refused? He didn't need to. No. No. But that's my question. Did you ever refuse to give him the sales report? Absolutely not. Did you ever hide any information from Mr. Cole? No. 
Do you have any reason to hide any, any information from Mr. Cole? No, I work for a public company that's audited every year, so and I have integrity. So you wouldn't conceal any information from Mr. Cole? I would not conceal anything. And Mr. Gold was one of the company's sales representatives, right? That's correct. So did he have access to this sales information as requested? I believe he was working close with Robbie Kukowski, who was our, at the time our VP of sales. Um, and she had access to all sales data. So I'm, I'm sure there was conversation. Now let's move forward to 2016. So the 2014 agreement had a two-year term that was set to expire sometime in March of 2016, and, and then a new agreement was executed between Celsius, B3M, and Strongarm um, in April of 2016. Um, what was your involvement in that process, if any? You know, I work on the terms uh, of the agreement, um, financial side, making sure that, uh, you know, we're operating profitably in the arrangements. That would help Jerry out with a lot of the terms. So this was this was in connection with the negotiation of the 2016 agreement. You were working on the terms to make sure that they were financially profitable? Correct. What was the major change between the 2016 agreement and the 2014 agreement, at least with respect to compensation to Mr. Dillard and the B3M people? You know, I was in meetings um, that we had about uh, the importance of, so we had the 14 count, the, the, the big serving tub got discontinued. So at that point it was no longer around. Um, it was the 14 count uh, co-branded product of the full fusion that was still in existence. Although, you know, not selling well, but we still had it in retailers. And we wanted, um, you know, the, the organization to continue to sell it. So we restructured the terms um, the new terms of the agreement and had uh, compensation on the flow fusion. Um, in it was a dollar. It's a dollar a case uh, bonus um, for each one that he. So when you promoted it, you got a dollar on every sale. And then the other um, the other sale uh, because uh, on the endorsement side or using his uh, likeness um, as a product endorser. We gave the biggest opportunity to uh, Flowrider organization, and that was our number one selling SKU at the time, which was our uh, orange flavor. And uh, that had, we were actually starting to get some pretty good distribution, or we had planned distribution expansion. And we offered, uh, I think it was 10 cents a case uh, commission on every can of orange, or a case, a 12 pack case SKU. Of, that's what we sell uh, the flow, the twelve pack of orange to retailers at. Um, he gets ten cents. And in order to, I guess, enter into this agreement, Celsius offered, and B3M and Mr. Dillard and Strongarm accepted that different compensation <coughs> scheme, and also agreed to take a five hundred thousand dollar advance against royalties on the sale of those two products, right? That's correct because the first contract just didn't work and didn't hit the you know the KPI metric of the 690,000 units. So we entered into a new contract with all new KPIs um, that the team was going to work on. And what was the term of that second contract that was signed in April 2016? I believe it was 30 months. So your metrics and your calculation were based on a 30-year term? 30 month turn? I'm sorry, 30 months? 30 months. Okay. Now, did there, obviously the 30 months came and went. Um, at the end of those 30 months, was Celsius, if, it, if Celsius had any remaining product like the, the boxes, any branded, Co-branded products of the boxes. Could it sell this product after the end of the 30 months? Uh, no. And why not? It's in the contract that you know you lose your, um, you can't use because it's his IP and likeness. And you can't can't continue to sell a co-branded product if you're not under contract. So so until 
Once that contract had ended after 30 months, we could not take advantage of the co-branding of any product with Worldwide. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, it's it's just like when you look at what happened after the contract ended. Um, you know, uh, Flowrider went to our number one, uh, our number one competitor, Bang. It was only a few months after the second contract ended, and did a massive promotion with them, a concert, and was posted all over social media, uh, promoting Bang Energy and their local. Um, they're a na they were at that time they're a national brand, almost the number three energy drink out there, and one of our main competitors at the time. And so, and, and that's fair because he was no longer obligated under the agreement, yet there was, we had no further exclusivity with him as an endorser for a brand in that category, right? Because the 30 months had expired, right? That's correct. So he could go out and if he wanted to compete against Celsius and promote another brand, which he did, he could do that, right? Yes, he could. There was nothing Celsius could do. Contracts over. Now, in your role as CFO and then later as CEO, do you have an understanding of who are the shareholders of Celsius? Yes. And at one point in time, D3M was a shareholder of Celsius, right? Yes. And at some point in time, that stopped, right? Uh, we have 20,000 uh, shareholders currently, so I don't know. Um, he, he may still be a shareholder. I'm not aware. Right. So do, do you know whether or not D3M ceased to be a shareholder of Celsius in October of 2018? Well, I know we had shares um, that, were, that we issued to him, and they were transferred to a brokerage account, and one would assume... Could I'm assume. just referring to D3M shares, not Mr. Dillard shares. Um, yeah, two, nine, 18. Yes, that is correct. I, I recall that. And it was in regards to a ledger. We have to, every year, we have to get a listing of all of our shareholders um, and when we do our annual shareholder meeting. And um, that is correct. D3M was not listed as a shareholder um, at as we were preparing for that uh, annual shareholder meeting. So at least by so by the end of the March or excuse me, the April twenty sixteen agreement, which was thirty months later, D three M was no longer a shareholder of Celsius. I did not see him on the list. That I recall. Let's talk a little bit about Celsius's performance after the end of the twenty sixteen agreement. Um, has Celsius experienced success? generally since the expiration of that agreement in 2018? Uh, yes, the company has done extremely well. Just over really 2020, um, 2000, right towards the end of 2019, 2020, and, and today. Um, it's been transformational. Um, when I took over um, CF, as the CFO um, in July, um, I did a dual role for about a year and a half as the board of directors was looking to find a new CEO. CEO. Um, and due to the success of the company, when I was doing that dual role, um, they made me permanent CEO, and I backfilled the CFO role in 2018. Our, yeah, it was, right, it was like late 2018. Um, and I, in 2019, we did a restructuring, or I restructured the marketing team, restructured the sales team and uh, brought some really good people into the operations team and uh, we also brought on an individual dedicated for investor relations. Why is that important, bringing an individual for investor relations? Well, you really need to have, uh, we're a public company. Well, I remember one of my main KPIs at the time was to get the company listed back on NASDAQ and to make all the prior shareholders whole. So by doing that, having someone dedicated on investor relations, they we're focused on talking to analysts um, and making sure we go to these investor conferences, which are really critical. So, so you have a lot of these investor portfolios and people managing money and with 401ks, BlackRock is an example. So we would go to these investor conferences and tell people about Celsius, um, talk about you know what we're doing in this new age of energy that was coming. And it wasn't negative calorie energy drink. At that time, we really positioned the brand, transformation it into this live fit. 
um, this aspirational lifestyle company. Um, and that, that was really, really took hold in 2019. Um, and we've been building on it each and every year from that point. Did all these things pay off for the company? It's worked out really well. I think you know one of the key drivers when you look at our revenue growth is really the distribution. I mean, you can what have the. There? How did, how did, were there any changes in distribution that assisted the increase in revenue? Absolutely. Um, you know one of the one of the things when I mean, you have a retail product is how do you get it on shelf? And uh, in the beverage industry, it's highly competitive. And um, so one area, one way. You really, in order to succeed in the beverage industry, is to have a distributor sell your product into retails. So what does that mean? So take Publix as an example. We would sell to Publix, it goes into the back door, and then we rely on like someone that's working the stock room to take Celsius out and keep it on shelf. Versus when you sell to a distributor, you come in through the front door, in theory, and you get, you get actually someone putting your product on shelf, making sure the SKUs are right, making sure you get cold placement. Highly competitive. In the energy, in the beverage industry, people rip off your tags and then they play dirty tricks uh, on there. So you really need that. Um, my brother-in-law worked for Anheuser Busch in Tampa and um, as a bulk truck driver uh, for them, and he was able to get us meetings. We've had multiple meetings with the Anheuser Busch distributor, and he was able. It was back in two, early 2019, close our first Anheuser Busch distributor, and they took us on. Um, we work closely with them, and really, I'm all about building great relationships. Great relationships build great brands. Great partners build great brands. That's what it's all about. And we worked really hard with that distributor. Um, we created a, a lot of noise that were always there. They need anything. And then Bang, that competitor I was talking about, uh, Bang was in a lot of distribution partners across the country, nationwide, and a lot of Anheuser-Busch distributors. And um, they were doing really well. And it was uh, in 2000, they moved over, um, it was 2021, they, they moved over from the Anheuser-Busch distributor network into Pepsi. So that opened up this massive void for a lot of these distributors. And um, I created a task force with a team. Um, literally in 18 months, we closed 260 distributors nationwide in the country. Uh, we were highly aggressive. We hired a bunch of new team members from uh, Anheuser-Busch as well, um, and we worked really hard on that. We built out a national distribution network in about 18 months, and we had individuals selling Celsius, uh, leveraging, you know, talk 10,000, 20,000 potential sales reps around the country selling Celsius into the retailers. So, so that was monumental. So, so that was like the God smiled down upon you because Celsius didn't, didn't that was just luck that they, that Bang went to Pepsi, right? Uh, that is, uh, you know, it, it's, um, I, I don't know, it, it, luck, it's a lot of hard work. Nothing's ever easy. You know, people get, uh, I say this over and over again, opportunities will come to you, but it takes the individual to maximize that opportunity. And that's what we were able to do. There was a lot of other brands going after that same, those same distributors. So we were not alone. Uh, we worked really hard on that. So in 2018, just roughly, how many locations, how many stores were you in? Uh, we were really excited. We finished 18, about 18,000. And today, how many stores are you in? 160,000 plus nationwide. And, and the crazy, uh, another interesting thing is just uh, three months ago, um, Bang exited uh, PepsiCo as their national distribution partner, and Celsius is now sold nationwide through Pepsi. So another opportunity came up, um, and uh, Pepsi uh, took Celsius on as their allied partner, and today we're, we're sold through PepsiCo nationwide, which we're really excited about, which took, again, a lot of hard work, but the key is, um, when, when I was talking about that restructuring, I restructured the sales organization, and I brought a gentleman on, his name's Tony Guilfoyle, he built Rockstar, and he worked with Pepsi as an allied partner for over 10 years. Um, also brought on several other individuals, Paul Story, when I restructured the operations team, and he worked on Rockstar for over 10 years as well. So they had great relationships. So it's actually, we worked out as a great partner for Pepsi because seamless, uh, everyone knew everyone, uh, which was, it was it, I went to the initial launch meeting and everyone, you know, was, uh, it's kind of like getting the old band back together. It was quite quite amazing, and they use a bunch of crazy acronyms that uh, I'm still learning right now. So let me ask you a kind of a touchy question. Here. So one of the themes, the plainness of advance in this case, is that 
Mr. Dillard is responsible for the successes that Celsius has experienced in the last three, four, or five years. What would you say to that? I'd say you're probably aggravating a lot of over 250 employees in the company right now. Um, everyone works really hard. It's not, you don't catch one individual, one post, two seconds in a music video. It doesn't, doesn't sell retail. I mean, it, it takes a lot. It takes a village. We have over a thousand partners now, influencers, um, uh, uh, brand spokes, uh, product spokes, individuals. Um, it takes a lot. I mean, everyone's a consumer in here, right? I mean, we realize how difficult it is. You see an ad, you go into the store, you see it, it it's, it's very difficult. Consumers, you have one or two seconds to make a decision. That's what we really learned and, and focused on with the consumer. Um, in 2019, the big push when I restructured the sales team, retail, retail, retail. Own the dance floor. And what do I mean by the dance floor? That's the retail, that's the retail space. So I kind of talk with the teams. You've got to own the dance store. You've got to have that perfect store. Um, consumers, they're not going to hunt for your product. I think that was a key learning along the way. Unless you have a really loyal consumer base. And that's what we were hoping with a flow rider. We were hoping his consumer was extremely loyal. That would find our product at GNC. I don't have anything, anything further this time. Cross-examination. I never said that Flowrider was responsible for the success of the company in the last few years. I think you would agree with me with what I did say in opening statement, which was that there were a lot of brilliant decisions and hard work by people at the company to get where it is today. Right? We appreciate that. Thank you. Yes. But that's not the same as saying Flowrider built this company alone. Or anywhere close to it, is it? Not even, he did not closely build the company. So, I just want to clarify that because I never said about the work you did that he wasn't responsible for building Celsius or that Florida built the company in the last few years. I just want to make sure you know that. Um, so, you, um, you have not. You don't know what any prior witness has testified to, correct? Correct. Let me see. Oh, there it is. It's the last witness, but I have to remember to move that chair. <laughs> What does renewal mean? Renewal? Yeah, the word renewal. Can you use it in a sentence? Uh, let's renew a contract. Uh, renewing a contract, uh, I, I guess it would be uh, renewing a, that business relationship. To grant or obtain an extension, correct? Something like that, would that be one definition? You got to look at the detail. I'm just using the word. You, with the dictionary, help refresh your recollection on what renew means, or whether it can mean to renew, uh, sorry, to uh, grant or obtain an extension. Yeah, it could be also like a major league, you know, like baseball players, and you know, they constantly teams say they renewed the contract, but the underlying contracts are completely separate terms, and 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 under certain circumstances, and. Maybe even different positions, and and could be different. So I guess you got to look at the physical document. Yeah, but sometimes people issue press releases, or they send emails, or they talk in board meetings. And when they say the board renew, you understand to obtain or extend an extension of a contract, right? That only makes sense. Would this help? Refresh your recollection. It, you're referencing emails, and emails are conversations, so renew, renew a uh, relationship, sure.
All right, so now this is this will be pretty easy. Um, uh, in your deposition, um, you were asked about restricted stock, how long you need to hold it. Um, those are, you, I think you didn't know at the time, you said you can look it up. Um, but I want to get into evidence how long uh, you have to hold restricted stock after it's issued. And would you agree that the SEC guidance on that is um, is where you would look to find that out? Yes. Okay. And I've shown this to counsel, Your Honor. So maybe you could just, I've got uh, three areas marked. If you could just read area number one. <laughs> What are restricted and controlled securities? Restricted securities are securities acquired in unregistered private sale from the issuance of company or from an affiliate of the issuer. That was number one. Yeah, so restricted stock is stock that's not sold on the market and bought on the market, right? That, that kind of stock is restricted. Correct. Okay, what's number two? If you acquire restricted securities, you almost always have received the certificate stamped with a restricted or legend. All right, and then three, about how long you have to hold the sale. Holding period before you may sell any restricted securities in the marketplace, you must hold them for a certain period of time. If the company, uh, the company that issued the securities is a reporting company, uh, in that it is subject to the reporting requirements associated with security action, um, Security Exchange Act of 1934, then you must hold the security for at least six months um, if the issuer of the securities is not subject to the reporting uh, requirements, then you must hold the security for at least one year. And you guys are subject to reporting requirements, correct? That's correct. Yeah, so six months. Six months. What is SPIN's data? Uh, IRI data? Uh, I, I just see it referenced in the Celsius document as SPINS, as it, it SPINS is an agency which pulls data from IRI. It, it's, it's, um, it allows you to see your sales at the register. So every time you ring an item at Publix, um, or just as an example, it shows up, it'll say like, oh, you, you, know, it, you can buy data that shows you how you're doing and performing at these retailers. So SPINS is a service that provides scan uh, data um, from retailers. And you guys looked at that data, correct? What year was this? You used that data? What year? Well, I'm going to ask you about that in a second, but let me just ask in general, it's spins, it's data that you look at, it's reliable. Yeah, which year? Well, are some years spin data reliable and some years it's not reliable? We didn't subscribe to SPINS data in the early part, so it depends on which year you're referencing. But yes, we do use SPINS IRI data now uh, substantially. Let's see the cover page of that. There was a time when you were trying to get into Sedano's and you prepared a presentation for Sedano's. What, what is Sedano's? I believe it's a retailer in Detroit, maybe? Yeah, it's a retailer. So, and Celsius prepared, it's not uncommon to prepare documents for retailers to say why it would be a good idea to handle your products, right? Our sales team does that. Okay. And so, um, and they gathered the, um, the spins data um, at that time. Um, and I believe, let's go to page four. Um, when the spins data is summarized by Celsius under the word units, correct? Can I see the email that was attached to this? Because um, I'm sure you pulled this from all of our email. emails. What was produced to us is Celsius 032327 through 032340, which is the presentation that was prepared. I, I don't know what, what email you mean. There is we, uh, there has to be an email associated with this, so I'd like to know who the sales rep was, and I'd like to know who it was sent to. Okay, well, I, this is what was produced to us, the presentation. Your Honor, that's objection. That is not entirely accurate. All right, this is in evidence, correct? Yes, in evidence. No. This is the format. It's in agreed exhibit. It's not in evidence, Judge. This is not in evidence? It's not. So why are we showing this right now? Hold on, hold on. I, every document that I am using, I showed counsel before I stood up, and there was no objection. Your Honor, that is not a, can we go second? All right. Um. Which number was it?
Let me do this. Let, let's take a time out break. It's pretty easy to do this. So. All right. <laughs> All right, let the record reflect the injuries outside our presence. Uh, there are so many exhibits. I'm kind of trusting that you all to, to please it. Right, so so let me ask, what is this one marked? What's the... Uh, plaintiff 146. Plaintiff 146. Is that one in evidence? No. All right, it's not in evidence. So, all right. Your Honor, wait. Okay. May I have just 30 seconds? To no, that's fine. I, I, I guess the next question I was going to have is, are you moving it into evidence? Uh, yes, I will move it in okay. past. Is there an objection? Yes, there is. Okay, yes, so this is I take case. it was not one of the originally agreed ones that, or, or was it? What happened? Jimmy Scott came to me and said, I know there's an objection here. I'm going to use this document to refresh Mr. Fieldley's recollections. Mr. Fieldley has said, I can't be refreshed unless I have the cover email. And that is our objection. It's an incomplete document. The cover email is not on the document. That is our objection. So if you provide the cover email and you want to show it to Mr. Fieldy and you want to introduce him to it, we have no objection. Do you have the, uh, well, let me ask, do you want to put it in with the covered email or? I, I don't know what covered email. Can I, can I, I just haven't had a chance to, to talk. Can I just say, give me, give me 60 seconds? Um, okay. Counsel has now accused me in front of the jury twice of misrepresenting inaccuracies. I would not do that to counsel in front of the jury, but what he just said is not accurate. I showed him this document, I said I'm going to show it to the jury, I'm going to show it to the witness, do you have an objection, and he said no. Now he's saying I said things about refreshing recollection. You did not say you would introduce the evidence, you have a pending objection. All right, but you know, why would we be showing it to the jury unless it's, I mean, it's a demonstrative? Or, and for what purpose are you, are you actually showing this? This is a Celsius document that has the word units in it. Units is in the contract. It's evidence of what units means. If there's an email that they say is attached to this, I'm happy to look at it uh, and I either introduce it with or separately. But I would need to see the email. It said something the witness brought up, not counsel. I don't know how I'm supposed to be able to know what email he's talking about. Can I see and I apologize for getting emotional, but it's not right to accuse me of that twice in front of the jury. Sure he, accused him, he just said he had an objection. I said, he I said, said counsel has made an inaccuracy, and he said it twice. That's inaccurate. Now, that's an inaccuracy. What I said was that it wasn't in, it wasn't in evidence. And, and it's on the record. Hang on, counsel. When we take a break, y'all can talk to each other. Well, while we're in court, we have a record. You have to direct any of your comments to the court. Yes. Does everyone understand? Yes, sir. All right, so uh, can we take a break? Do you all want to talk and see if you can work something out here? Yes, sir. All right, let's do that. And then I take you've already showed them all the others. So confirm yeah. that there's no other issues with any of the other exhibits. Uh, and I'll put it on the record. If with anything, I'd be happy when I come back if there's any um, legal matters you want me to address. Mm -hmm. All right? Thank you. All right, let's take a 10 minute break. Yeah. John, just stay there, but if you just go to the bathroom, you can go to the bathroom. So, are they going to give us the email that's like a check? We're, look, we're looking for it. Oh, yeah, there's got Yeah. I can only imagine. No, I understand. You have to really have to try. But is it? But it's really Now we always the same Yes. So you guys kind of like a group? Yes. Oh, that's cool. So we have
Diller, do you want to wait for him? Or? No, we, he'll, I won't for the jury reasons, but I can okay. be in within 10 seconds. Okay. Um, all right, were you able to work out? Uh... Yes. Um, claims 146 is now going into evidence. Uh, and in addition, we're going to agree to the defense, putting in defense 385. And I'm going to show it to the witnesses as soon as we start. All right, so plaintiffs 146 and defense 385 are both in evidence. Yeah. All right. Well, but, uh, you don't have 385, but we'll make a copy. Okay. Or I'll hand you this when I'm done. Okay. All right, let's go grab our jerseys. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Just to give you a little heads up, this is uh, our last witness, all right? So once this witness is finished, um, we'll send you all home. We have a bunch of things that we have to do, take care of, and then uh, we'll finish up on uh, Tuesday morning. Um, Monday, the courthouse is closed. I think like we'll do that um, uh, earlier in the week. So uh, that's our, our schedule, all right? Thank you. Um, or any unforeseen, uh, you know, anything can happen sometimes. So I always throw that out there. Uh, but that's uh, what we expect. All right. So with that, uh, you may continue. Thank you. All right. So uh, this presentation is in evidence as plaintiffs 146. Um, and I'd like to go to page four. Um, you had referenced that there may be an email uh, related to Sedano's, which I believe is a um, grocery store here in Hialeah. No. Oh, okay. Uh, but let me show you uh, and see if this is the email you were talking about. Okay. So that this was Thank you. Uh, Sorry. years ago. You just remember there was an email related to this? I know um, the company, I remember the data going through this legal process. Um, we did a whole dump on our server. So I guess, that, I mean, everything has to come up. There's emails on it. I mean, millions of emails. I know we only got a few emails from your, from the other side. I think there was like five. Uh, but we literally, there's like thousands of documents that we've, we, we're open book. We gave everything. So I'm right. 
This is a Celsius document. Looks like it, yes. Well, it is. Yes. Okay. And uh, you're summarizing the spins data. I am not. I. Well, Celsius is. You're the CEO. Your company is summarizing the spins data, which is standard in the industry for tracking sales. I was not the CEO at this time. I know, but you're testifying today as the CEO, and this is data from your company, prepared by your company, not by me, not by anybody else. This is Celsius report and Celsius data, right? Yes. Okay. And um, it's at you report, your marketing uh, team reports unit sales by the team, individual ready to drink cans, not cases. Is that a question? Yes. I don't see any unit numbers on here. There's there's no numbers. Uh, so that, well, 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 those were uh, redacted, I guess, by you guys, which because uh, I guess it's confidential. But let's go to page five. Can we go to page five? And then we'll go back up to them. Just take a look here in terms of market share. Um, you guys are reporting that Celsius is growing 300% faster, and you actually have unit sales in two of those charts 591,074 units uh, for Celsius, which is an increase in 172, of 172%, correct? Is that a dollar sign in front of the nine? It looks like a dollar sign. That's a five. Do you see how the below you've got six? Okay. That's I see. Cans. Okay. Right. I didn't put this together. I, I, it's we track uh, spins data, tracks by units. Okay. So right. we we get units sold at the register, which could be a variety of different. It's in units. Whatever widgets are sold through the register. It's not what Celsius sells. This is what our retailer, our customers sell. Right. Exactly. And go, please go back to page four, and that's called a unit. What the customer buys is what you just said, correct? Objection to form mischaracterization is testimony, Judge. Um, sustained rephrase. Would you please read back his answer? So we get units sold at the register, which could be a variety of different units. Whatever widgets are sold through the register is not what Celsius sells. This is what our retailer, our customer sells. Whatever widgets are sold at the register, right? That's a unit. This spreadsheet that is being, this file that's being referenced is being sold. This is a document that a sales rep is using to sell into Sedanos, mm -hmm. and it's showing the retailer they this will generate that many units presumably right. through their registers right and because these are all cans right which in this this particular chart shows ready to drink cans 18 uh, 16 out cans uh from a company called amp you've got rockstar in 16 ounce cans you've got red bull in 8.4 ounce cans and you've got celsius in 12 ounce cans right Right, and that's on the uh, uh, you know the UPC basis. That is not what we would sell to Sedanos. We would sell at an SKU, which is a 12 pack. We would sell into Sedanos at. We're going to get to the SKUs, right? And we all understand that you sell to the stores differently than the stores sell to the customers. I'm just asking you what unit means right here in this Celsius document. I didn't put the document together. It could be singles, it could be 12 packs, it could be 24 packs. There's not a definition here on the bottom. So I didn't put the think, document together. Do you think that Celsius uh, may have sold uh, over 500,000 uh, cases? You, you, you think that the, the, the total amounts are, they can't possibly be, it has to be individual cans, just looking at the total amounts in the bottom. Objection, you're, you're argumentative. Correct. I'm sustained. That's the question. Well, what? What? I'm allowed to ask a leading question on cross. You can't comment. All right. Objection sustained. Rephrase your question. 
you can tell, can you not serve? Just by looking at the total numbers, you've been in this industry for a long time. You're CEO of a $7 billion company. You know, just based on the units on that chart, the amount that it must be talking about individual regulatory units. Each unit on average is about a dollar. So are you saying Celsius sold about $1.7 million of the raspberry acai? Uh, single serve? I, I don't know. I didn't put the document together. I know in 2017, we sold a lot more than a million dollars worth of product. How about this? Because I'm not saying anything. This is your report, your data. You, it comes from the industry standard spins data. The spins data, you must have reviewed that. As CEO of this company, and you reviewed it as CFO, you've looked at the spins data before. Right? Yes. Okay. And it's reported by individual can. Individual can. Not 12 pack, 6 pack, individual can. Correct? It's reported in a variety of different avenues. It, it, it could be a 12 pack. We sell, you know, it could be 12 pack, it could be a, a four pack. I, I, you know, it, maybe is it a single can? It's not qualified. I don't know. So it doesn't make any sense. You can't, if, if they're saying here's a four pack and here's a 12 pack, each of these are sold. Differently, the only way for them to tell, to compare who's selling more units is to do it by individual can. Correct? Do you know this? Judge, you're on a say so. argumentative. Um, sustain. Is there some reason why you don't want to admit a unit is an individual can? Your Honor, I mean, I don't know how many times i got to stand up and... I don't understand what he's objection is not argumentative. Hang on, hang on. All right, do you have an objection? Of argumentative again? Okay. Sustained. All right. Um, let's ask another question. Save your argument for both and arguments. If you have some more information to get out of this witness, uh, ask your next question. Okay. You're CEO for how many years? Since the uh, mid year 2017. So, five years. Five. And CFO of Celsius for how many years? Uh, I guess right around four years. And the industry standard data that you look at and other people look at to see where you stand in the industry, you have no idea what how they report units. You can't tell this jury how they report. I can tell this jury how they report units. I am not sure how it's summarized in this report. So just to be clear, um, you buy data from, from spins in a variety of different avenues. I don't know the data pools. Very sophisticated now. The amount of money, we spend almost a million dollars on data every year now from the spins, and we get it tracked by pack size on an ounce basis. I mean, it, it, it's very detailed. Back in 2017, I'm not sure where John Duva got this data from. And I, I push the sales team all the time on unit sales and case sales, and a lot of times, you know, four packs can be included in these numbers. Um, there's, we sell in four packs, there's single serve, there's also 12 packs. We also sell a Costco uh, 15 pack, uh, 18 packs. So it, it, I don't know if you want an answer. Could be single serve. I'm not 100% sure. You just gave out 12 packs, 15 packs, whatever you just said. That You know that's not how the spin state is reported. Objection, Your Honor. All right, I'm just there. Do you know if that is how that spin state is reported the way you just told this jury? It is. It is. So when uh, Red Bull and the, the, you paid a million dollars for this data, right? Uh, yes? Uh, around there. We've been, spent a lot of money on data. And other companies uh, spend a lot of money on this data, right? Yes. You, it, they don't just charge you. All the other companies in the industry who look at this to compare sales, they, they pay a lot of money for this data. Sure. Right? And. Uh, the data is presented in an apples to apples way because otherwise it wouldn't be valuable, right? Depends on the reports you purchase, depends on the data level you purchase. In 2017, we were buying extremely high level data. Oh, in other words, you're saying you weren't buying very detailed data? At the scan, at the register level, we were, we were just buying, you know, scan, what's scanned at the register. Presumably, maybe it's convenience, 
Did it look like it was convenience? Likely that is a lot of single serve cans being sold. But I don't know for 100% sure and I'm under oath. I don't know. Let me ask it to you this way. You wanted to present accurate information to Sedans. You weren't trying to trick them, of course, right? No. Okay. So you were trying to present to them a comparison of Celsius to other drinks, how much gets sold in the marketplace in the United States, right? Correct. What's interesting is that data says convenience, and isn't Sedano's a grocery store? Yeah, I guess so. I'm not sure your exact definition of Sedano's, but I mean of a grocery store. But I don't see what that has to do with my question. What I'm asking is, you're presenting data so they can see how much of a unit is sold. It says units at the top, right? Is that correct? Yes. All right. And so, in order for that data to have any meaning to Sedano's, we have to compare apples to apples, right? Objection calls for speculation as to what Sedano's finds mm -hmm. important. Overall. Repeat the question. In order for this to mean anything, right, you're presenting it in the presentation to Sedano's to try to convince them to carry Celsius. You're trying to show them what your market share is. And when you're talking about market share, you've got to look at an apples to apples. How much this company sells versus how much that company sells has to be apples to apples, correct? On a general basis, yes. Right. And um, some of those products are sold in four packs. Some are sold in 12 packs. All of them are sold individually. Correct? Correct. Okay. So the only one that's common is the individual key. Is that right? Yes. All right. Yeah, cool. All right. Thank you. Um, you were asked on uh, direct examination, why did you run promotions on sticks if you didn't sell sticks? And you said, no, 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 no. We ran promotions on the box. Do you remember that? Yes. You said $1 off the box, things like that, correct? Yep. That's what you said? That's correct. But you did run promotions on the sticks, didn't you? About 20 point cents off a of serving. This is vitamin shop. The vitamin shop, yes. Sir. Yep, to encourage more box sales, SKU sales, yes. Oh. Right, but they were sold to the customer by the stick, 20 cents off the stick. So to encourage more box sales, you gave a promotion off the stick. You know they were being sold by the retailers by the stick. I did say earlier on my when I was uh, questioned that a few retailers did sell it by the stick. Yes. Well, when you say a few retailers, we're talking about vitamin shop. Yes, they have over seven hundred stores. Right. And so big retailers, right? Yes. I'm not sure if they all participated, but yes. Okay. And so on the specific question about whether you ran promotions on sticks, if you said that you only ran promotions on boxes, you were mistaken uh, an hour ago. Is that right? If you said, when you said, no, 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 it was on the boxes, you were mistaken. Yeah, looks like we ran some programs on a promo counter uh, on sticks. I don't know if it actually ran or not, but yes. Okay. Well, then let's look at plans 119. I'll just show you a, a paper copy. May I approach the witness? Yes. Okay, because there's a bunch of... Uh, promotions in there um, without pulling them all up. Uh, this is just another example of multiple promotions you guys ran on the sticks. Yeah. It's a great example on us trying to create more Flow Fusion 14 count box sales. Agreed. I'm just saying, Agreed. when you said no, 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 you were wrong. Sorry, I misspoken. Okay, thank you. Um, you. You said that in the data that was produced in this case, the sales data that Celsius keeps, that a unit was a box, right? Yes. But the word unit is not in that spreadsheet, right? In that, that raw data, the word unit is not in there. There's a lot of spreadsheets provided, but uh, sales by SKU is probably on a serving basis. That's right. So yeah. It's not by unit in the data you provided us, the raw data that you keep. 
Uh, that well, it is by unit. It just doesn't use the word unit. You're looking at a spreadsheet with a pivot table on it and that goes trying to equalize. So if you looked at the spreadsheet, it says equivalent. So because we want to see how our SKUs are doing in flavors, we try to equalize that spreadsheet he's referencing, equalizes everything to the, um, the, the serving size. So therefore we can analyze which flavors are performing better because uh, for operations, for demand planning. So we try to, so we sell a 12 pack or whatever, that report is like a per serving report. Now if you look at whatever our customers order, if you go to the invoices, it is all based on the SKU level. We actually sell products to our retailers based on an SKU, based on 14 count box, or it's in a master pack. Um, we talked earlier about the tub coming in a six to a master pack. So we sold it in individuals, and we also sold a master pack. Um, right, but what I was asking was, because you, you said on um, direct, if, if the jury heard, I want to make sure we agree, that if this is what the jury heard, you say you were either mistaken or this is not what you were implying, that the raw data reports units as boxes. That would be incorrect. There's no place that even says the word unit in the raw data. There's so many reports that are provided. If you look at our accounting system, and if you click on the link, if you clicked on any of those, it's a feed, all the data is there, and it tells you the, the number of SKUs by item. You just double click on it. It's all there. It doesn't use the word unit, sir. Because you, you said the unit was a box. It doesn't use the word unit, so it can't say the unit is a box in the sales data. So, Am I right? I would have to look at the report you're looking at. I'm talking about your raw data. If you click on the raw data, there's a whole database. It lists the transaction, the invoice number, the it lists the, the number of SKUs that are sold, it tells you, and then it, there's a manual calculation that uh, we, that counting would do to try to equalize the equivalent units. Yes, Your Honor, there's there's a document being published. I have no idea what it is. And I don't, it hasn't been introduced. And I don't know if it's been introduced as evidence. There's been yeah, no reference. I saw it as I jumped the gun, Your Honor. I thought this was going to be a short. So will you take that down for about a minute, Andre? Um, that's a long answer. Do you know one way or another whether your raw data has the word unit in it? I would have to look at the spreadsheet. Okay, so I don't know is a perfectly acceptable answer. I should have said that to you. But if you don't know, then you certainly wouldn't have wanted, left, wanted to have left the jury with the impression that the word unit was in that raw data, right? That unit equals boxes was in that raw data. That is not the impression you want this jury to have, because you don't know, right? Correct. All right, now, if we can pull up, uh, actually, it's Defendant 67. It was shown to you just a, a few minutes ago. Let's go to page two at the bottom. Flow Fusion 14 count sticks. See that, Andre, right at the bottom. Flow Fusion 14 count sticks. Take the, no, no, yeah, right there. No, now I can't see your mouse. Okay. Yeah, right there. All that whole thing. Flow Fusion 14 counts, and this you were shown on direct. When it says, how many did we produce during this time period? The answer is 1,985,000, correct? Yeah, can you just zoom out from that sure. one moment? Just let me see the whole document, or zoom in on whatever. Yeah, Chromatic, uh, the company Chromatic, is the company that I was talking about earlier that creates the sleeves, yep. the rolls of sleeves that go on a machine to create the actual sticks. Mm -hmm. So this was how many did we produce? It's referencing coming from Bob. That's what I was talking about before. The maximum we could have reproduced with those uh, items was that 1.9 million. And, but it, that's the actual sleeve. Right, the amount of sticks. Sticks, yeah, right. sleeves. Just the, not the finished good. That is actually the stick, the, like the, the plastic wrap in a big roll. For the sticks on the first page, for the sticks, the max we could have sold is total produced, 1,985,000, right? That's the maximum, assuming we produce them all. But, but I'm just we're trying to make sure we agree. We're not talking about boxes with that number. That is a number for sticks, for sleeves, sticks, not boxes. Right, you're talking to a uh, one of our suppliers that produces the cellophane that for the uh, that produces the cellophane for the sleeve. Yeah, 
But to be clear, I, not me. You guys are talking to the supplier, and you're, you, that number is the number for sticks. Right, which is one component in our bomb, which creates the 14 count box. 14 count pack is how you usually refer to it in your documents, right? 14 count pack. Yes. And the box sorry, just give me one second. Ah, here it is. The box, the flow fusion box, is referred to in Celsius documents as a display box, correct? Correct. Right, because it's meant for it can be opened up and sold with the sticks at individual sale, and this will act as a display box right by the cash register. Or anyone. Provided the shop has them, yeah. not at by the cash register. Yeah, I mean, it could be at home on your counter as well. So, yeah, single serve on the go. True. But most people who buy the product don't want to display it, correct? The display is for stores. I don't believe that's accurate. Okay. Uh, defendants 177, please. The jury has seen defendants one. Well, hold on a second. Let's just confirm this is in evidence. Yes, it is. Okay. Defendants 177. And the jury has seen this. Now, actually, hold on a minute before you hold that up. Before you pull that up, Hunter. So you testified that you got to the $690,000 number because that's about $10 million in. Gross revenue? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, sorry, net revenue. Net revenue. Okay, that's $10 million in net revenue. Uh, and that's where the 690000 690, number came from? Yeah, and the, that document was presented as evidence when requested as part of the one of the pieces as well. Let's pull it up. And if you could uh, blow up. Well, uh, hold on. Let me just ask you this. So it sounds like you're familiar with this document, right? Uh, I don't, I've seen millions of documents. Uh, I, give me a moment to review it, please. I get the gist of it. Okay. Okay. So, um, you can take it down, Andre, please. So, let's just talk. You know that uh, Jerry David, who was the CEO at the time of this contract, right? Yeah, I didn't see. I didn't catch the date. Was that the first? What was the date on the document? It was two twenty one fourteen. Okay. Okay. So your CEO is Jerry David. And he's talking about 1% um, of flow followers ordering three times on average. That, that's the language that he's used, correct? I don't have the document up. Okay, it's in evidence. The jury is going to see it. Let's just do some that. Mm -hmm. The witness is asked to see the document. Right, hang on. Is there a question? My question is, it's oh, 23 million, 1% of 23 million is what? Two hundred thirty thousand. Sure. You know that you're a sure. CFO on that, but I had the calculator, so, didn't. Uh, so I had an advantage over you. But uh, two hundred and thirty thousand times three is. I guess it's right around the it's like seven hundred or something. Well, it's six hundred and ninety thousand exactly, isn't it? Okay. So that's where that number came from. I don't believe that's accurate. I, I, the 690 backs up to the 10 million. That was the whole strategy behind it. But, uh, you know, okay. that was my recollection. That's all you can give us. Fair enough. Um, you testified what a SKU is. You said stock keeping unit, right? Yes. That's what, it, that's what SKU stands for, correct? Yes. 
Um, what it is, is a specific numeric or alphanumeric identifier for a specific item, correct? Okay, yes. And you testified there's no such thing as a skew on the flow fusion single sticks, right? There's a UPC. Right, no SKU. Not the way we track it internally. So there's no specific numeric or alphanumeric identifier for that item? There is a CPU on it, uh, the, or UPC on it. The, the contract states it's wholesale sales of Celsius, and the unit as defined is there's a pricing range on it from $20 to $40 at retail. It's clearly defined that we're at 690 units. We're going to be the 14-count box and 40-count serving tub. If it was, like I said, we sold 2 million single-serve sticks before we entered into the relationship. That's, the, that's why we're here, to understand, to guess to get a vote on what that is. I mean, that's the reality of the whole thing. So what, what exhibit number is this? It's all going to be uh, 275? Yes, 75. So I'd like to, for the benefit of the jury, just blow up um, some of the individual packs. Now let's look at slide 92, please, Andre. So uh, the orange, flow fusion orange, as a UPC code, as you've already testified, right? On the individual stick. Yes, but none of our retailers order in this format at all. Therefore, an SKU, as identified by the company, is based on the box size. Find an invoice that a customer has purchased from us in a single stick format. You will not find it. Did anyone ask you that? Is there a UPC code on that? Hang on, hang on. Uh, overall, there's no question pending asking the next question. Is there a UPC code on the stick? Yes, sure. yes. All right, and what that is, we all know what they look like. It's the, it's the weird little lines and stuff that the scanner reads. Correct? Yes. That's what a UPC code. Barcode. All right, and next to the UPC code on the orange is an alphanumeric number. Correct? Yes, it's a barcode. No, next to the barcode is an alphanumeric number. Okay. Right. And for orange, for Flow Fusion Orange, it says FFO1115. Right? I can give you a stick if you'd like. No, 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 I see it. It's like some type of lock, that's a lock code. Lock code number of some type. Believe me, it's a lot easier to read there than Yeah, no, no, it's some type of lock code because that's after stamp. It's not on the original pack. It's done by the co-packer. What? That is stamped by a machine that's not on the original packaging that's stamped at production. Are you looking at the FFO1115? Yeah, that's stamped at production, meaning when you produced it, we just saw the invoice from Chromatic. Okay. Okay? And that's an alphanumeric number that is an SKU, a stock keeping unit, correct? As a component that they sell to a manufacturer to produce a finished good. That's where your Chromatic would sell the foil as their SKU, because that's what they sell to their customer, with Celsius being the customer. Sir, if that were true, then when somebody buys an individual stick and scans the barcode at the store, there would be no SKU connected to the UPC. It would be irrelevant data. Objection, you're right? Argumentative? There's a question. Oh, overall. Can you restate the question? You're suggesting that that's the SKU for the label that was sold to you rather than for the product that you're selling to the customer. Did I get that right? I might have misunderstood your question. I'm looking at this FFO1115, whatever number that is. I don't know what that number is, but you're saying that's Chromatic's SKU number? So that, that Chromatic is a supplier that sells goods to Celsius, and the item they sell is an SKU, and if that's what you're saying, then I would agree with you. Okay, so we agree that that's a stock keeping unit, for just to start. For chromatic. 
And, well, I want to get into that, but first, do you agree that that's a stop keeping unit? That's an SKU on the individual stick. I don't have a document in front of me that says that's Chromatics SKU, but if you say so, I would agree. I'm not saying that's Chromatics SK SKU. What I'm asking you is whether right next to the UPC code on the individual sticks is an alphanumeric identifier specific to the item. Is there? I don't. To be honest, I don't know what that number represents. I, I, I'm not in production. I, you know, I, I don't know if it's a SKU for chromatic. Okay, good. It's not an SKU from chromatic. Okay. I'm not saying that. Please okay. don't suggest I am. Okay. Do you think FFO might stand for flow fusion orange? Yeah. Sure. So it's an alphanumeric identifier specific to flow fusion orange. Okay. Yes. Not to a label so from by chromatic to you. It's specific to the flow fusion orange. Yes. Right? Otherwise, if it was a label sold by chromatic to you, it wouldn't reference flow fusion orange, which is what the customer is buying when they buy it at the store and the UPC is scanned. That's inaccurate. Um, Chromatic, I'm sure, has a, this item listed in their system as an SKU under your analysis of FFO. It has to be a unique item which they sell. They are a manufacturer of labels. Each label has to be unique. So they sell the labels to you one by one? We buy them in rolls of... Um, I'm not sure how... I think we buy them by, by thousands. By the thousands. So there's no possible reason to have an SKU on the label that's being sold to you. That is for the customer when they buy it at the store. They buy your product. That is your SKU. It is not chromatics. This can you for the label. That's your... Sir, you're the CEO of Celsius. You don't know if that's your SKU on the single unit serving? I don't know. In, I, it was long... I, I don't know. FF, uh, FFO Flow Fusion Orange. 1115. It looks like a, a lot code number to me, but maybe it is. If you have evidence, I'd love to see it. In the, the, the Flow Fusion Berry FFB, that might be Flow Fusion Berry 814. Yeah, again, it could be, uh, it looks like a lot number of some type. So when the customer <coughs> picks one of these out of the display box, goes to the cash register, and the cashier scans the UPC. Right? The store needs to keep track of that unit and that it was sold, right? Yes. So they, the store needs an SKU, a stock keeping unit, on the unit they're selling. Um, the stock keeping unit that we sell to our customers is a 14 count box. That's, that's, how not, that's not accurate, sir. They're sold in cases, not boxes. Depending on the retailer. You do not sell 14 count boxes by the box to any retailer. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we do. Okay. Thing that the data dump was. And in that data dump you gave us, you know what we produced, right? I don't know. There was thousands and thousands of documents. We let the IT people just, whatever the requests were. So if, indeed, you do sell to some stores by the box instead of the case, we would have to have those documents, right? You would have produced them. You wouldn't have there would be no reason for you not to give us those documents. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if there are no such documents, then you would agree with me. Because you didn't say you do. You said, I'm sure you do. We do. Like it's some kind of assumption. You would agree with me that there's nowhere in the documents that you sell by the box that we should go by the data and you don't sell by the box. Um, I, I believe there's several. Re there's a few retailers that buy by the box, but uh, you would have to check each customer and look at their invoices, the way they're invoicing. It's a, a $129 per case of boxes, right? Correct. 
That's what that's how what you guys set for the retail. Correct. Okay. Where we we Do you know who Mr. Buckner is? No. It's, it's Celsius lawyers hired a forensic accountant who came in here and testified that there's nowhere in the data that you're selling by the box. You would have no reason to doubt that, correct? I do not believe he looked at every single customer invoice, but maybe, maybe so. All right, and we don't have, you, we're in agreement, right? We don't have to, um, we don't have to go through all this. An SKU is a common term in the inventory world, and it stands for a specific numeric or alphanumeric and identifier for the item, right? Okay, yes, according to that definition. But, but you're in the industry. It's the correct definition, right? The definition we have, there's, it, you can Google it. Go ahead and Google SKU, and what is an SKU? It'll say it's, a, it's an item that is sold that a re, uh, manufacturer or wholesaler sells to their customer. I mean, that's not... That's not what an SKU is. It's the alpha numeric code attached to the item, right? Can you Google it? Sir, I just, I have plenty of books. Okay. okay. There's a lot of re Let, books out there. It, the, it stands for a specific numeric or alpha numeric identifier for the specific item. It's the identifier. It's the alpha numeric identifier, correct? According to that book, yes. And... Alpha numeric means a combination of letters and numbers. Correct. And there is such an alpha numeric item right next to the UPC on the individual site. Yes. Right? All right. Look, I have one last thing. This will be easy. Okay. Um, <coughs> you know what? Let me just, if I could have 30 seconds, I might be able to just do this in closing argument. Yeah, I, your, your testimony on direct, I think, is consistent with this. I'll just do this in closing argument. I have nothing further. Thank you. Thank you. All right, redirect. Well, get this question out of the way. Um, so, John, who, uh, the, re the spreadsheets that you referenced in your uh, in your testimony, who prepared those spreadsheets? Uh, that was a um, Sandy Tell Saint, or it would be a like a senior staff accountant. And did you review those spreadsheets for accuracy? Uh, vigorously every month when they were produced after we complete the monthly close. And, and where does that data come from in order to? to our accounting system, great plans. So, sales information comes into that accounting system, and then that information is exported from Great Plains into the spreadsheets. Yes. And that's the system that you rely upon. Yes. Was that the system in place back in from 2014 to 2018? Yes. Um, Plains Council showed you that number on the on the stick and. I heard you say something that you, you thought it might be a lot number. Yes. Okay. Um, what's the purpose of a lot number? Well, it, you, we're referencing a chromatic um, SKU, which is that FFO 115. So every time chromatic, you know, you buy a raw material from a supplier, they have to have a unique identifier in case there's something wrong. That product could be tainted, could have chemicals on it. Everything gets tested, and you have to be able to trace back from the lot number if there's a complaint back to your supplier, because the supplier is liable uh, under that, uh, would be under under that situation. Okay, so who, who, what organization or what agency requires the manufacturer to have a lot number on the box? I think it's just generally manufacturing acceptable standards. Um, uh, we're a dietary supplement, so we are, are here to, you know, FDA regulations, and we have really strict quality. Um, all of our suppliers have to have supplier qualifications. All of our raw materials must be tracked and tested prior to production. So, for example, if a consumer gets sick from ingesting this product, the lot number will help the investigators and the agencies to investigate 
you know, where this came from in case there has to be a recall? That is correct. No further questions. All right. Any uh, recross in those limited areas? Uh, no, sir. And that's no, sir. All right, members of the jury, any questions for the witness? Okay. All right, um, this question is from the jury, so answer to the jury. Okay. All right, you mentioned that the package constantly is evolving. How many variations of the Flow Fusion packaging were on the market during the terms of the contract, 2014 to 2016, in comparison to other products? Have the packaging of the existing products have changed? 2014 to 2016 and 2011 all the way to 2022. So the Flow Fusion... The Flow Fusion branded product um, that, that we, it, it did not change. So it's the same co branded with both IP rights and, and names as one cohesive unit with both organizations coming together. That label with both IPs on it never changed. Uh, the Celsius uh, core portfolio, um, you saw some of the packaging that came up earlier. It's evolved. Um, I, I, we, we constantly keep making changes to it and trying to make it better. We just actually just made some changes to it most recently last month. Um, um, seems like the marketing team is always tweaking it along the way, but uh, uh, yes. And uh, why wouldn't you send sale reports via official channels um, like mail, email, etc.? Like we, I was saying, you know, when David Gold, I mean, he, he, he is constant, uh, always in communication. So, I mean, he was in the office every other week a couple times, uh, phone calls, always uh, either trying to sell something or, you know, or wanting, to, wanting a royalty check or a payment. And we were always talking about sales. So it was no surprise that sales were underperforming on Flow Fusion. And like I said, we actually brought him on as a sales rep to help kind of drum up sales and... Um, and we just wound up having to write a lot of it off. So, and it, because it, it, it basically expired. All right, any follow up, Mr. Castell? No, Judge. Uh, Mr. Castell? No, you are. Any other questions from the jury? All right, now um, you're excused. Defense, call your next witness. Your Honor, subject to any exhibits that have been agreed and we still need to get in formally to the clerk, defense trust. All right, any rebuttal? No, Your Honor. All right, um, members of the jury, you've now received all of the evidence in the case. So uh, we have to take up some matters outside your presence. I am going to send you home. All right, so you get out here a little bit early tonight. Um, we're going to have you back on uh, Tuesday. Remember, not Monday. Courthouse is closed on Monday. So Tuesday, um, 945, and uh, anticipate hopefully uh, um, 945. We'll bring in here for some instructions, closing arguments, and then we'll send the case out to you for deliberations. All right? Have a great long weekend. Enjoy the long weekend. Here's the uh, thing. All right, you've received all the evidence, all right? But you have not yet received the law from the court. You have not yet heard the closing arguments. You are still not allowed to discuss the case. You're not to discuss the case. You have the case discussed in your presence. Do not do any investigation of your own. Do not read any 
news account, social media, or anything having to do with this case. It's very important. We're almost there, all right? So I have a great long weekend. Have a great breakfast on Tuesday morning. Get a good night's sleep the night before. We'll see you here at 9.45, ready to go. 9.45. I have other hearings uh, earlier, so I'm here at 8.30, but uh, we get to sleep in. Uh, everyone can be seated. Um, let's do this. Uh, um, here, here's this document that was going to be put into. Yeah, all, we need to get all these documents. So okay. certainly, um, you can leave it all there. Okay. And so we need to get all the documents. Make sure that we're all in agreement as to what's in evidence. And I know uh, resting was subject to making sure that you have all of your exhibits in. So we need to make sure of that. I know we have motions, uh, possibly from both sides, and then we have to. Um, figure out instructions, all right? And very form. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take 10 minutes, all right? I'm going to do 15 minute break. You all get everything together. Everyone needs to use the restroom. We can do that. Um, so uh, I want to have everything, if we can, uh, wrapped up. Um, worst case scenario, a little bit earlier on Tuesday, but I'd rather everything done. And uh, so this way, when they come here, uh, I want to make sure we had enough time so that each side gets there a lot of time for closing so we're not um, sending them back too late for lunch. Otherwise, uh, they might be really hungry while you're doing your closing arguments and they may not listen at all. All right. Um, how about like 9.15, just in case.
motions. Let me start with that. We do not. Uh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Any motions? Yes, Your Honor. May I approach the podium? Uh, yes. Your Honor, in an abundance of caution and for purposes of preservation, no, I understand. we'd like to renew our motion for a directed verdict on both of plaintiff's claims, both counts, count one and count two, on all of the same grounds that we previously stated. And I incorporate those arguments into my renewed motion at this time. And given that defendants have now rested, I would like to repeat for the record uh, that portion of our motion for directed verdict that concerns our affirmative um, defenses of statute of limitations and waiver. Um, we are entitled to, defendants are entitled to directed verdict um, on count one because any breach of the bonus or incentive compensation provisions is barred by the five year statute of limitations. Under plaintiff's interpretation of the bonus and incentive compensation provisions, Celsius allegedly breached the 2014 agreement in 2015, that was more than five years before plaintiffs filed their lawsuit. Um, while plaintiffs have attempted to show grounds for avoiding the statute of limitations bar, specifically fraudulent inducement and equitable estoppel, the evidence does not support these avoidances. Um, as a preliminary matter, fraudulent concealment was not adequately alleged in plaintiff's reply, such that they have waived it. And even if they adequately alleged it, the evidence does not show that Celsius concealed or hid any information, had a duty to disclose material information, knew that it needed to disclose that information, intended to induce plaintiffs into not filing the lawsuit in a timely manner, or that plaintiffs detrimentally relied on anything that defendants did. Plaintiffs have also failed to prove any evidence um, that shows defendants should be equitably stopped from raising the defense of statute of limitations. And with that, Your Honor, in renewing our motion on all of the other same grounds as I previously stated, um, that's our motion. I understand there's a different standard at this point. We're at the close of all the evidence in the case, uh, but the court's ruling is going to remain the same, even under the same, even under the new standard. Um, these are all factual questions for a jury to decide, and so uh, no additional arguments other than what was made at the close of plaintiff's case, correct? Understood, correct. All right, so, uh, um, all right, so motion for a directed verdict are all denied, and so now we go to charging conference. Do you all have a set for me to work off of? So. I, I'm going to leave that to Christina. I will just say that from looking at it, it appears that they've been making great progress, but I think there are a few that are still on agree. Right? Yes. Is that correct? This is all the agreed to that have a couple of stipulations that she's going to bring to, but I am not giving any di of the disputed. This is all the agreed stuff. Okay, if it's okay with Your Honor, I'd like to scan through that before Your Honor takes it. I mean, I, I can't. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go one by one. Okay. Okay. So do you have your full set over there? Yep. Okay. And I then, emailed this to. Wait, wait. Now we need all the speech. All right. Do you all have a uh, cover sheet uh, to put on here? I can. I can. Okay. I mean, I can do it. We still have even Florida standard. I have to clean this up. I, I understand. Um, but what I want is the cover sheet that has the case style. Okay. And just says final jury instructions. Yeah. All right. And um, so, but for clarity, what package we prepared was the agreed. It's not our full package. No, I understand. Okay. And so as I go through, um, you're gonna let me know if there's an additional instruction that needs to go in there and what's disputed on that. All right. But right for right now, when I look at this, you have a bunch of um, preliminary instructions that I don't need that I'm going to take out right now. Well, the only okay. thing, Your Honor, is if you wanted the record to reflect the full set of instructions, the ones you've already read before. Uh, this now. is going to be the final packet that's going to go back to the jury. Oh, so I these see. aren't going to go. Um, you have a court reporter. I've read already. Okay. Perfect. And uh, so, where do we want to start on this? In the three hundred ones. Correct. So we're going to pass all of the two hundreds. Okay. Yep. So we are going to start with three hundred one point one. If we even use that. Uh, no, that's not in it. Um, pass the three hundreds also to four hundred one point one. So it'll be the cover sheet, and then the next instruction will be four hundred one point one introduction. 
So we'll start with members of the jury. You have now heard and received all the evidence in this case. I am now going to tell you about the rules of law that you must use in reaching your verdict. When I am finished telling you about the rules of law, the attorneys will present their final arguments and you will then retire to decide your verdict. Any objection to 401.1? That's agreed, correct? Correct. Okay, so it's going to go face sheet and 401.1. All right. I take it there's going to be a summary of the claims, right? Before? Yes, the next one we have a dispute. Okay, why don't um, you pass me what you have? This is mine, or I only have ours, I don't have theirs. All right, um, I just need something four, to work from, okay? 416.1 and 416.4. Which are the standard instructions, Your Honor? That's what we're proposing. That's all right. I don't think we're there yet. We're on the 401.21, right? Burden of proof on maintaining. These are still. Yeah, before we get to 401.21, I have some other instructions, right? That, they're, they're not in this packet of grade, but. Here you go. Uh, you all might be farther apart than you think, but we're, we'll get through this. Okay. Give me one second, Your Honor. Yeah, I, the next one would be 416.1, breach of contract introduction, right? And that's all we have is a breach of contract claim, correct? We have two counts of breach of contract. Of contract. I've, I've already um, ruled on the uh, unjust enrichment, that's out, and counterclaim has already been resolved. And uh, so all we have is uh, two counts of breach of contract, one for the 2014 contract and one for the 2016. Yes, Your Honor. All right, so Your Honor. we have a space sheet for 1.1 introduction, and now we have 416.1 breach of contract introduction. Yes, Your Honor, okay. and our concern with those is that they're very general and they lump all three alleged breaches together. Okay. So what we propose, and what I'm handing to you, are three separate instructions, one for each alleged breach, and it includes the provision alleged breach, as, long as, as well as the elements for a breach of contract generally. Okay. Our objection is, Your Honor, these are basically argument. They are closing. They are giving their provisions of the contract. They're giving sections. They're writing into the actual elements, their definitions, um, and it's all argument. This, that's why you make standards. And then the, the, the well, argument in closing applies the standard to the case. No, so, I understand. That, that being said, um, this has to give some guidance to the verdict form. I don't think the verdict form is going to have one question for count one, right? It's going to break it, break it out. So, um, but that's why we don't have a four sixteen point one, which breaks out count one into count two and explains. I understand, yes, but even one, hang on, but even within count one, there are two breaches. Yeah, there's more than one issue, right? It, it basically says that, Your Honor. Where does it say that? It says that. Uh, Plaintiffs claim that defendants breached this contract by failing to transfer shares of defendant stock as required by the contract. I'm happy to include uh, in ca under 416.1 the fact that there are two compensations, a bonus, like for example, that there are two um, claims, one uh, bonus compensation provision and incentive compensation provision, and we can break that out of, out of sentence there. But actually incorporating a section of the contract and taking it out of context from the overall contract is objectionable. Your Honor, we are simply quoting the direct language of the agreement. There's no dispute about that that is accurate about what provision was allegedly breached. These are the very provisions they're claiming were breached. There's we, nothing wrong with quoting it for the jury to have in front of them. We believe okay. the entire, then that entire page is part of the that section because that section is a subsection of a prior, of that whole paragraph that Your Honor remembers. So they only included the little subsection, not the part that you read above. In addition to that, as Your Honor, we can include the part we read above. That's fine. Well, we, Your Honor, then we can provide the whole contract so they can take it all in context. That's not what we're proposing. I, all right. What I'm um, saying let is me interrupt here. Um, I would ordinarily, ordinarily say, if y'all want to talk, I can take a break. And you, uh, but you've been doing that for several days. But while we're here in court, I need. Again, we have a court reporter. I need you to only address the court, not each other. Understand? Yes, sir. Understood. Okay, so the direct up to here. I'm not going to take a break for you because you've already been doing that for a while. So um, I want to somehow at least in that count one and indicate that there are two questions for you to decide under this count, one pertaining to the... And then I need something there just so they understand there are going to be two issues under count one. Your Honor, I would propose that you said there are two questions 
that are pertaining to count one. One is the uh, bonus compensation provision of 250,000 shares, and then two is the incentive compensation provision regarding 500,000 shares. Any objection to that? Do you have a copy of your another copy of your instruction so I can see exactly where you propose to be? I have it right here actually. So what do you propose? Or what what was proposed, Your Honor? I can read it again, Your Honor, would you like? Um, yes. So it would go between paragraph one and paragraph two. Correct. There are two questions that pertain to count one. The first question is regarding the its bonus compensation provision of 250,000 shares, and the second relates to the incentive compensation provision of 500,000 shares. And you're saying that's between? Your, oh, Your Honor, the second sentence I would propose saying, plaintiffs claim that defendant breached this contract, uh, breached two provisions of this contract. The first provision relates to the bonus compensation. On, or input for 250,000 shares. 200, and the second provision relates to the incentive compensation for 500,000 shares. Plaintiffs claim that these breaches resulted in damages to plaintiffs. I think that is the clearest way to lay it out. That's acceptable to us, Your Honor. Okay, there we go. So I'll put a little note here for you all to include that. And then the next paragraph would say defendant denies that it breached the 2014 endorsement agreement. Defendant also claims plaintiffs waived their claims by failing to demand compensation sooner and that the claims were untimely filed under the statute of limitations. Is that acceptable? Acceptable. Okay, and then we go to under count two. Your Honor, we have to clarify under count two what's at issue. Plaintiffs claim that defendant breached his contract by failing to pay royalties. I mean, it's only one claim, right? It's um, royalties, right? Yes. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. It's acceptable. And then the parties must prove their claims by the greater weight of the evidence. I will now define some of the terms you'll use and decide in this case. All right, so just adding that one paragraph, we're good on 416.1, correct? On our end, yes. Okay, there we go. Your Honor, can I just, We are moving along. Without disrupting the court, can I just go talk to opposing counsel while we continue? Um, that's fine. Thank you. All right, so the next, um, I don't see it here, but the next instruction should be greater weight of the evidence. Okay, I do see it here now. Did Your Honor skip by 416.4? Yeah, that won't. I, I think 401.3 would come next, though, greater weight of the evidence. Okay. Correct? Yes, that's fine, Your Honor. Uh, everyone okay with that? Are we, but well, we are including 401.21, the burden, saying the burden is the greater weight of the evidence, and then 401.3 explains what that means. That's under the 416.1, the last. Um, oh, that includes it. Okay. It's, it's already there. Yep. Okay. So the next instruction I want to put in there is greater weight of the evidence, all right? Greater weight of the evidence means the more persuasive and convincing force and effect of the entire evidence in the case. Agreed? Agreed. Okay. So now we go to 416.4, breach of contract, essential, factual no, elements, correct? Me. So you're okay with that, right? Yes. All right. And then comes 401.21, burden of proof on main claim, agreed? Well, what was that number again? 401.21? I don't know. I don't, I, you, I don't think we need this. I don't think that needs to be in here. What was the number, Your Honor? The 401.21? No, that's because you just said that um, we were that it's it was it at the bottom. It was incorporated in the other one. Just make sure it says it both ways. No, I think, I think, um, mm -hmm. whatever your honor thinks, it does say it on 401, 416.1 does say the parties must prove their claims by the greater weight of the evidence. So I don't know if we need 401.21. What does the defense prefer? Do you want that language in there as well? You want to add that up to the 416.1? Yes. Why don't you just, you could read it right after you're on if you want. Or okay. I yeah, I so, think we could do 416.1, then 401.21, and then 401.3. Okay. Does everyone agree? It's fine. And then 416.4, yes.
Okay. And so then we get to 416.14. No objection. All right, agreed. That's interpretation, disputed terms. Then 416.15, interpretation, meaning of ordinary words, agreed? Agreed. 416.16, interpretation, meaning of disputed technical or special words, agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Then 416.17, interpretation, construction of a contract as a whole, agreed? Yes, agreed. 416.18, interpretation, construction by conduct, agreed? Agreed, yes. Interpretation, use of different language and contract provisions, agreed? Agreed, yes. Then comes 416.24, breach of implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing, agreed? Not agreed, Your Honor. If I may, Your Honor. Okay. Breach, we've done a considerable amount of research. Breach of implied duty of good faith is an affirmative claim. They are using it as an avoidance to our statute of limitations defense. It is not a legally viable avoidance. It is an affirmative claim that relates to an express term of the contract. There should be no instruction on it at all. Your Honor, I was told last night by Ms. Placencia that this instruction was acceptable. We're withdrawing so, that agreement, I'm sorry. Okay, but then I didn't bring all my cases. It said what I needed to say on this instruction. So I am unprepared to argue those cases because I was told last night that that was agreed. All right, let's, uh, let's back up for a second, all right? So, all right, there is not a claim for breach of implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing. No. You want to use this as a, an avoidance of their affirmative defense. Correct, and there is case law that right. indicates that Hang on, that let me, that so at a minimum, this wouldn't go here, correct? No, you're it right. It would now. probably go later on, we get to 416.32 affirmative defense statute of limitations. And it so would, you yeah, want to yeah. add something into there, essentially for breach of implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing? Yes. All right, let me move this to the back right behind that, and then we'll address it then, all right? Okay. All right, and so I might have to do a little bit of research there. Okay, so next is 416.44, legal status of entities, um, agreed? Agreed. All right. Your Honor, we have, a, we, have a, we have a somewhat related instruction that we propose. Um, and I'm not going to approach, I'll hand it to you, yes. on multiple claims. So this one's okay, so you want an addition to this one, something yes, else? Yes, it's somewhat okay. related, so I would imagine it would go Okay, here. and so let me, uh, all right, it says multiple claims, numerous parties, consolidated cases. Is this really a consolidated case, though? No, but the multiple parties and claims That's fine, numerous parties, applies. okay. I believe the plaintiff's issue with this has to do with the last paragraph, where we're, um, instructing the jury that there will only be one award as, as if there's one plaintiff. And actually, as I'm saying this out loud, we reached an agreement about what the verdict form will reflect. Um, so if your issue with this instruction is the last paragraph, we're willing to remove that. I do think the instruction as to the multiple claims is still relevant. Okay, so first, I think there's a typo in the first paragraph. Yeah. It should be based on two separate alleged breaches of the 2014 agreement. Not three. There's two separate breaches of the Oh, my version. I'm, I must have given you an outdated version. Yeah, so that's what says that on three. My, yes. Okay, and then so I, I wasn't aware that we did definitely. So we've stipulated to the seventy five. Yes, we, yes, we okay. took John out, out there. See, so the breaks do help, Judge. They actually would okay. resolve something. So in light of that, let me just reread this really sure. quick. All right. Um, typically, this instruction of multiple claims and numerous parties is usually given towards the end. Okay. Um, but we'll put this in there in some form at some point. Uh, and it usually just, I think the standard is in your deliberations you will consider and decide several distinct claims. It usually goes right to the third paragraph. Although these claims have been tried together, each is separate from the other, and you must separately consider each alleged claim. So the defendants have stipulated to the, that, that we're going to reach some written stipulation that, this, that whatever the verdict is, I wasn't told. Okay. The I, verdict form will not reflect what the what I what I believe the stipulation is. The verdict form will not ask the jury to make any sort of split if they award a damages amount. They will award if there's a damages amount, they will award one amount separately. The judgment will divide. The judgment. Yeah, divide wait, 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 can I? Because I've I've negotiated this with them. <laughs> the judgment. What we've agreed to is the judgment will be seventy five percent to strong arm productions and Florida jointly and 25% to D3M.
but the verdict form, so the jury doesn't have to worry about this, and there's no double recovery, we'll have all three of them <coughs> together. Yep. We'll ask for a collective damages exactly. award. Exactly. So no, the that's the easiest way. Stipulation for that. Oh, this no, is that this is, that is stipulation. stipulation right now. Okay. okay. Everybody agree? Agree. All right. All right. So I just have to figure yes. out where to put this in, though, because this is a, it's a pattern. And in response to your proposal, Your Honor, I'm fine with skipping that second. First line going straight to the third. Agreed. And that would eliminate the, type, the potential typo. I mean, the typo, I guess, the potential for revision. So I think you just need to say this. Yeah, in your I deliberations, agree. you will consider and decide several distinct claims. Although these claims have been tried together, each is separate from the other, and you must separately consider each alleged claim of breach. Therefore, in your deliberations, you should consider the evidence as it relates to each claim of breach separately as you would had each claim been tried before you separately. And then we don't need that last paragraph, right? Or do you want... Do you even want the last paragraph? Or do you want that? Yeah, we could... I, I, we don't need it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. And then I'm not sure yet, yet where that's going to go. I need to look that up or... All right. So after that, I have uh, defendants proposed jury instruction number 28. Uh, well, before we get to there, we have... Oh, here we go. Um, two other instructions. One is the um, force... 416.2 third-party beneficiary instructions. Let me bring that to your honor. Uh, One moment. You may not need that now, right? Yeah, I was just saying. Let me just take the motion. We object to it, so if what we stipulate is. Just hold one second. I might be yeah. withdrawing. Okay. Right, so. I agree, we don't need this because you're not going to object to the judgment to these parties, correct? Correct. We've agreed yes, to that. we don't need it. All right, maybe going back to the prior one, maybe you do want that last paragraph in there that says uh, there are also three plaintiffs in this case. If you end up finding that the plaintiffs have proven their case against Celsius for any one of the alleged breaches, you will not award damages to each plaintiff, but instead will award only a single amount of damages. In other words, you will award damages as if there were only one plaintiff. I, I did want that. In an abundance of caution, I think that's right. Okay, so yes, we'll leave so that in that. there and then take out then that I'm third party. This, okay, so you don't need that. Fine. Okay. And then do we already go by 416.44, which is the legal status of entities? Not yet. Okay. So that one, I think, needs to go probably before the affirmative defenses, doesn't it? Or is that later? Oh, wait. Um, I, I apologize. We may have done that. I think we already did so, it. Yeah. Where did you put that in? I didn't realize it was. Yeah, that's already in there. So the, the numbers are kind of going out of order. It's right after the interpretation, different interpretation. Okay. Yeah, we have that in the 416.4 okay. legal status of entities. All right, that's in there. And then comes maybe the multiple claims. All right. That we'll have to figure that out. All right. And so then you have this one's a duplicate. The next one, defendants proposed, says if you find that the plaintiffs have failed to prove any of their claims by the greater weight of the evidence, you won't consider the question of affirmative defense. If you find that the plaintiffs proved any of their claims, then you must determine whether Celsius has proven by the greater weight of the evidence an affirmative defense for that claim. Actually, that would go right here then, right? Now we're going to affirmative defenses, correct? Correct, yes, Your Honor. Okay, so that is fine. Yes. That's agreed, right? Yes. That's in yes. your agreed stack. Okay. Next up is affirmative defense. Okay, 416.32, uh, statute of limitations. That's agreed, correct? Agreed. Agreed. Then comes 416.24, possibly the breach of implied covenant of good faith. And this is where we have two other defenses, Your Honor. We have that statute of limitations intro, but there is a substantive statute of limitations defense. Um, counsel and I have been trying to work on coming to some agreement. I had an instruction. She had an instruction. I've worked off of her instruction and proposed some language change. Um, I've agreed to like 99% of her instruction, but I've You're referring to the fraudulent and concealment avoidance. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, so now we're into the avoidance. So let me ask you, affirmative defenses, there's just one statute of limitations? No. no there's, I'm sorry. Did there's I... waiver as well, but I don't know if we want to do we... statute of limitations. The avoidance is the statute of limitation. Okay. So I here's going to be my suggestion, all right? So I know you've agreed to 416.32 affirmative defense statute of limitations. Any additional 
um, language for avoidance should be part of this same instruction, because so this way it's clear that it's all part of the same affirmative defense of statute of limitations. Okay. All so right, so it has to be something that would start with in considering the affirmative defense of statute of limitations, boom, and then, and then whatever. The two or three, depending on what you rule, avoidances. Okay. All right, so that on none of that's agreed, right? Um, so we let's, uh, agree roll up that our they, here. we can include instructions on the avoidances of fraudulent concealment and waiver. The waiver instruction has been agreed to. Fraudulent right. concealment is in the works, and then pass both of those up. Okay. Let me see okay. them. Ms. Placencia and I worked on the waiver one last night, and we were able to reach an accommodation on that. Okay. Um, Let me see. Are those. you taking him the one I just gave you? The, the waiver one? The waiver one you yes. sent me, that's my I don't Yes. Know. Yes. And then are you giving him the handwritten one that I just gave you? That my handwritten changes? No, this is mine. The one over there. But I have not agreed. Right, but that's my only copy, so I need to give him my handwritten oh. changes. Okay. This is the avoidance of waiver the instruction okay. that Oh, this is a different affirmative defense. This comes after statute of limitations. This okay. is an avoidance to the statute of limitations. No, it's not. No, that's a this separate is just affirmative your, defense. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, no. Okay, so th this will come a little bit later. Okay, so what's the other one you have? Okay, this is avoidance to statute of limitations. Gotcha. Okay. That is where we are in our negotiations. I have not reviewed her handwritten changes. So, after affirmative defense, statute of limitations, you have two, maybe three avoidances, right? So the first is avoidance to statute of limitations, fraudulent concealment. The next one is avoidance to statute of limitations, equitable estoppel. And yes. then the last might be avoidance. It's behind Avoidance of, to statute of limitations, breach of implied covenant of good faith, and fair dealing, right? Yes. Where are we on the equitable estoppel? We, we, I'm trying to get you, if I agree to this in the way it is, will you work with me on the other one? Though? So I will to... always work with you. I just haven't had a chance to read what you suggest. <laughs> I'm doing it. I can promise I will work. I can promise I will agree, but I haven't read the, your handwritten pages. Yeah. Right. So do we have to explain what an avoidance is? I've never had an avoidance to an affirmative defense on uh, six years over here in the civil. We like to make things complicated, Judge. <laughs> so we have a claim and an affirmative defense to the claim, and now three avoidances to the affirmative defense to the client. Yeah, so All right, maybe and so how are we going to make sure that this jury understands what is going on? Yes. All right. We can agree on a general instruction on the function of an avoidance. We can look and see if there's a standard. There might be a standard for it. Let me there's look right now. Okay. Anything for so, avoidance. Yeah, I, I've never... That's what I think. It's kind of baked in, Your Honor, in the paragraph that kind of Somewhat, starts yeah. the, the defense, which we actually, okay. I think we agreed to that over the paragraph okay. so far. No, I yes. think if you take that language and you put it it's, like it says, an back in the original one, okay? So the, the original one says affirmative defense, statute of limitations. On the defense of statute of limitations, the issue for you to decide, uh, you probably need something here um, that. Celsius's first affirmative defense is statute of limitations. Some, or somewhere in a summary earlier, there's got to be something that says um, the defendant has asserted two, I guess it's two affirmative defenses, right? Correct. Yeah, so something, yeah, that's first where I thought earlier defense. there needed to be a summary of some sort. But uh, okay. anyway, so, so you have... We've now got affirmative defenses. We need to tell them there's two affirmative defenses. Okay. The first is statute of limitations. The second is waiver. Right. And so then we, um, okay. 
Do you want it as, as a separate page? Or do you care? You could do it as a separate page, probably. Okay. All right. And then we turn the page, and then it would be affirmative defense, statute of limitations. All right? Okay. And it would okay. say, on the defense of statute of limitations, the issue for you to decide in connection with the plaintiff's claim for breach of the 2014 agreement. Sorry. So it's only as to the 2014 agreement only, right? Yes, statute of yes. limitations, correct. Okay, so we can even say that. Uh, in connection with the plaintiff's claim for breach of the 2014 agreement only. All right, you want to add that in there? Yes. Is whether plaintiffs filed their claims for breach of contract. How about instead of, um, Pardon me? Instead of filed these claims for breach of contract within the time set by law. To establish this defense, defendant Celsius must prove that any breach of contract, do you want to just say for the 2014 agreement? For the 2014 agreement. Uh, the 2014, if one in fact occurred, occurred before May 4th, 2016, which is five years before the claim was filed. And this is a standard instruction, Your Honor. Okay, and then you can say, however, You must consider plaintiffs have asserted to avoid this appropriate Yeah. All right. So, however, the plaintiffs have asserted <coughs> three separate avoidances. Yep. And it would be basically um, allowing the plaintiffs to file these claims after May 4th, 2016. Right? Something to that effect? That's what the purpose is. And then is. put colon, put one. Fraudulent concealment. Two. What is it? Um, equitable estoppel. And the breach of the good faith and care law. And then, and three, maybe, breach of implied covenant, right? Yes. Okay. So this way they understand what's going on. All right? Yes, sir. So then we have avoidance, statute of limitation, fraudulent concealment. All right, with these changes, is it agreed or is, is there something? I have not had a chance to review the changes. Okay, do you want to come up and now the second one, avoidance, statute of limitations, equitable stop, well, that's agreed, correct? Well, it depends on my position as to. I'm All right, trying take to... a look at these two. Okay. Because we, me... we had completely different ones, Your Honor, that we had proposed. And so I'm trying to be as. Accommodating as possible. This one? It's <laughs> All right, while, while she's looking at that, let me ask you, um, this third asserted avoidance mm -hmm. of breach of implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing, what would constitute breach of implied covenant of good faith and fair, fair dealing that's not already encompassed by either of the other two avoidances of uh, fraudulent concealment or uh, equitable estoppel. I mean, isn't that the same thing? It's the same. Well, if you look at the elements of the um, equitable estoppel, for example, Your Honor, there's other things that that are involved there that we have, that they have to show. 
All right, so, I don't have it, so... Uh, oh. um, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're actually different okay. elements to each one. And so okay, but I'm elements, looking at the elements for breach of implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing. It says here, one, plaintiffs and defendant entered into the contract. That's not an issue. Two, plaintiffs did all or substantially all of the significant things that the contract required them to do. Three, all conditions required for defendant's performance had occurred. Four, defendant's conduct was not consistent with the party's reasonable expectations under the compensation provisions of the 2014 and 2016 endorsement agreements. It would only be the 2014, right? right? Uh, yes, you're right. Okay. Agreement. And five, plaintiffs were damaged by defendant's conduct. Right. It's really the element number four is where this, this defense really focuses. And if I had the cases, I could read you the examples and when they've used this, and I just didn't bring it. All right, it. but it would, it wouldn't that be the same as that? Like, I'd have to look at the equitable estoppel instruction, but isn't that going to be encompassed in the equitable one? The equitable estoppel, estoppel one says that you engaged in conduct with an intent to cause plaintiffs not to commence a lawsuit. That it's much more specific. So I don't have to show that in, in a breach of good faith and fair dealing. And then number five is that the reliance on the conduct actually caused plaintiffs not to commence the lawsuit before the statute of limitations expired. This is a lot stronger than the language of the law that I have in my cases. That's why, but I'm willing to let them use some of this very, this is extremely narrow. So I'm trying, that's why I'm trying to work with them. The cases that we have on equitable stop do not require these big. This is very, very specific. But again, I'm trying to be as accommodating as possible so that we don't have issues in the future. But it is very different than All right. the Well, the let me go step by step here. Let me go back to um, avoidance for um, fraudulent concealment. Is that instruction acceptable? N no. We can. I will agree to this change. I will agree to this change. I will agree to this change. We have to instruct the jury what the duty to disclose. That's a legal term. We have to instruct them on where a duty to disclose arises. That's one of the elements. Where, where, so you're so saying number two, where it says defendants owed a duty to disclose material facts to defendants? Yes, that is why this paragraph that starts a defendant has a duty to disclose material facts only where. That's why that paragraph. Only is where there's a fiduciary relationship. Yes, of course. And a settled law. One minute, Your Honor. Let me ask you, isn't there a fiduciary relationship between... Not where parties are at arm's length, Your Honor. Okay. They're contracting parties at arm's length. Your Honor, if I may add one thing on the breach of implied duty. Um, hang on one second. They're talking. Um, let me think about that. Uh, I thought... Uh, you can't use a jury answer duty to disclose without telling them what a duty to disclose. That's another issue. You see, there's no express term. No, the breach of understanding the breaches. So, Your Honor, we, we, we object to this language that's requiring a fiduciary relationship. As you've heard the evidence, they have. this is a contract. They have the, do, they have the, the data. So that there was no. All right, my understanding is, though, I, I, again, I haven't researched this. I, I'm getting a little bit outside the box. My understanding is, if even if it's an arm's length transaction, if one party has part of a part of an agreement, is required to provide or like account for things and things of that nature, that it creates a fiduciary duty to provide. Your Honor, that's precisely the issue with this instruction and the breach of implied duty of good faith. There is no express provision in the contract that required any sort of accounting or information, um, provision of information obligation. That's, that's what I wanted to mention about the breach of implied duty. The breach of implied duty has to be tied to a specific obligation. They're saying we acted in bad faith because we didn't provide this information. There is no express term that required us to provide information. That is the second reason that avoidance is legally deficient. But no, there's no fiduciary duty based on our obligation to provide information because we did not have a contractual obligation to provide information. That is why they have to find that there was a duty to disclose under other circumstances, i.e. a fiduciary relationship. But isn't that, I mean, the heading is implied, co oh, this is, I'm sorry, this is under equitable estoppel, right? No, this is under proxy concealment. concealment, correct. Okay. So, right. Your Honor, again, the contract, they only have the data. The contract requires them to issue the shares immediately when you reach the benchmarks. They have a duty to 
to do what they need but to do. But that would be an implied duty, right? It's not a... That's the implied duty of good faith and fair dealing. Okay, I understand but, that. But, so we're not on this one now. Saying, You're looking at the fraudulent concealment but, one. Number right? two says defendant owed a duty to disclose the material fact to the plaintiffs. We'll agree that that, that is what we have to prove. They owed a duty. Okay. Now they want us to heighten that duty to a fiduciary duty. That is not the law. We do not have to show that there was a fiduciary duty. We just have to show there was a duty. A fiduciary duty, Your Honor, knows, as, is a lot higher of a level. That's not what the case law says. Your Honor, yes. And I'm going to cite a case. This is the Beresford um, versus Jack Edward Corporation. It's a fourth DCA case, 667 Southern 2nd, 809. Is there a high-level portion here? This particular case specifically addresses when you're using an affirmative defense. Hang on. Do you have copies? Yes, or really do you want to put that on the screen for everybody? Or? Uh, she gave, we gave her a copy. Point me to where you're reading, because my version wasn't highlighted. I didn't give the judge a highlighted version either. No, no. I know what it is, but I can follow along. Okay. This is the very square case? Yeah, there's one around here. Maybe it's this one. I gave it, I gave it to the judge. What's the thing? Beresford. Right here, right here. Okay. So, this is the, yes. So this is on the third page of the printout, Ms. Castro, on the left column. In order to establish fraudulent concealment sufficient to toll the statute, the plaintiff must show both successful concealment of the cause of action and fraudulent means to achieve that concealment. And this is a med mal case, Your Honor. This is a fiduciary <laughs> obligation case. And it says that the, the party has to have exercised reasonable care in learning the facts, knowledge of the information contained in excessive medical reputation. So this is a med mal case. This is not you have to show that there's a fiduciary duty. And this is a fourth DCA case. This our instruction that we crafted is follows these binding cases. You're I'm right. willing to I'm willing to try to accommodate, but I can't agree to heighten the duty to disclose to a fiduciary duty. Your Honor, if I may, a med mal case is not an arms length transaction case. We have a commercial transaction here. There are parties on opposite sides. There has to be a duty to disclose. We are not trying to heighten that duty. We are simply trying to define that duty so that the jury knows when a duty to disclose exists. Otherwise, they're reading this legal term of art without knowing what it means. Duty to disclose is a legal term. We are not heightening that duty. We are simply defining it. Okay, Your Honor, let me send you another case. Westbrook Partners. This is an insurance. Okay. This one is 163 Southern 2nd, 635. This one is even better. This one has like elements on it. 163 Southern 3rd, 635. Can you put that at one? Find the one that has elements on it. Alright, good. I'm going to do it right now. I just sent it. When you're ready, you want to have another case to cite to you. Yeah. As you are. Anything here for a of 
could put that underneath there. You're talking about in the standards? Yeah. Yeah, this is all. This is all case law, right? Yep. Case law here. Um, and I can give you another one, this Westbrook. Uh, versus Commonwealth. Your Honor, our proposed instruction has all of our sources. We can give you a clean version. And 163 Southern 2nd, 635. You can take your time reading them. Yeah, I need to have this done. And this particular one says, Your Honor, um, fraudulent concealment focuses on subsequent actions to keep the improper conduct shrouded. Here's Westbrook. I got to find my counsel, Westbrook. Did you get a copy? Yeah. Nope. I didn't. Is that what you say, Christine? Yeah, Westbrook. Westbrook. Yeah. I like the last thing. And I want the court. It does. Yeah, it does look different. Here, I have a question. That's this one. Oh, no, because it's so bad. There's no more. Yeah, I can have that. I'm going to take this one. Okay. Did they already file it? No. Give them a tab or something. Here, put it down. Last bit, correct? Yeah. Your Honor, may I approach? What is this for? This is a Westbrook. Your Honor, may I give you my cases as well? All right. Uh... So, Your Honor, what I was trying to tell you is that this particular case says fraudulent okay. concealment will be used to toll the statute of limitations to wit plaintiff must show both successful concealment of the cause of action and fraudulent means to achieve that concealment. Even if, and then they go into when the whole thing about case, due diligence. Now you're talking about Westbrook now, right? Yes, and this is an insurance case. Again, this is these are these are. And this was a situation where um, there was a. Uh, I can give you the more facts if you want, but basically, it was a um, real estate transaction went bad. Developers suing each other, and it's Westbrook Partners versus their title insurance company. So these are commercial cases where there's a business deal, someone raises statute of limitations, and they came back and said there was fraudulent concealment. Now, they lost on the fraudulent concealment. They found that there wasn't fraudulent concealment sufficient to do that, but that's for the jury to decide, for the fact finder to decide. So in any event, Your Honor, uh, our position is, is that right hiking this to fiduciary obligation pursuant to cases where Fraudulent concealment was an affirmative lawsuit. No, it's very. My different. first case it was an hang avoidance. On, hang on. And I had in that. All right, I've I've read through that. Um, Your Honor, may I respond so to this? So this is Westbrook's evil in a second. All right, we can't go back and forth, back and forth. All right. Um, so we have statute limitations. That's agreed. Now we're trying to do avoidance statute limitations because of uh, now we're doing. Fraudulent concealment is right now, correct? Yes. All right. And, uh, and in fact, Your Honor, in their jury instruction, okay. they cite Westbrook, which is our case. Uh, I'm sorry. Do you give me back the uh, instruction, or do you still have that? Which one do you want? Her, um, Christina's marked up version. The one with my handwritten changes? Is it that Mm -hmm. It's this one, isn't it? Oh, yes. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out where we're at here. Okay. I have to adjust my <laughs> All right, so at the beginning, so you all agree to most of this. So it starts out, an avoidance to defend and statute of limitations defense is the doctrine of fraudulent concealment. Concealment. You will only consider fraudulent concealment avoidance if you find that the defendant proved its statute of limitations defense. If you find that defendant engaged in fraudulent concealment, then defendant's statute of limitations defense cannot succeed. To establish fraudulent concealment, plaintiffs must prove all of the following by the greater weight of the evidence. One, 
After defendant allegedly breached the 2014 agreement, defendant concealed a material fact concerning its breach from plaintiffs. Two, defendant owed a duty to disclose that material fact to plaintiffs. Three, defendant knew the material fact would have, should have been disclosed to plaintiffs. All of that's agreed so far, correct? Correct. Then you get correct. to the next one. Defendant intended to prevent plaintiffs from becoming apprised of material facts before the statute of limitations expired. I have, I will agree to that now. Okay. And five plaintiffs detrimentally relied on the concealed material fact. And then six plaintiffs exercised reasonable care and diligence in seeking to discover the facts that form the basis of the claim. So all of that's agreed, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. So then we go fraudulent concealment goes beyond a defendant's mere non-disclosure of a fact. It must constitute active and willful concealment of a material fact where the plaintiffs did not have the equal opportunity to become apprised of the fact. That's all agreed, correct? Yes. Yes. And then fraudulent concealment stops the running of the statute of limitations only for the time between the date of concealment and the date of plaintiff's discovery. That's agreed, correct? Yes, however, I did not agree to the paragraph above that was stricken. Okay, so you want in there, a defendant has a duty to disclose material facts to the plaintiffs only where there is a fiduciary relationship between the parties. Where parties are dealing at arm's length, there is no fiduciary relationship and as a result, no duty to disclose. Generally, parties in a business transaction deal with each, uh, with, deal with each other at arm's length. Correct, Your Honor, right. that's important that because from? of element number two, defendant owed a duty to disclose that Okay, and fact. where does that language come from? You said you have a statute or a case. Well, I, I gave you cases on the elements of fraudulent concealment generally. I don't know if any of those define the duty to disclose. I would have to identify which of the cases. Okay, you want this cases. extra language in there. To define element number two. Okay. Owed a duty to disclose. Otherwise, the jury's not going to know the circumstances under which there's a duty to disclose. Fraudulent concealment has an element of fraud. We all know that fraud requires either an affirmative false statement or you concealed something that you had a duty to disclose. Correct. So how is that not commenting on the weight of the evidence, I guess? Um, isn't that something you would argue to the jury? No, Your Honor, it's a legal principle. They say, hey, we had no duty to, the, to do this. That's what you're going to argue to the I'm jury. Sorry? But that's what you're going to argue to the jury. We're going to argue there was no fiduciary duty. We're not Correct. Gonna... And right, so how is that not a factual argument? So as a matter of law, you want me to instruct the jury, as a matter of law, the defendant had no duty, so why wouldn't I just grant summary judgment? That, I mean, I grant directed verdict at this point. No, I'm, I don't want you to instruct the jury defendants had no duty. If we want to take out the last, if you think the last sentence of that paragraph is somehow factual, but what a duty, where a duty to disclose arises is a purely legal issue. That is not a factual issue. Now, is there a fiduciary relationship? That's the factual issue. That a duty to disclose exists only where there is a fiduciary relationship? That is a legal principle. Your Honor, it is factual. Your Honor, it is Friedman versus Hang American Party. So give Party. me a case that says that I'm going to basically instruct the jury that there is no fiduciary relationship in this case because there's a contract. But I'm not, asking, I'm not asking you to instruct the jury here, that statement. Has a duty. It says here, parties in a business transaction deal with each other at arm's length. And right before it, it says when parties are dealing at arm's length, there's no fiduciary relationship. So basically, you want me to instruct them that there's no fiduciary relationship, right? My main concern is that first sentence. That needs to be instructed, that there's a fiduciary relationship. Okay, and then you all argue whether there's a fiduciary relationship or not. Any objection with Christian? Just the first sentence. It says a defendant has a duty to disclose material facts only where there is a fiduciary relationship. We, that only is objectionable That's to us. That's not the only. Where there is a fiduciary relationship. That is the between. circumstance that applies in this second. case. That is why okay. the word only is there. There's the no duty, other circumstance. The duty is under the contract here, Your Honor. They have to interpret the language of the contract. So we shouldn't have to prove whether or not there's a fiduciary relationship. If you want to say... Can a duty can arise when there's a fiduciary relationship, but it doesn't have to be a fiduciary relationship. Your Honor, there is no issue in this case about a duty under the contract to give information. There is no breach for that duty to give information. That is not the claim. The so, claim is for breach of the compensation provisions. There is no express obligation. They cannot represent there is an express obligation under the contract correct, but when to there's... give information. <laughs> 
when there are, are certain accounting or uh, things of that nature that are part of a contract and one party only has access to it and the other doesn't, there is some sort of fiduciary Accounting duty. is not part of this contract. I, I understand that, but it's, it's kind of analogous, though, when you have a benchmark that has to to determine whether it's been arrived at or not arrived at, um, one party is in, ex is in exclusive possession of that information. Now, whether you had to turn it over or didn't, I mean, that's kind of to argue to the jury and whether you did or didn't. It sounds like you've already disclosed it by uh, the conversations, and that's what you're going to argue. Look, I told them they didn't meet it, and, and it kind of goes back. Almost everything goes back to the initial issue that the jury has to decide anyway, and that's whether or not um, there even was a breach. Like there, and so, I mean, that initial question is going to be whether that uh, one million threshold was met or the six hundred ninety thousand units were met. It depends on how they define that. Correct. And so, um, Your Honor, our position <clears throat> remains where there's no express contractual duty. You could only find a duty to disclose in circumstances that are present in this case if there's a fiduciary relationship. That's a settled principle of law. We think right. the jury should I'm be instructed on it, but we respect your honor. Right. But I'm going to change it to a defendant has a duty to disclose material facts to the plaintiff, or may have a duty. The defendant may have a duty to disclose material facts to the plaintiff where there is a fiduciary, where there is a fiduciary duty or fiduciary relationship between the parties. And you can argue whether there's not, and it's a may. Understood. All right. And, the rest and then everything else would be out. All right. Of Otherwise, that paragraph, correct? Yes. We're referring to that. Okay. Case. So that takes care of fraudulent concealment. Now you have equitable stop loan. What is the issue on this one? You said there was one line. Uh, I think it was Ms. Pearson, right? You um, said there was one element. Line. There's nothing marked up on this one here. Yeah. Did I leave one mark marked up on that? No. I think you had said you were okay with it if I worked with you on the fraudulent concealment. Yeah. All right. And then, yes, that's fine, Your Honor. And then you have implied. So you have a case that says you can have an avoidance of statute limitations based on breach of implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing? Um, yes, and it, I might even actually work to waiver too. I need to go back and, and check, but I need to look and see if this is an avoidance to both um, a waiver defense and. Uh, but I, I think it's just statute of limitations. It has to do with bad faith conduct. Yes, Your Honor. I, I'm just, I really apologize that I did not have it, but again, I'm, I didn't think we were arguing over this particular instruction. I thought it was agreed. I'm happy to review her case, Your Honor, and if in fact it says that, we will right, I'm going to hold objection. off on uh, So possibly there's going to be a third. Okay, so that's the only thing we may have to fix up then, right? Yes. So why don't I have... If it's going to be contested, it's not agreed, I need y'all here at 8.30 then on Tuesday. Okay. Okay? Just because I need to be able to make that rolling before and the hearing, so this way you can fix up the instructions, okay? Yes, Your Honor. Can I, can I just suggest, uh, if there's another reason why we may want to get here early if the court is willing at 8.30, which is, um, as you'll see, the verdict form, it may, it may be helpful for the parties to really hash it out this weekend. It's a very complicated issue, but you'll see in a minute. I'm going to go through it. I, yeah. We need to go through that tonight. Just so, okay. Okay, so there's still a few more instructions, Your Honor. No, then comes affirmative defense waiver. That's agreed. Yes. Okay. And then there's any any other instructions. I don't have anything else. There's here. there's 504.1. Okay, so there's no more to add in here. Okay, so then 504.1, introduction to contract damages. Agreed? It is. I'm going to qualify that, and it's my comments are relevant to both 504.1 and the immediately following one, 504.2. Breach of contract damages. Um, damages, and I've had discussions with the plaintiffs about this, um, and it's more of a concern than an objection, and I'll, I'm, you know, I'd, look, I'd like to see how the court right, this is the, handles, uh, but This is the pattern right here, and this is the starting point. Yes, <laughs> however, I think it depends on what we're going to have on the verdict form. With respect to damages for incentive compensation and bonus compensation, we're talking about the value of shares. Correct. If the jury is going to determine the value of shares, we propose an instruction on the value as of what date, right? Our position is the date of the breach. If the jury is not going to 
make that calculation as to the value, then they don't need to be instructed on what date to use the price. Okay, I'm not going. Uh I'm not going to give them a date because we will put on the verdict. No, form no, they're going to find the date, but of the breach. Correct, and that's on there, at least in our version. But in terms of how they can value the shares, it is a, I think, a pending legal issue as to is it the stock price on the date of the breach or some other date. I and believe you're on already allowed them to introduce evidence that they would have kept the stocks, and so that's still a factual question for the jury to decide. You can argue that. And so I, you can still argue that it's the date of the breach, to, but I'm not going to instruct them to either use the date of the breach or use today's date. Well, we maintain, Your Honor, as a matter of law, it has to be the date of the breach. I so that is that. our, that is our, we're, we're proposing that that be included. If right. Your Honor, I've already ruled otherwise, and uh, I'm going to issue an order on that in detail. To, you know, I, again, um, you start with, the, and again, this comes right out of the pattern instruction. It says compensatory damages is that amount of money which will put plaintiffs. In as good a position as they would have been if the defendant had not breached the contract, and which naturally result from the breach. And there's competing cases. I one said, in "Oh, that I'm not case, disputing the, the standard, Your Honor." And so, no. But if you look at that towards this contract, the contract was not for money. The contract was for shares. And I think it was for restricted shares. Is that correct? Yes. And yes. so, just by its nature, restricted shares, they couldn't have turned around and sold it for another six months at a minimum. Correct. And so I think it would be error for me to instruct them that it would be the date of the breach because they could not have even turned around and sold it on that date. They would have had to hold it for six months. And so there's evidence that's been presented that, that he would have kept it until now. And so, um, but you're going to argue that to the jury. I'm not going to instruct them to use the date of the breach. I'm not going to instruct them to use today. You're going to argue that to the jury. That being said, there will be a, uh, and I haven't looked to make sure that that's on there, but... Um, I know in one of the versions it is, what was the date of the breach? And um, they will check that. So if I'm wrong and the court of appeal says, no, you should have used the date of the breach, that's easy to recalculate. We're not going to have to come back here. I'm just preserving my argument on I that understand. legal principle. You know, that being said, I, you know, if, um, the other again, it was restricted. Are... So, I mean, you can argue date of the breach. If you want to argue six months from the date of the breach, if you want to argue today, again, that's you're arguing the facts. All right? Understood. Okay. And just one more issue on the damages instructions. As concerns the breach of the royalty provision in the 2016 agreement, we have at play a 500,000 advance royalty payment that yes. has to be taken into account. Okay. Um, the, I don't know if Your Honor prefers that to be an instruction or something we put on the verdict form to inform the jury. Once you determine whatever royalties are owed, if royalties are owed, you need to deduct that 500000 I don't think right. I think on. that is evidence, right? Yeah. That's all. It's that's, in the contract, and that's what the evidence is. If you all want to stipulate to it, that's fine, and it probably should be a stipulation. That being said, I'm not going to instruct them because um, it's not the, court, the role of the court to comment on the evidence, all right? That being said, you certainly would argue to the jury if the royalty calculation is whatever, it's you know, one point one million, you would argue that you know you have to subtract out the five hundred thousand you already received because that's what the contract says. And then you come up, some members of the jury, it would be this. And again, this is all assuming that they even find that there is a breach. Of course. So I, again, that's that's the evidence. That's what the facts are, and that's what you can argue. Obviously, if they come up, and, and again, you're going to have the evidence. You have schedules that are in there. If they give the whole amount without backing out the 500000 I could always fix that up um, post-verdict. Understood. Okay. So uh, um, that being said, if you all want to stipulate and put something in there, that's fine. Um, <coughs> but it would have to be a stipulated, a stipulation, not a uh, an instruction. Well, that's our position. To the okay. So then comes 601.1, weighing the evidence. Agreed? Yes. 601.2, believability of witnesses. Agreed? Yes. 601.5, concluding instruction before final argument. Agreed? Yes. Yes. And then you'll do your closing arguments. Um, I think we said 70, 75 minutes each or 90 minutes each? 90 minutes, Your Honor, but I, I work, I promise you, I will work this weekend. If I can lower it, we'll do it. I'll do it before we start. All right. And you wanted 75 and 15, right? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Warnings? Uh, five minutes. On the front end, how about on the back end? 30 seconds. No, no, uh, 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 15 minutes. I, you don't need to give me a warning on the 15. All right. Or, uh, one minute, one minute. One minute. And on the 90? Same. It's fine. Um, five minutes. Or 15, 10, five? For, oh, the warning? Yeah, for uh, one. Two minutes. 
two minute warning. All right. <laughs> All right, but you have 90 minutes. You get 90 minutes also. I, so you I'm not even going to come close to that, Judge. All right. So, uh, all right, and then we have section 700, closing instructions. And yes. uh, so that would be the final packet that will go back to the jury. Uh, the 800 ones, all these things, that's only if something comes up from the jury that we would go to those. Okay, so that's going to be our final. Anyway. The 800 ones were all agreed. So you have to go to those or all stay in Oh, no, I understand that. Yeah, okay. but it a lot depends on what the question is or things like that. So, okay. all right, so here's the. Um, before I go to the verdict form, I just want to clarify. So, first of all, we have the instruction on multiple claims, numerous parties. Um, and so, that is typically... I'm trying to find out where would that... I put it in right after legal status of entities is where I put it in, in the order. I'm not sure if that's what you want to have. Yeah, let me see. It usually has a number. It doesn't have a number here. Oh, wait, that's 601.4. So it's yes. part of the 600 instructions. Okay. So that would probably come later then. You want me to move it back? Yeah. Okay. So it's after, it's going to be after damages. So you got 601.1 is weighing the evidence. Then you have 601.2, believability of witnesses, and then you would put it right here before we do the 601.5 concluding instruction, because it is a 601.5. <coughs> All right? Okay. For it. whatever reason, the Florida Supreme Court, when they issued their standards, felt like that's where it should go. All right? So then the only instruction I think that still needs to be ironed out is uh, again not the instruction on such limitations you're going to put a little blurb in there about the three avoidances then you have avoidance to statute of limitation of fraudulent concealment that one's now resolved i've already ruled next is avoidance statute of limitations equitable estoppel i think that's good but you're still going to double check and then the last one is breach of implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing you all are going to look at it if hopefully it will be agreed and we fixed. If not, I'll see you at 8.30 to go over that. That's the only one that's still outstanding, correct? Correct. And if All right. you, know, you can send me that case, I'll look at it and then we'll... Okay. All right. We're rolling, except it's uh, almost 5 o'clock on a Friday. And by the way, it is Friday the 13th. Nobody has mentioned that yet oh. today. <laughs> All right. Yeah, okay. So here we go. Um, verdict form. Anyone want to give me one to work off of? Yeah, I, I'm going to give you two versions. The one I gave to the defense is the form, plaintiff's one, or I got just sort of one on it. The second one, I just took out the first two uh, questions from each claim. The defendant doesn't seem to be disputing them, but heck, the form does. Uh, standard. The standard, sorry, verdict form does include the first two questions. Defense. I don't seem to have a copy of yours. John, this is our proposed verdict from now on. Um, receiving, I have a size. Right. I need to add some, based on your reading today, on damages. The jury Can I see the Yeah, you have it. It's the same one I need. I have another copy. I have it? It's okay, I have another copy. No worries. So, there's two versions. There's two versions. All right. Um, Y'all are nowhere close, so. All right. I, I don't mean to interrupt the court while you're reading, but can I hand you the standard uh, verdict form, too? Okay. Your Honor, we obviously want a special verdict form, so I'm not sure the standard is going to be instructed. We have a lot of issues of contract interpretation that need to be um, found. Okay. 
I, I think I handed you the wrong one. I This is just generic. Uh, I'm not sure it gives them much guidance here. But the question is whether the defense is too detailed. But it, that's really the issue in the case. As long as you all stipulate that if those things are proved, that there was a breach. Does that make sense? I'm sorry, Your Honor. So, in other words, my first question here is. Did the plaintiffs prove that co-branded revenues mean revenues from all Celsius products, including products that do not have the Flow Fusion brand on the packaging? That's, that's not even our case. Uh, that's not what I'm going to argue in closing. Okay. That, that, what was that whole And then did the plaintiffs Flo prove that the term... No, no, they can't point? just find if there's a breach. There are so many um, moving parts and so many permeations of how you... Well, they, at least they broke it out here, and so we broke it out in the instructions, so the jury will know that. So your first claim is is breach of 2014 agreement. And yes, so, Your Honor, but depending on how they interpret co-branded and the term, it, it, it's almost like a Punnett square, right? If you interpret co-branded one way but term another way, you get one result. If you interpret co-branded one way, correct. it's we need to know what they find on these factual issues in the case. The, Otherwise, there's no way to substantiate a finding of a breach. We don't have to substantiate. Excuse me. One no, person that's not, that's not the, court the court doesn't want this coming back for a trial. No, there is the, no... Oh, I apologize, Your Honor. This is why we did our verdict form the way we did, per the court's guidance. All right, but I think the... You probably have the questions flip-flop, though. You know, did the plaintiffs... I, I think the second question probably needs to be asked first, right? Did the plaintiffs prove that the terms of the 2014 agreement was extended by the 2016 agreement, or I, I don't know if it would be. They're, in, they're really independent, but I'm fine switching the order. What, what question are you talking about, Your Honor? Second question. Let me ask, if the 2014 agreement was ended and the 2016 was not either an extension or a or incorporation of the 20, you know, incorporated the 2014 agreement, I think you lose on the co-branded revenue, right? Or no? No. But no you'd have that, your, well, then we'll go to your alternative theory. Right. We have, we have alternatives. So you'd have to, so those two questions, I, I'm not saying the phrase, how you'd want to phrase, but those two questions, the first two questions are, kind of capture the two different theories, correct? No. I, the second question that I have is, did all of the conditions that were required for defendant Celsius holding Inc. He's performance? reading off of our version. Our second question. That's not yours? No, that's yours. Oh, did the plaintiffs prove that the term of the 2014 agreement was extended? What, so, Your Honor, there is no way for the jury to fill out this verdict form and not be inconsistent. Right? They're... they're, they're if you think of any kind of case that the court tries, you can't ask all the different things that the jury's got to determine. We're just finding if there was a duty that was breached. 
And so we tried to be more specific based on the form, but you know, all these are specifically written so that council can uh, have exclude certain of my theories <laughs> based on the verdict form before I've even had, got a chance to do closing argument. If I may, Your Honor, so part of the problem is that, as, as you've pointed out, because there are so many sort of sub-elements, um, we need to address them all in this verdict form or the jury could make a ruling that on appeal, the court's going to say, well, I'm not sure if they found a breach because they thought the term was extended or because they thought co-branded revenues was was everything. Because the, the plaintiffs have proposed two alternative theories. One, through their expert, which was, if the term is extended, that $1 million revenue benchmark is met in February of 2018. Their alternative theory is, well, it's still met within that two-year time period because co-branded revenues means everything, not just the co-branded product, right? So we have to have, you know, an, anything else is going to violate the tuition rule because we have to specify which, both co-branded revenues and the term. And there's a recent 30 CA case on this, and I know it's Royal Caribbean versus Spearman, Your Honor. Um, it came out in the 30 CA in 2022. I don't have the site in my head, but I do know it's Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines versus Lisa Spearman because I argued that one on appeal, and I wasn't happy with the ruling, and that's what it is. It's the two-issue rule, and basically when you have multiple alternative theories under a single count, they have to be laid out. Yeah, we're definitely doing that. You already have them laid out. You have, whether you have it as A and B or they have it as uh, just heading, we definitely have the basically the 250000 share bonus compensation provision and the 500000 Share bonus. But there's multiple theories within. Correct. Each I understand of those that. Breaches. And so that's broken out for sure. Then you have. This is going to be a long night if uh, we're going to ever get a verdict form here. Um, and so, all right, the 250,000 one's more difficult, but the 500,000 one is a little bit easier, right? Because the first question there should be. Basically, did the plaintiff prove that uh, a unit is a step, right? But, but your, your Honor, the question is, did we <coughs> prove that more than 690,000 units were sold? Yeah. Right? That's, that's really the question. Once we start getting into the, de the more detailed of the evidence, I, I don't know how that's going to affect, um, um, you know, there were tubs, some of them were tubs. Right. This but that's the ultimate question because even under your unit benchmark, remember if it they have to decide whether a unit is an individual stick or not, because if it's not an individual stick, you don't meet that benchmark before the new agreement is entered into, which means they also have to they also have to make that determination whether the the benchmark survived. The, that merger and integration clause of the 2016 agreement. I understand so that. If they, if they do establish, though, that a unit is a tub or a stick and not a, a box, then they would have met it during the 2014 period, right? If they decide, right, but we need, but if, what if they decide, we, we need to have the alternative, because what if they decide, no, the unit is the tub plus a box, in or which box, case yeah. it's not met, and the only way it's met is if yeah, that right. encompasses their alternative. But that, yeah. that's why a jury instruction. I apologize. But that's why we Please have finish. a detailed verdict form. But, but that, listen, and I, I understand this is not, that's part of the problem with this case and the nuances. And we're just trying to capture all of those sub elements because they're all required. But we're going to be right back here after a deal. Well, not necessarily. But uh, I want to make sure that we're not back here. <laughs> all right. So, it's kind of
it just your honor, the problem is that also whether it's a unit and whether it extends beyond the 2016 agreement also establishes the date of the breach for purposes of damages. So we really do need both parts. So, Your Honor, I think what counsel just said is very important, right? There, what this verdict form re contains is all sorts of tripwires so that if the jury says this year and that there, we have an inconsistent verdict. And I don't think the verdict form should be a trap for the jury. Your Honor, if, right, but, when you uh, have a moment to carefully read our verdict form, we took great pains to guide the jury to avoid inconsistency. We even refer them back to answers to prior questions to remind them. This is not intended to be a tripwire. On the contrary, this is intended to capture all of your theories and give them specific and clear guidance. just make this easier and just uh, use the contract language, right? The, the, the problem, Your Honor, is when I'm going to argue, I think I have the police in the slow up fact, there's six or seven provisions of the contract that are, that are important to interpreting this, and so they've picked the, the quotes from the, the contract that they're going to use in their closing argument, but not the ones... So why can't we just say this here, all okay. right? Um, Um, did the plaintiff prove by the greater weight of the evidence that Celsius achieved $1 million in gross cumulative co-branded revenues in any 12-month period during the term? Period end. Um. I mean, that, that's the first argument, right? You're saying they breached that provision because you've established that the that Celsius achieved one million dollars in gross cumulative co-branded revenues in any 12-month period during the term yeah and you all get to argue <coughs> what is that's evidence and you all argue what is gross cumulative co-branded revenue that, that's and, probably um, a good question your honor right now and I'm sorry it's late but that, that's a good example. Council has brought in all sorts of emails and other things uh, for what the contract means and what Celsius had agreed to do. Um, and in fact, the board of director meeting minutes uh, says that, um, that it says that language a little bit differently. Now, if the jury wants to interpret the contract just based on the contract, that's great, but I also want to argue in closing, if you're going to start looking at all the evidence that council brought in, you have to look at the evidence that helps them and also that helps us. And the language in the board of directors, that what they actually approved is slightly different than that. But that's not the contract. This, again, that, we're all bound by a contract that was signed by both parties. All right? Look, I agree with that. And uh, so, so if you don't prove that... Um, again, quote-unquote, or that Celsius, quote-unquote, achieves $1 million in gross cumulative co-branded revenues in any 12-month period during the term, close quote, you lose, right? Even if the board said something different. And well, vice versa, if you prove it, you win, even if the board said something different. It doesn't matter what the board said. It doesn't matter what it... All the other stuff is to interpret what is meant by gross cumulative co-branded revenue and what is... Um, meant to constitute the 12 month period during the term. Correct? Yeah, I, I agree. That's my position. Um, and I, I think it sounds like it's the court's position. I don't know what they're going to argue in closing tomorrow. They certainly put in a lot of evidence different than that. But uh, so, I mean, assuming that, that they don't make so those let me arguments. Ask from the defense, any objection to just saying that? Okay. Did the plaintiffs prove by the greater, by way, greater way the evidence that? You can even say that there was a breach of the contract because well, the defendant achieved, and then you could put in quotes, $1 million in gross cumulative co-branded revenues in any 12-month period during the term. Close quote. And, Your Honor, that's fine to start there, but I do think there needs to be, because there were two theories, they need to explain, is it because you found that the term was extended, 
or because you found that co-branded revenues. Because that way, if this gets sent back, we know, you know, maybe they, they say, we don't think that co-branded revenues means everything, right? But we think the term was extended, and then you know what, what the remaining issue is. Right. Okay, so I'll agree to that. Maybe we can agree. I'll agree to the courts if you'll agree to the courts. In other words, uh, I'll, I'll agree to the language just the way the court read it. Um, you're actually not entitled to know the juries, uh, in my opinion, why they came to their verdict. Oh, I, I read Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines versus. Well, Stephen I can't I, do that because. Can, well, can I read it? No, I don't. I, I literally. Yeah, I hang said on, it. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. So uh, this is what I'd like to do. I'd like that to be the first question. All right, okay. and then if you want to put two other questions underneath about, um, do you find that? And you could do that even. We can do that after both. You know. Both the two hundred fifty thousand provision and the five hundred thousand provision, we can ask another question. Right. Just a separate question for the jury. Do you find that the twenty fourteen agreement, um, the terms, the terms were extended by the twenty sixteen agreement? I I'll, I can probably I'll probably agree to that depending on the exact language as long as there's not you know I don't want to create the potential for any inconsistency. I understand that, but it's a very complicated verdict form, no matter what. No, I, but I think we can make it a lot more simple that way. So, so this is going to be question one. We're just going to quote the contract. Can you repeat that one more time, Your Honor? So it's just going to be: Did the plaintiffs prove that? By the grade, you want to say by the greater weight, or just the contract? If you want to put by the greater weight of the evidence, but no, I, I, I don't think you need said. to because it's plaintiffs proven, okay. and that's all already been. Okay. And you don't. Yeah, we're fine with that. That's okay, so did the plaintiffs prove that Celsius? <coughs> and then you can even quote it if you want. It's or achieved one million dollars in gross cumulative co-branded revenues in any twelve-month period during the term. Question mark. Yes or no? Okay. All right. Okay. And that's fine with the defense. Because it's all under the 2014 agreement. Yes. Sir. Okay. And then the two sub questions. Well, the sub question is going to be after all of them. Okay. After. As far as the extension part, that's going to be after, okay? Because then it's going to say if the answer to question one is yes, then you need to answer the next one's going to be on what date. So if it's yes, then it'll be on what date. Uh, the Celsius earn one million. Yeah. Okay. No. No, that I object to asking the date. The question is, was it during the initial term? Correct. If they yes. say yes, then I am going to ask on what date. Why? For purposes of the, that would be the date of the breach. I disagree, and I don't think the evidence supports that, and I'm going to argue that in closing. That's why I think we have to ask, what was the date of the breach? We are asking what was the date of the breach. Okay. So we have an agreement. What was the okay. date of the breach? No, 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 no. Asking when did Celsius achieve one million is asking what is the date of the breach. You're saying they're two in different your, things. In your opinion, based on the evidence, in, I disagree. How would it be anything so other confused. than that date? So once they reach that and they didn't then issue the stocks, that would be the date of the breach, right? Or how would it be a date? Or is there something in the contract that says you're supposed to wait a certain amount of time? They, they, they can't issue the stock uh, until D3M directs them how to issue it. Oh. But you yourself got asked to they can't that issue. They can't be in breach until they've been directed to issue the stock. Your Honor, that's a... It's, it's right in the contract. the contract. It's right in the contract. So then what's still, what's the objection saying? On what date did they reach? I have no objection to that. Okay. I absolutely agree. I just don't want to foreclose my closing argument on the date of the breach. No, I understand. That's not the question I propose, though. Okay. I have no objection. I agree, okay. in fact, that we must ask the date of the breach. 
but the day of the breach is the day that the obligation becomes due. And the day that the obligation becomes due is when that $1 million in gross cumulative co branded revenues is achieved. You can argue that. I, I'm. Hmm. I believe Mr. Yusuf wants the quite If your answer to question one is yes, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that you want to say on what date did Celsius breach the bonus compensation provision or breach the. Did you say what was the Yeah, that's, breach? Talk, that's fine well, with me. The problem is we haven't talked, we said, did plaintiffs prove that Celsius earned, right? The word breach hasn't been used, so will the jury know what is being asked? The word breach has not yet been used, so we're saying what is the date of breach? Are you All right, I want the second question to be on what date was that benchmark met, all right? So, and then you can argue afterwards if you want, what is the date of the breach? If you want a separate question for that, we can put that in there as well. But what is the relevancy of that question, Your Honor? Um, in an abundance of caution, because that, again, we have to figure out if there was a breach, I mean, that, that there would be a breach. That at that point, that would have triggered them having an obligation to then issue the stocks. All right, and you're saying there's another provision in there that. Yeah, and um, and um, and you know, I, I don't I don't think they can um, I don't think they can provide it an uh, actual day that that was met. Nor do I think they need to. Um, the, the, look, we have to prove there was a breach. That we absolutely have to do that, or we don't win. There has to be a question: Was there a breach? And if there was a breach, the jury should say when that occurred. I agree with that. But once we st we're getting into real details of the evidence and what I'm going to argue, and I, I don't see how the jury can answer. Okay, so all you would prefer at some, what was the date of the breach? Yes, sir. It sounds like that's what defense wants as well. I'm not going to get no. No, Your Honor. We want it to be made to the actual benchmark. And if if Mr. Yusto is claiming that that the jury can't determine when that benchmark was met, then I don't understand what the whole purpose of Marcy Bohr's schedule. All right, all right. I'm going to change this just a little bit then. Um, the first question then would say, did the plaintiffs prove that Celsius breached the contract? By, by establishing that, and then the quote, all right? Yeah, that's better anyway, right? Say the 2014 agreement, right? Yeah. So you add in to the beginning of the, of the first question, did the plaintiffs prove that Celsius breached the 2014 agreement? And then the rest of the language. And then two would be, what What was the date of the breach? Yes, that works for us. Okay. Uh, okay, well, we'll just have a standing objection. Okay. I actually think that will now make it much easier because we can do the same, the same kind of. Yeah, that would be the same thing for the second question as well. Right. Using the, there would be um, approving that um, Celsius sold a total of 690,000 units of co-branded product through its channels of distribution following the execution of the 2014 agreement, all right? Yes, sir. All right. Or did, did, did plaintiff prove a breach? Yes, I, same, same language. The same language. that Celsius breached the 2014 right. agreement by establishing that Celsius sold, and we quote the language of the incentive compensation provision. Okay. And there, I think we do want a question that says, Um, defining what a unit is, all right? And I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm
question two ways. It's not the same question. It, let we me, need to know the, the, what they found that supports their finding of grief. <laughs> we and do this, not. Okay. That is not the law. If, if I could just explain this. Okay, so up until the summary judgment motion, you argued through your expert witnesses' schedules that the $1 million benchmark was met in February 2018 because the original 2014 agreement was extended. And you were looking at sales of 14-count of boxes and tubs. For, uh, you were I, looking at sales, and apologies, of all powder products based on Marcy Boar's calculations. In the summary judgment, you said, well, there's an issue as to what the term co-branded revenues means, and that might mean all products, but because that had not been a previously disclosed expert opinion, you agreed, well, we're not going to bring that in through expert testimony, we're just going to argue it's all Let me all ask, a, let me just so back up for one second. All right, co-branded product, I'm sorry, uh, gross cumulative co-branded revenues. What did your expert include in co-branded, in uh, gross cumulative co-branded revenues? Uh, she, that question, we, I don't, I don't, I have to. It's your plaintiff's exhibit 283, I believe. Okay, I don't believe, I, I know that plaintiff's 283 does not say gross cumulative co-branded revenue. What we tried to do was present evidence of, of various things that added up to a, over a million dollars, depending on how the jury viewed the evidence. So, for example, uh, one of them was, the amount of flow fusion sticks that were sold. Another uh, was the amount of powder products that were sold, including tubs. There's all sorts of evidence of, the, of depending on what the jury concludes, co gross cumulative co-branded revenue is. There's literally dozens of weight of, based on the evidence, what the jury con con could conclude <coughs> gross cumulative co-branded revenue means. That, and you know they're not even bound by what we think of. They could have. Uh, right, so all we're asking them is, what, in your definition of gross cumulative co-branded revenue, did it exceed a million dollars? I know we presented evidence that the uh, amount of flow fusion exceeded that amount. We presented evidence that um, co-branded revenue includes, there's another clause of the contract that explains that uh, they can only uh, sell products with his likeness if they're co-branded so that it should include other products. Um, but I, I, I just, I'm very, very worried about this because there's so much evidence about different ways of interpreting that. I don't want to put them in a straight back jacket of A, B, or C. Um, so that's my worry about this. Your Honor, first let me correct myself. It was plaintiff's exhibit 284. If I can approach, this is Marcy Bohr's schedule, a million dollars gross revenue for 12 month period Gross revenue sales of all powder products, and if I'm, I may approach, I'll show it to you, where she is looking at all, all powder products, and she makes a calculation that it is met in February of 2018. And then they started making that argument of everything being co-branded. So I, we're not trying to complicate the, the verdict form, but they have presented two alternative theories, and we need to know which one the jury is deciding. All right. Um, it'll, we'll get clarity if they decide again. They may check the box. No, that there's no breach. All right. Agreed, but but, but if they do check the box breach. that it's that there is a breach, and then they put on there the date of the breach being February 2018, then we know, right? Um, that they it was powdered. But if they come up with some other date, then we may not know. And so then you have whether the term was extended. So we're going to ask that separate question. And so now we need, I just don't know, do you do an open-ended question? Just say that uh, um, what do you define as, or what is in, do you find is included in gross cumulative co-branded revenues? Your Honor, under the contract? Uh, respectfully, it, ca it cannot be open-ended. Yeah. We are bound by what has been presented here. There is their version of co-branded revenues that they put evidence on and they gave you calculations on. That is not based on a million different versions of co-branded revenue definition. That is based on one version. No, they have. And then there's our version of co-branded revenue and our calculations are based on our definition. There's only two potential definitions of co-branded revenue. There's not a million permutations like Mr. Uh, Yusuf suggests. Had two, but uh, 
Anyway, they had an alternative theory, but uh, I, I do there's agree. No calculations that, on it. I do agree that there's nowhere in the standards forms with open ended, and uh, I, I I would agree that it it should be uh, not open ended. All right. Um, at a minimum, we will know whether they agree it was extended or not, because that that question will be. All right. So, how about a question for units? I think that's an easy one to put on there. Do you find that um, plaintiff has proved that units um, for powder? That with respect to the flow fusion powder sticks, a unit is. Well, well, wait, is so a 14 no, count box or a, it, it, a, a single stick? Single stick. I hadn't even finished my proposed question, so I wasn't sneaking anything in. Flow so. fusion. Yeah, I mean, I have my... What would you have with respect to how do we differentiate between subs and sticks? Propose some language. I'm only doing that to help you. The, I uh, think propose some language. Here it is right here. So did the plaintiffs prove that with respect to boxes of flow fusion powdered sticks, a unit of co product is an individual stick? But why can't we just ask a simple wait, 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 question? Wait, 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 wait. What is a... With respect, what is a unit? No. And you have a thing that says stick. Yeah, or everybody's no, agreed. I don't have any objection to the courts. All right, that's going to be question six then. The question five on defense proposal you verdict. The it's your it's your question five. I, I, I know, but for their purposes, Can you yeah. that no argument. It's their question five, which is: Did the plaintiffs prove that with respect to boxes of flow fusion powdered sticks, a unit of co-branded product is an individual stick? Okay, I, I sorry, I should have listened a little closer. I would object to the words flow fusion in there. Okay, because it's it's not flow that's fusion. That's fine. Boxes of powdered sticks. Yeah. This is not a co-branded revenue issue, that's fine. This is a unit okay. issue. With respect to boxes of powdered sticks, a unit of co branded product is an individual stick. Why do you need yes boxes no? in the word? In the in the question. Christina, why do you have it's it's loading it? Is this in the next question, Your Honor? Or we're still on the same question? It's the same question six. Units. Okay. How about this? Um, did the plaintiffs prove that with respect to units of co branded product? A unit is an individual stick. Okay. Uh, can I see the contract real quick? Units of co Honor, I took that right out of the contract. Product. Oh, okay. Yes, thank you. you Honor. That's what I was checking. Because there's tubs. Yes, because All right. So this question six will say, did the plaintiffs prove that with respect to units of co-branded product, powder, For powder, I guess, right? A unit is an individual stick. Yeah. Uh, could I just say a unit includes, uh, in other words, because of the tub issue, we all agree that it includes tubs, that it, that uh, in addition, I don't know, very some, common, no, that's very complicated. some way just to make sure. With respect, with respect to units of co- boxes of powder sticks, a unit is an individual stick. We can take off the fusion. Is a tub. Or an individual. All right. Did the plaintiffs prove that with respect to units of co-branded product, a unit is a tub or an individual stick? Yes or no? Can I just make one suggestion that everyone might agree with? That an individual stick or, uh, counts as a unit. Is that acceptable? No, I think what the court suggested is fine. All right. Did the plaintiffs prove that with respect to units of co-branded product, and again, units of co-branded product is right out of the contract. Right. A unit is a tub or an individual stick. All right. All right. Can I so just that takes seconds? care of the first two okay. questions. I don't think you need anything else more, right? Well, I, I we mean, need co-branded revenue. It's, it's undisputed that it's a tub, and and so we, the question is, is it a box or a stick? Is what we want them to ask because this is 
That's why. And you argue that it's not an individual stick, it's a box. So the answer is no. Unless you, okay. I mean, unless I you want to go with there, it includes an individual stick. I don't think that's clear, Your Honor. Yeah, I think that's, I think it's, so they're proving the unit is a tub or an individual stick, and that's what's in their schedule. And your schedule is not. Your schedule is a tub or a box, right? So this way it'll be clear, it'll be on the verdict form, and we'll all know what they defined a unit as. And we could put in there, includes the following, have a, a line for them to check either tub, box, or unit, and they can put a check mark. I like no, put I, a check I, mark next to I would it. object to that. <laughs> Again, just for added complexity, and there's nothing in the standards like that. It's not right. a standard your verdict form. No, this is an interrogatory on a verdict form. So, maybe on that. All right. So then the next question would go to breach of the 2016 agreement, well, correct? Well, before we finish, before we go to the 2016, we still need to address the co credit revenues issue because, you know, they're changing their theory here. So, no, no. Oh, okay. I apologize. I'll sit down and get done. Well, no, I'm just saying, uh, again, there was, there was what, their forensic expert presented, which is the co branded revenue calculation as sales of all powder products, and then the alternative argument that they presented in their case in chief of flow is all of Celsius is, is all, you know, because they he was a brand ambassador, he was everything is co branded revenues based on our you know general sales. So we need the jury to decide if if the jury decides that this benchmark was met, under which theory? Why? Why do we need to do that? It's it, You don't ask in any kind of case, in a met mal case, did the jury find this kind of breach or that kind of free breach? Which theory, which argument that the plaintiff made did the, did the jury find? We just need the answer to the question that the court proposed, which is already our question one or three. Your Once Honor, we the purpose of special verdict forms is specifically to ensure that the jury's verdict aligns with their reasoning. That is I just the don't have purpose. a question that you can ask them, though, on that. Does, uh, it's different. for uh, They have to prove that the unit is a, a stick, what I think, to get to there. What if we something their... similar to your tub unit stick, a uh, tub box or stick, and for co-branded revenues, do the pl did the plaintiffs uh, something that basically our co branded revenues and uh, number one is it doesn't include like uh, sales of co branded product sales. Number two would uh, or sub two yeah, would be stronger. revenues from all Celsius products. Um, they just they pick either one of the two. Would that work? It, there's absolutely no reason for it. Um, oh, I just wanted to uh, clarify and uh, refer to that Royal Caribbean Cruises Limited versus Lisa Spearman case. Um, the oh, I don't have the actual case site. This is 3D 18-2188, and it was decided on April 28, 2021. Um, I have to bring this up. This whole issue is on on the verdict form, basically, and the step and the two issue rule. Um, towards the end, and it's basically saying you need that special verdict form to lay out if there are multiple theories under a particular account, they all need to be laid out. I just want to put the full name and, and the okay. case number into the record, Your Honor. And this is already, Your Honor, we're at two sections. We have all these different questions. We're already laying it all out. This is... Um, we have a, we're, We have six questions. Just going over. Yeah, we haven't even gotten to the defenses yet. So I think that'll be a little bit easier once we get past this. Uh. <coughs> All right. So right, the affirmative defenses are only as of the 2014 agreement, correct? There's, um, they have an affirmative defense of waiver. Waiver as to both. That goes as to both. Waiver as to both? Okay. But the, tw the statute of limitations only goes as to 2014 agreement. Okay. All right. I think on our verdict form, we laid out the questions for the, the, the first breach, the bonus compensation breach, along with the statute of limitations and the damages, and then did the other ones separately because of that reason. Uh, all right, so here we go. Um, so we've got one, two, three, four. Um, you got five and six. I'm going to leave it at that. 
I don't think you need any other questions at this point. Um, um, and then you're going to go to the affirmative defenses. So I think you need to do the 2014 affirmative defenses right after the 2014 claim. Okay? So yes. that is clear. Otherwise, it's too confusing. I'm looking at your affirmative defenses. So then you have statute of limitations, 2014 agreement. Is that, um, have you all even looked at that to see whether you're close on, on the question? I bet we are on that one. We use the standard um, on the statute of limitations defense. They've identified a date of the breach, so I think it has to be tied to that somehow. Otherwise, it, could be it goes right after. So, how about a defendant's breach, and then right after that question, if the defendants breached the contract before May 3rd, 2016, to plaintiffs prove the defense of, oh, I'm sorry, we didn't even ask. It, it, it almost has to be based on your answer to question yeah, two so above. Did the defendants breach before May? Right. So we them to their date of the breach. I think that will Based work. on that answer, did they, did they breach before May? That's how I had it in our We have, what was the date of the breach? And then the next question, did defendants breach the contract? Oh, breach well, of contract well, we, can, occur? Well, we can do it after. <laughs> did defendants breach of contract occur before May 3rd, 2016? I'm suggesting do it after we do both bonus and incentive and just refer back to. No. And if they oh, make fourth, that's, that's, that's what I propose. He just made yeah. fourth. May, I'm Honor, sorry, May 4th. Your Honor, may I have a moment with my team? Okay. I got you. Your Honor, we can resume. And the other reason, Your Honor, that I suggest that it needs to go right after the 2014, as you suggested, is because then we have the avoidance question, which we have as if defendants breach the contract before May 3rd, 2016, did plaintiffs prove the defense of fraudulent concealment, equitable estoppel, or breach of the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing? And then we have to go from there to the other defense, which is the waiver defense. Did defendants prove by plaintiff's conduct or communication that plaintiffs waive their rights to have defendant pay additional compensation? And that's also a standard out of the uh, standard waiver affirmative defense. Followed by, if you get past all those, were the plaintiffs damaged by the breach? which is another question. And then followed by what are the plaintiff's damages as a result of the breach? That's how we would propose laying out the rest of the 2014 breach. All right. Um, here's what I'm going to do. You have, so you have one through six, all right? Mm -hmm. That's what we have. So the next thing is going to be right below. If answers to question one and three are no, go to question, and it'll be the question for the 2016 agreement. If your answer to question one or three is yes, answer question seven. All right, and seven's just going to start with, um, did Celsius, um, did Celsius prove that any breach of the bonus compensation pr provision was before May 4th, 2016? All right, it'll be yes or no, right? Yeah, we have no objection to that question, but if I could just, if we, in my experience, the problems with the verdict form come when you don't go chronologically. In other words, say, if you answered this, skip to that. If we don't have one after each count, and we try to ask one question for both counts, how are we get, Are we going to have an instruction saying if, if you... I mean, statute of limit, limitations is the same for both of the provisions. True. I agree it's the same. Yeah. I would love to have... Well, it, it may be... It, the question's the same. Oh, oh, well, hold on a minute. No, the breaches could be on different dates. Correct. That's what I was just about to say, Your Honor. We have to ask these questions okay. separately because you can have one breach on one day and another breach on another day. So we need to ask... I think we've gotten your ruling, maybe perhaps from this point, unless there's some other topic. Maybe well, we I wanted to, to say something. Did, did Celsius prove that the breach occurred prior to May 4th, 2016? And then 
then it would be did plaintiffs prove that Celsius fraudulently concealed information relating, all right? Yes. And then did plaintiff prove Celsius is equitably stopped from asserting such limitations? And, and then next would be did plaintiff <coughs> prove um, breach of implied covenant? All right. Assuming that's in right? Yeah. We, we would prefer to have one question, Your Honor, that just says did plaintiffs prove either fraudulent concealment, equitable estoppel, or breach, depending if there's three. Your Honor, because of that, I, I agree with your each one separate question. I think you need a separate one okay. for each, and part of it is... Uh, it's fine. We can do it separate. It's just right. it more confusing so, uh, Okay, and so we'll do that under each of the two 2014 contract so, provisions. Your Honor, I understand what you're asking, saying, that there's six questions, but the unit question doesn't have anything to do with the first benchmark, so you're asking for all those questions, and then we're going to break into the two different breaches? No, again. no, we'll do, you'll go question one, question two, then I think you want to ask the question, move question five up to okay. three, and then do the affirmative defense ones, all right? Well, what, I, what I'm proposing is, is that we have to ask the data to breach twice. Yes, there's got to be a data breach twice. Okay. okay. So but I think you need to put all those affirmative defense questions, you got to put them in twice. Or yeah. Yes. Once yes, for yes, the first please. one, once for the second one. You got that? Agreed? One for bonus compensation, one for incentive compensation. Yes. And, and the then, breach question in twice as well. Okay. And then, and then you get to 2016, right? Or do you want to do damages for that before you get to 2016. Correct. We have to do, we have to stay on, I think the damages okay. have to go with respect to each account. That's fine. I have no problem also. with that. Agree? Do the damages for each one? I'm okay with okay. putting the damages there, but what will the damages question be? I guess that's the question. So, Your Honor, we proposed a question that says, what are plaintiff's damages as a result of the breach of contract? You only get to that question if they've actually gotten by the everything else. Okay. And where is that on your... It's, it's question nine, the bottom of page two. So the proposed verdict form from Celsius didn't have damages, right? <laughs> no. Well, correct, Your Honor, because the pending issues of the stock price, the 500000 and the right. with the court. I did reserve right. my right to propose instructions on damages, as you can see. Okay. What are plaintiffs... Uh, instead of what are plaintiffs, I think you have to put in there what... It's got to be, did plaintiffs prove? It has to be the proof there. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, what did plaintiffs prove are okay. the damages as a result of the breach? So that's going to be, just to be clear, what did plaintiffs prove the damages were as a result of the breach? Yeah, let me take money. that right off the, the uh, pattern. Each bonus and incentive? Yeah. Two separate questions, yes. I think you have to. Because it could be different breach dates and it's different shares and it's different. Okay. All right. Oh my goodness. Okay. So damages. Respect to royalties, it it's very short, Your Honor. That, that one's much simpler. There's no, well, there's one affirmative defense waiver, right? Um, yes. yes, Your Honor. Right. All right. Um, so All right, the question, I guess I'm just looking real quick at the model verdict. It just says what are plaintiff's damages as a result of the breach basically right yes that's what the, we use the standard question yeah all right you, you can leave it that way standard? yeah you could just leave it that way we've already instructed them on it as part of the breach of contract damage instruction so <coughs> that's true 
So the question that we proposed um, for the royalties, um, did plaintiffs, uh, well, are we using the same language? Did plaintiffs prove that Celsius breached the 2016 uh, agreement? By getting, by, yeah, by, by establishing us. that. And so the 2016 one There's no quoting language. Is... We just have to say royalties. No, there's a provision on the contract. We can quote the same thing just like we did for bonus compensation. The only issue there is that there's only one aspect of it that's at play, the uh, sparkling orange, right, not the other. No. There's, I mean, there, I don't think you quote the contract, because no. the issue there is just the term, right? It, yeah, it's just... Because there's, there's, I think there's, it's no dispute that if uh, that royalty provision did not extend beyond 2018, there would be no royalties, correct? That's correct. Well, there would be no additional royalties due. So I think that needs to be tie tied to the term for the royalty, right? Which is why we proposed on our, in our proposed verdict form, we have that specific question uh, to the plaintiff, uh, um, to the jury. Did plaintiffs prove that Celsius had an obligation to pay royalties, blah, 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 um, after the 2016 agreement terminated on October 11, 2018? And we can, we can clean that up, but we do think that there, right. there should be an How about? question. Change it to, did plaintiffs prove that Celsius breached the contract by failing to pay royalties under, you could even put section 5.3 after October 11th, 2018? Is that agreed? That's fine, yes. That's fine, Your Honor. Nice, it'll be yes or no. And then you have waiver, and then you have what are the damages, right? Yes, sir. So that one's easy, and then we're done, right? Um, All right, so let's cross our fingers that uh, I want to print out that you all are in agreement. I thank you for staying late, Your Honor. No, we have to do it. I mean, we have everybody coming in, and we'll uh, get the jury come tonight. So, okay. Thank you for your, for yourself, the staff, and the court reporter for staying late. All right. So, 8.30 uh, on Tuesday. I got a check here. No, I have to go to the airport, Your Honor. Yeah, we're, we're done, I think. Yeah, we're in, we're in recess. Then we'll see you all 8:30 with hopefully a clean set of instructions and a clean verdict form. Thank you, Judge. All right. Thank you. Good job. All right, Mr. Ustal.